เราอืม
Good morning. The 12th plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. I would like to remind members of the following mitigation measures that are in place for this meeting. All delegates are required to wear face covering at all times whilst in public spaces and in General Assembly Hall, except when they're directly addressing the meeting. And the size of the delegation should not exceed four delegates in the General Assembly Hall. The Assembly will hear and address by His Excellency Nikos Anastasiades, President of the Republic of Cyprus. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Nikos Anastasiades, President of the Republic of Cyprus, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I would like to congratulate the elected President of the 76th Session of the General Assembly, His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah uh, Shahid, and the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, on his uh, recent re-election to second five years mandate and assure of my government's unwavering support to their mission. Excellencies, this is the ninth consecutive year that I am attending the deliberations of the United Nations General Assembly deliberations that every year focus on important issues regarding developments and challenges which are critical for humanity with the aim through collective action to address them effectively. Taking stock of our declarations and decisions over time, I must confess that I feel, like many of you, a deep sense of disappointment. A sense of disappointment because I witness a widening gap between words and deeds, between the auspicious declarations and uh, commitments which are made and the results of the measures that we promise to deliver. In all honesty, how many times have we spoken about the need to address regional disputes, invoking the UN Charter, as well as the decisions and resolutions of the General Assembly or the Security Council? To what extent the weakness or the insufficient implementation of our decisions perpetuates conflicts and encourages violations? <coughs> Excuse me something which in turn proliferates humanitarian crisis. How often have we spoken about the dire need to tackle major global challenges such as poverty, hunger, child mortality, social economic exclusion, lack of adequate health care, shortage of educational opportunities, how compliant are we in the implementation of what we have agreed with regard to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change? I could expand into numerous other problems, the resolution of which could have been possible had the United Nations implemented its relevant decisions. That is why our collective and shared failure to decisively tackle the challenges I refer to has let down and disappoint many people across the world whose fundamental human rights and dignity are not adequately protected. At the same time, it has also led to the rise of warring developments such as uh, religious fundamentalism, violent extremism, sectarianism, 
destruction of cultural heritage, civil war, and ethnic conflict. What is equally alarming is that the combination of the above has led to the forcible displacement of millions of peoples and created unprecedented waves of refugees and migratory flows which exert huge economic and social pressures on all countries and regions affected. Unfortunately, and we have to be honest with ourselves, selfish interests hinder the founding principles of the United Nations in which the humanity has vested its hope for a prosperous and peaceful future. In order to achieve this objective, there is only one answer. Multilateralism, tangible solidarity, and stronger partnership based on positive agenda. It is for this reason that we lend our unwavering support to the reform and revitalization priorities of the Secretary General, which aim to reinforce the effectiveness of the organization and further advance peacekeeping and peacebuilding, humanitarian assistance, and long-term development growth. Distinguished uh, friends, what I have just referred to is by no means meant to belittle the numerous achievements of the work of the United Nations. My remarks and observations aim to emphasize the need to transform via reforms an organization that will give real hope to those in need of international protection to the quest for collective security, peace, and development. In other words, to turn the United Nations in a much more effective organization. Distinguished friends, my strong and honest words are not unintentional. I stand here before you representing a country which regrettably still endures the consequences of the blatant violation of the fundamental principles of the United Nations as a result of the 1974 illegal military invasion of Turkey and the ongoing occupation. Ever since, both the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council have issued numerous decisions and resolutions calling on Turkey to end the illegal occupation and withdraw its occupying troops, establishing at the same time the basis for reaching a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus problem. Decisions and resolutions which, is, which in the absence of resolve and the necessary means for the implementation thereof have led to the audacity of the invader who tries to be portrayed as a victim instead of the perpetrator it actually is. Distinguished friends, it is not my intention to engage on a blame game but I cannot leave unnoticed the absurdity of the Turkish rhetoric, which lies in their claim that the efforts for a compromise have been exhausted and the focus should now be on reaching a settlement based on the so-called realities on the ground. Let me remind you what the true realities on the ground are. Is it not a fact that 37% of the territory of the Republic of Cyprus, an EU member state, remains under Tur Turkish military occupation with more than 40,000 troops still on the ground? 
Is it not a fact that after the Turkish invasion, one third of the Greek Cypriots were forced to leave their ancestral homes? Is not a fact that while the Turkish Cypriots owned approximately 14% of the private owned land, today they usurp 37% of the island? Is it not a fact that they looted churches, destroyed archaeological sites and thousands of years of cultural heritage? Is not a fact that they have killed thousands of people and embarked on all kinds of atrocities and still today almost 1,000 persons are missing? Is not a fact that they have implanted hundreds of thousands of Turkish nationals to the occupied areas, thus sternly altering the demographic character of the island, turning the Turkish Cypriots into minority in the areas they occupy? Is it not a fact? that they have never implemented the 1975 agreement on the status of the enclaved persons, then more than 23,000, while today the number are only 350. Is it not a fact that the above crimes, all the above crimes, have been condemned by the European Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe in plethora of decisions with Turkey failing to comply even with even one ruling? Is it not a fact that Turkey has established an illegal entity in the occupied areas which is under its absolute political, economic, societal, cultural and religious control? a control which is also denounced by the majority of Turkish Cypriots, an illegal entity described by the European Court of Human Rights as a subordinate local administration of Turkey, is not a fact that Turkey tries to equate the state, the international recognized Republic of Cyprus, member of the United Nations and the European Union, with the illegal cessationist entity, is not a fact that the above proclamation of the purported cessation has been condemned by the Security Council and considered legal invalid. And it is not a fact that the Security Council called for its reversal and for all the states and the international community as a whole not to accept it or in any way assist it. It is not a fact that recently, with the presence of President Erdogan in Cyprus, they are trying to change the status of defense city of Famagusta, contrary to the UN Security Council resolutions and the condemnation of the international community. Ladies and gentlemen, during his address at the General Assembly on Tuesday, the President of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, stated, and I quote, we hope that the problems regarding maritime boundary, the limitations, will be resolved with the framework of international law and good neighborly relations. And Really, I am wondering as to which international law Mr. Erdogan refers to. Is it not a fact that Turkey refuses, refuses to ratify and abide by the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which codifies relevant customary international law? How Mr. Erdogan understands the settlement of disputes connecting the limitations? Is he referring to Turkey's own arbitrary interpretation of international law, which reduces 
the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus by 44% at the expense of both Greek and Turkish Cypriots? President Erdogan also spoke of the need of maintaining good neighborly relations. And I wonder yet again, which country had invaded and to date still occupy Cyprus? Which country invaded Syria? Which country violates the sovereignty of Iraq? Which country intervenes in the internal affairs of Libya? Which country violates the sovereign rights of Greece? And which country interfered in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? Excellencies, the narrative also put forward by the Turkish side, according to which all efforts to reaching a compromise have failed, and therefore we should seek solutions outside the UN framework, reinforces the valid arguments that Turkey and endgame is not to solve the Cyprus problem, but to turn Cyprus into its protectorate. And I will elaborate. In his report of the 28th September 2017 about the outcome of the Conference of Cyprus at Gran Montana, on paragraph 27, the UN Secretary General correctly assessed that all internal elements included in his six-point framework were almost or about to solve. Thus, whilst the aim of the Secretary General to reach a strategic agreement was within close reach, the reason of the unsuccessful outcome was Turkey's inflexible stance and insistence on maintaining the anachronistic treaty of guarantee, the right of intervention, and the permanent presence of troops. Furthermore, following the conference at Grand Montana, in line with our commitment to resume the peace process, both leaders, I myself and my counterpart, the Turkish Cypriot, and the Secretary General reached a joint understanding on November 25, 2019, as to the principles which should guide the resumption of a new round of negotiations, namely the joint declaration of 2014, convergences reached so far and the six-point framework presented by the UN Secretary General at Gran Montana. Following the above, one would expect the next step to be the resumption of the negotiations. Nevertheless, with the Turkish objectives being different, we witness blatant intervention of Turkey to oust the leader of the Turkish Cypriot community with whom the above joint understanding was reached. The evident goal was for him to be replaced by a new leadership which reproduces and adopts Turkey's position for changing the agreed basis for a settlement with the ultimate goal being a two-state solution. Thus, it is clear why a compromise is not possible to reach when one side deviates from the UN framework or annuls agreements reached and aspires to a different form of settlement contrary to the agreed basis and the good office's mandate of the Secretary General. Ladies and gentlemen, Part of the Turkish agenda is also the creation of a new fait accompli on the ground in Famagusta, in full contravention and violation of the relevant UN Security Council resolutions, and in particular 550 and 789. 
All such actions are clearly intended to destroy the prospects of a settlement based on the agreed UN framework. Dear friends, a compromise becomes even more difficult to reach when new ideas put forward by our side, as asked by the Secretary General, and in an effort to move the process forward, are blatantly rejected. I have proposed that the centralization of the exercise of power, which we deem as the appropriate balance between the enhancement of the constituent state's essential role and the unhindered functioning of the state, including at international level. I have also flagged our willingness to consider the option of a parliamentary system with ceremonial head of state and rotating prime minister. And more recently, I have, extend, I have even extended an invitation to the Turkish Cypriots to rejoin the state institutions established by the 1960 of the Republic of Cyprus, thus fully implementing mutatis mutantis, its relevant provisions. It's going without saying that such an invitation is not meant to be an alternative to the agreed basis of the settlement. It is meant to ease the Turkish Cypriot community back into the state pending a final settlement provided a strategic agreement is reached, thus fully participating in the evolution of the Republic of Cyprus into a federal state. This proposal should also be assessed in conjunction with the package of game-changing, win-win, confidence-building measures I proposed last December and unfortunately rejected by the Turkish side. Confidence-building measures which are on the table even now. Ladies and gentlemen, what I would like is to assure you that um, about my determination to set negotiation process back on track on the basis of the UN framework and the agreement reached in Berlin on November 25th, 2019. For us, there is only one plan to reach a settlement on the basis of a bizonal, bicommunal federation with political equality as set out in relevant UN Security Council resolutions and in line with the principles on which the EU is founded. A settlement that will lead to a functional and viable state without the obsolete system of guarantees, the right of intervention, the presence of Turkish troops, or any kind of foreign dependencies. A settlement that uh, will equally benefit all Cypriots, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, fully respecting their human rights and contributing to the peace and stability of the region. My extensive reference to the Cyprus problem, dear friends, aims at highlighting the need to address the realities and issues before us on the basis of values and principles of international law and not on the basis of the law arbitrarily interpreted by powerful. Excellencies, the chosen theme of this year's General Assembly, building resilience through hope to recover from COVID-19, rebuild sustainability, respond to the needs of the planet, respect uh, the rights of people, and revitalize the United Nations is, of course, very timely 
and relevant to the momentous challenges that we need to tackle. As our actions are interconnected and have an impact on one another, we all the nations of the world made a collective pledge to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals so as to address universal challenges on which I have already alluded to for the benefit of humankind. At the same time, we must also all realize that we are at a defining moment, defend, defining moment, more defending moment, I don't know, it's the same, I think, as regards climate change. Taking into account the alarming projections concerning the impact of climate change on our immediate region, namely the Eastern Mediterranean and the greater Middle East, Cyprus has undertaken a coordinating role for developing a regional action plan consisting of two distinct components, a scientific and subsequently an intergovernmental one. Ladies and gentlemen, it would be amiss if I don't refer to the recent developments in Afghanistan. We share a collective responsibility to uphold international humanitarian law, particularly as regards the protection of women and minorities. We also need to ensure that Afghanistan does not become a safe haven for terrorism and ex extremism or a breaking ground for organized crime, weapons and drug trafficking and renewed waves of immigration, of migration. Another region, ladies and gentlemen, which is also considered synonymous with discord and strife is the Middle East and North Africa. In this regard, Cyprus, as a strong proponent of the ideal that the Eastern Mediterranean and the great, greater Middle East can become an area of stability, peace and cooperation, strives to actively promote an enhanced network of regional cooperation. Distinguished friends, in concluding, please allow me to stress that in a fragmented and multipolar world, we have more than ever a moral, ethical, and political duty to promote the essence of human civilization, unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, and establish conditions that can, be, can, that can bring prosperity and welfare to us. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Cyprus for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Muhammadu Buhari, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Heads of State and Government, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. President, let me on behalf of the government and people of Nigeria congratulate you on your well-deserved election as President of the 76th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. I would like to assure you 
of the full support and cooperation of the Nigerian delegation throughout your tenure. I would like to commend your predecessor, His Excellency Mr. Volkan Boshi, for the many remarkable achievements recorded during his tenure despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Permit me to congratulate the Secretary General Antonio Guterres on his re-election and commend his strong commitment to making the United Nations more alive to its responsibilities. I also want to express my gratitude to him for reappointing Ms. Amina Mohammed as the Deputy Secretary General to assist him in discharging his responsibilities. Mr. President, <clears throat> excuse me, the theme of this year's General Assembly, building silence, resilience through hope to recover from COVID-19, rebuild sustainability, respond to needs of the planet, respect the rights of the people, and revitalize the United Nations, sums up our common desire to rescue our planet recover our economies, and restore hope to all the peoples of the world. In this regard, my delegation will continue to support the United Nations as the indispensable forum for international cooperation and the cornerstone of the multilateral system rooted in respect for international law, including international human rights law, and predicated on a rules-based order. Mr. President, I want to thank the international community for the concerted response to COVID-19, the solidarity and the drive to contain the first truly global health emergency of our time is a pointer to the many things we can achieve if we work together. On our part, Nigeria has made strenuous efforts to contain the virus and hold its deadly onslaught on our people. Our efforts have been rewarded with moderate success. At the last, at the outset, we recognize detection and contact tracing to be important tools in combating the virus. In this connection, from a mere four laboratories with testing and detection capacities, we ramped up the facilities to over 140 centers today. Similarly, we built isolation centers and emergency hospitals wards in record time all over the country. We carry out genomic sequencing in designated laboratories across the country with a view to detecting variants in circulation. In addition, over 40,000 health care workers have recently been trained on infection, prevention, and control measures with the support of various partners. Nigeria remains grateful for the assistance received from our partners and friends all over the world. Vaccination is the key to our safe emergence from the pandemic. We fully support the COVAX initiative from which we have benefited. We also thank the United States of America, Turkey, India, China, European Union, and others for the vaccines provided. Despite the acknowledgement, however, I would like to reiterate my call for a fairer and more equitable distribution of vaccines in all countries so that together we can fight and contain the pandemic. The rising wave of newer and more contagious strains makes this even more urgent. No country 
can afford the socio-economic implications of prolonged shutdown, it is imperative to underscore that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Mr. President, Nigeria remains deeply concerned over the illicit trade, transfer, and circulation of small arms and light weapons. Their excessive accumulation and uncontrolled separate in many regions of the world are having devastating humanitarian and socio-economic consequences, especially on the continent of Africa. It is on this note that my delegation calls for the worldwide application of the Arms Trade Treaty to codify accountability in conventional arms trade, which is critical to the security of nations. This is in recognition of the need for a broad-based global partnership in the ongoing battle against transborder crimes, including terrorism and piracy. Mr. President, we must deal not only with the symptoms of conflict, but also the immediate causes that fuel conflicts in the first place. These include poor and undemocratic governance, human rights abuses, poverty, ignorance, injustice, and inequalities. There are no easy solutions to these conditions. They require long-term investments and more effective international cooperation. In this connection, my delegation underscores the importance of promoting peaceful, unfettered, and inclusive participation of states in global actions towards conflict prevention. This will facilitate the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the African Union Agenda 2063. In West Africa especially, our democratic gains of the first decades are now being eroded. The recent trend of unconstitutional takeover of power, sometimes in reaction to unilateral changes of constitution by some leaders, must not be tolerated by the international community. Nigeria fully supports the efforts of ECOWAS to address this growing challenge and appreciates the support of both the African Union and the United Nations. In this regard, I would like to reiterate that as leaders of our individual member states, we need to adhere to constitutional provisions of our countries, particularly on term limits. This is one area that generates crisis and political tension in, the, in our sub-region. Mr. President, Nigeria is fully committed to nuclear non-proliferation and has always supported the view that it should involve all states. Disarmament conventions deserve the support of all states, small, large, nuclear, or non-nuclear. Nuclear weapons remain the ultimate agents of mass destruction, and their total elimination should be the final objective of all disarmament processes within the broad spectrum of goals being pursued by the United Nations. In this regard, Nigeria would participate actively in forthcoming review conference of nuclear prohibition treaty and also the first meeting of states parties to the landmark treaty on the provision, provision of nuclear weapons scheduled to take place within the first quarter of 2022. 
Nigeria regards these upcoming events as important steps towards realization of a world free of nuclear weapons. We are therefore supportive of any diplomatic efforts in this direction. We hope that the upcoming Nuclear Prohibition Treaty Review Conference would lead to a successful outcome that will facilitate the new the nuclearization of the world. We will do our part to ensure such an outcome. Mr. President, terrorism continues to dominate security discourse worldwide. In Nigeria, Boko Haram, terrorist group, though fragmented by internal strife and weakened by our defense forces, is still active and preying on soft targets. Nigeria will continue to work closely with the United Nations counter-terrorism bodies and the ent entities with a view to bringing this scrooge to an end. Nigeria has spared no effort in addressing the challenges of terrorism posed by the activities of Boko Haram in Northeast Nigeria, the Lake Chad region, as well as Benditre in the Northwest and North Central. Mr. President, the impact of climate change is already with us in Nigeria, many persons in various ways, conflict trigger, food insecurity, drying up of lakes, loss of livelihood, and youth migration, among others. The trend is the same in many other countries that are threatened by forest fires, rising seas, drought, and desertification. As leaders, we must create inclusive and gender-sensitive policies that address all issues connected to climate action for mitigation and resilience. This is why we are working on a transition to low carbon economy consistent with achieving the Paris Climate Agreement on the Sustainable Deployment Goals. Mr. President, combating islet financial flows and ensuring the recovery and return of illicitly acquired assets have the potential to provide resources in the immediate term for financing development in the area of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. It drives national governments of resources needed to provide adequate and meaningful sources of livelihood for their citizens. The latter gives rise to more irregular migration patterns and unwholesome consequences for interstate and human relations. Mr. President, the issue of debt we have seen that developing countries have been faced with unsustainable debt burdens even before the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased the risk of a new wave of deepening debt where vital public financial resources are allocated to external debt servicing and payments at the expense of domestic health and financing for critical development needs. Therefore, there is an urgent need to consider expansion and extension of debt service suspension initiative to include all developing, least developed countries and small island developing states facing fiscal and liquidity challenges. Mr. President, Nigeria reaffirms that international trade is an engine for development and sustained economic growth, as well as global eradication of poverty. We therefore call for the reform agenda that will engender better recovery from this crisis, build resilience to future shocks and pursue transformative development strategies that can deliver the 2030 sustainable development goals. 
Mr. Pro, Mr. President, the global food system has in recent times been impacted by several factors, such as population growth, availability, and accessibility of arable land and water resources, climate change, and loss of biodiversity. Climate change and unpredictable shocks, such as the current global pandemic, further exacerbate vulnerabilities in the global food system, requiring the United Nations urgent attention. Mr. President, Nigeria has been steadfast in safeguarding human rights, including the advancement of women, the protection of children, the protection of the rights of people living with disabilities, the treatment of migrants, refugees, returnees, and displaced persons, as well as the promotion of fundamental freedoms through all legitimate means. In this regard, my delegation recommends the positive example of leaders like Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand. The recent rise in hate-related crimes globally underscores the urgent need to continue to, en to continue our engagement about racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and other related intolerance. It is said to know that the issue of racism remains alive globally. We are beginning to forget our affirmation of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of every individual as enshrined in the United Nations Charter. No society can claim to be free or just if it is deprived of any one of these rights. Today, racism drives hate crimes and the institutional discrimination. In all this, Africans and people of African descent are among the major victims. I am confident that this forum will make significant, significant impact in the quest to end race-related vices and injustices. Mr. President, no reform of the United Nations system is more urgent than that of Security Council. Stakeholders around the world are asking how such power could be concentrated in scant representation. The governmental negotiations have taken too long, some 15 years. We must avoid going in circles. Consensus has been achieved in some of the elements of this reform especially that of the representation of Africa on the basis of the El Zuini consensus and the Sartre Declaration. It is reasonable to expect unanimity in this matter. Mr. President, our organization is at the peak of the multilateral system. It is also the preeminent body for solving our current and emerging challenges and for developing norms that are protective of us all. In the current moment, hope for this is dependent on how we assist each other to get COVID-19 out of all countries, regardless of their classification. We can do and we must do. In this regard, let me close my statement by paying special tribute to a great and humane internationalist and an exemplary practitioner of multilateral cooperation. I am speaking of Chancellor Angela Marshall of the Federal Republic of Germany. As she exits the stage, we wish her well. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. 
I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Lebanon to introduce an address by the head of state. Thank you. Congratulating you, Mr. President, on assuming the presidency of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly and wish you the best in your role, which you assume as the world seeks to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It would have been my pleasure to congratulate you in person had it not been for the global health situation which made it necessary for me to join you today through a pre-recorded video. I would also like to thank His Excellency Volkan Boskier for his able leadership of last year's session. My congratulations also go to His Excellency Antonio Guterres for his re-election to the helm of the United Nations. I thank him for his efforts in support of Lebanon and for helping organize three conferences to support the Lebanese people in the aftermath of the catastrophic explosion at Beirut port. I express my appreciation to all heads of state and government who took part in those conferences and to governmental and non-governmental organizations and others that offered to help. My gratitude specifically goes to France, whose president rushed to Lebanon to stand with us in the midst of this tragedy. Finally, I thank our friends and allies who assisted our armed forces. Our army is entrusted with the heavy task of fighting terrorism and cooperates with UNIFIL to maintain peace and stability along our southern borders in implementation of Security Council Resolution 1701. Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, just a few miles from the UN headquarters, one of the largest terrorist attacks hit the heart of New York City, causing thousands of deaths and injuries, and leaving deep wounds in our collective psyche. The impact of that attack echoed throughout the world and set in motion a global war on terror. The war had a mixed track record, and at every turn, many nations especially in our region, paid a heavy price for that war, which resulted in death, destruction and displacement. Today, those same nations are trying to recover and bounce back, just like New York did. Because in the face of terrorism, the will to live will always prevail. This is the exact meaning of this debate's theme, building resilience through hope. Distinguished guests, a new Lebanese government has been formed, in line with the Constitution, following more than a year of political turmoil. With this, Lebanon enters a new phase, one we hope will lead us to recovery. The new government will undoubtedly have to confront major domestic and external challenges if it is to gain the trust of its people and the world after winning the confidence of the parliament. The past two years have been some of the most challenging in Lebanon's history. A chain explosion of protracted and emerging crises affected all sectors. A decades-long rentier-style financial and economic policy coupled with corruption and waste and driven by financial mismanagement and lack of accountability led Lebanon into an unprecedented financial and monetary crisis. The result was economic contraction, inhumane living conditions, and rising levels of unemployment, migration, and poverty. 
the government has declared its commitment to implement urgently needed financial and economic reforms to combat corruption and adopt a financial recovery plan as part of the negotiations with the IMF. This would be coupled with efforts to create a public social safety net and reform and, if necessary, restructure the banking sector and ensure the full implementation of the electricity sector plan. As a first step, the government has completed all the required procedures and launched a forensic audit of the Central Bank of Lebanon. This audit will cover all public accounts. With this, I will have fulfilled my commitment to the Lebanese people and the international community to uphold transparency and accountability. We now look to the international community to finance some of the most vital public and private sector projects necessary to revive the economy and create jobs. We also seek the international community's assistance to recover smuggled funds and the proceeds of corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, our problems have been further compounded by wars in the region, especially the war in Syria, which has had a spillover effect on Lebanon. The blockade on Syria isolated Lebanon, and the conflict there fueled terrorism in our country. Large waves of Syrians have swept Lebanon, with numbers exceeding 1.5 million people to date. I have raised this issue in all forums, especially here at the United Nations drawing attention to its disastrous socio-economic, health and security consequences. I have repeatedly urged the international community to help us ensure a safe return for Syrians, but my appeals fell on deaf ears. Instead of aid deliveries inside Syria, Aid has continued to be channeled to Syrians in their host communities in Lebanon, encouraging them to remain where they are. Today, as Lebanon is fighting for its survival, I repeat my appeal. The international community must help Lebanon manage this crushing displacement crisis. But, it must first and foremost ensure the safe return of displaced Syrians to their country. We have put forward a comprehensive repatriation plan and we reject all proposals of integrating Syrians in Lebanon. We are equally opposed to any attempts at settling Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. This is consistent with all international resolutions on the Palestinian question, which set out the parameters of the solution, including the right to return. We remain gravely concerned at Israel's repeated threats against Lebanon, and more recently, Israel's plans to carry out oil and gas exploration activities along the contested maritime border. We condemn any and all attempts to violate the limits of our exclusive economic zone, and we maintain our right to the oil and gas found within that zone. In fact, the bidding process for offshore drilling started months ago but later stopped due to pressure from well-known sources. 
Lebanon demands the resumption of indirect negotiations on the demarcation of the southern maritime borders in line with international law. We will not relinquish nor compromise on our border claims, and it is the role of the international community to stand with us. Distinguished guests, the COVID-19 pandemic wreaked havoc on our world, ravaging the economy and the health and education sectors. The impact of the pandemic was particularly felt in Lebanon, where COVID-19 exacerbated an already dire situation. Health officials in Lebanon and relevant authorities responded professionally and proactively, managing to keep the numbers of cases under control. However, the pandemic took a heavy toll on the fragile economy and the healthcare sector, given the severe shortages of medicine, medical supplies, and fuel, and the lack of doctors and nurses, many of whom have migrated for economic reasons. On vaccines, Lebanon has been one of the first countries to roll out a vaccination campaign, achieving a 30% vaccination rate to date, with the aim of reaching 40% by the end of this year. In the midst of this perfect storm, the Beirut port explosion was the last straw. One year on, the lights have yet to come back on in our afflicted capital. Our only wish is for Beirut's heart to beat again and for the port to be what it once was a hub for trade. We thank all those who've provided help. Reconstruction and development assistance is now a priority. We welcome all international efforts to rehabilitate the port according to applicable laws until it is fully operational. We cherish the international solidarity shown to our capital and our people, which has indeed helped heal some of the wounds. However, we may also require assistance investigating the incident and seeking justice. The families of the victims and the injured will not have closure until justice is achieved. The Lebanese judiciary is currently looking to determine the causes and circumstances of the explosion and related administrative liabilities and has already issued indictments and made arrests. We expect the currently confidential investigation to shed light on the origin of the explosive material, how they entered the port and the people behind that. And we will also examine satellite images for any suspicious movements at the time of the explosion. We request once again those countries that have relevant information to share them with the investigation as required. Ladies and gentlemen, the troubles of the past two years in Lebanon and the world have delayed the establishment of the Academy for Human Encounters and Dialogue, an initiative I announced at the United Nations in 2017, which was later endorsed by the General Assembly in 2019 in its Resolution 73-344.
Recent events and escalating regional conflicts only reaffirm the importance of such an initiative and the importance of its goal of promoting human and cultural interaction. A large piece of land near Beirut has been designated as a future location for the Academy and pre-construction surveys have already begun. I call on all our friends to join their fellow countries that have expressed their interest in signing the agreement establishing the Academy. Distinguished guests, the theme Building Resilience Through Hope is not a mere slogan for the Lebanese people. It is, in fact, a daily reality. Resilience is our way of life. We never relent. We never surrender. Despite all the difficulties, the crises and the tragedies, our people continue to fight for a better future. As Lebanon tries to claw its way back to recovery, we count on the whole world to support us in achieving our goals. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Lebanese Republic for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Maki Sal, President of the Republic of Senegal. I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Maki Sal, President of the Republic of Senegal, and invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Distinguished colleagues, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, Mr. President, Senegal congratulates you and we wish you every success during your presidency of the 76th session of the General Assembly. I wish to once again congratulate the Secretary General upon his re-election. We wish the Secretary General every success in the exercise of his mission for the benefit of member states. The theme of this session is a reminder of the magnitude and the urgency of the challenges which we face to arrive at a better and safer world. This is most urgent in the Sahel, in the Sahel where terrorist groups continue to wage attacks and to engage in deadly lootings targeting innocent people. As a troop contributor to MINUSMA with 1,350 troops, my country stands in solidarity with fraternal countries that are enduring tremendous difficulties. We continue to advocate for MINUSMA to be vested with a robust mandate to effectively combat terrorist groups. Moreover, there is a vital need for G5 Sahel member states to enjoy adequate support in their vital struggle against terrorism. Wherever it may take root, terrorism remains a global threat, and uh, the United Nations system of collective security needs to fight off this threat. We cannot allow Africa to become the safe haven for international terrorism. In the Middle East, Senegal reiterates its call for the enjoyment of the Palestinian people's right to a viable state coexisting in peace with the State of Israel, each within secure 
and internationally recognized borders, there is also an urgent need to combat the devastating economic, health-related, and social fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Senegal has uh, engaged in transparent management of the pandemic as soon as it emerged in March 2020. We have been publishing a daily report about this. Moreover, we have deployed an economic and social resilience program uh, uh, to the tune of $2 billion to support households, businesses, workers, and our diaspora. We have significantly expanded the medical resources available to individuals. We have provided free tests and care, and we have gained access to vaccines. I wish to thank partner countries and institutions for their support in our fight against the pandemic. I applaud the generous and concerted surge of support through the COVAX initiative. The significant efforts notwithstanding, there's a divide between vaccinated countries in the North and non-vaccinated countries in the South. This divide continues to widen, and this only sets back efforts to eradicate the pandemic and to achieve a return to normal life for us. The each man for himself mentality will not end the pandemic. Nobody will be shielded if the virus and its variants continue to circulate anywhere. Only a global response facilitating access for all to vaccines will lead to an end to this global scourge. In this spirit, I wish to thank partner countries and institutions who have been supporting the vaccine production project of the Dakar Pasteur Institute. This is a major initiative servicing Africa. Senegal will contribute to the financing of this project through part of our special drawing rights. At the same time, it is incumbent upon us to persevere in our efforts to achieve economic recovery. This is the thrust of the New Deal for Africa, which was an outcome of the 18th of May summit in Paris on financing for African economies. Thanks to the consensus that prevailed at the G20, the first goal of the summit was achieved with an allocation, a historic allocation of special drawing rights to the tune of $650 billion. I applaud the diligent approach of Madam Kristalina Georgieva, Director General of the IMF, in achievement of this consensus. Africa, thereby, was able to have its share of $33 billion to shore up our health-related resilience, uh, partly mitigating the impact of the crisis and launching our economic recovery. This is a significant step forward, which should be welcomed. And yet, and yet, in the light of the tremendous consequences from the crisis, Africa needs additional financing of at least $252 billion by 2025. This is necessary to mitigate the fallout and to shore up our economic recovery. Let us thus work together to achieve the second goal of Paris. That is, to reallocate for African countries, uh, in line with the modalities to be agreed upon, to reallocate $67 billion mobilized uh, on the uh, consenting uh, SDR shares of wealthy country, of wealthy consenting countries to achieve the agreed upon $100 billion threshold. We can achieve this by maintaining transparent and trust-based dialogue, which is already underway. In this way, we can solidify the premises of a new deal with Africa for reformed global economic and financial 
governance that is both fairer and more inclusive. This new deal is possible if we see to it that the relationship structures with our continent rely more on partnership than on official development assistance. Clearly, assistance alone cannot meet the needs of a continent of more than one billion where a great deal is yet to be built. Beyond domestic efforts, the Africa of aspirations particularly needs access to adequate concessional and mixed resources in the form of loans to finance the sectors which are vital for its economic growth. These include inter alia, infrastructure, energy, agriculture, industry, but also such sectors as water, sanitation, health, education, and training. And this list is not exhaustive. To achieve this, a new deal with Africa should help to vanquish the deterministic Mindsets, mindsets which have hampered access of Africa to those resources. I would call upon partner countries and institutions to work with us to relax the rules of the OECD to harness Africa's investment potential. Each of us has a role to play, and this is important insofar as the development investment needs of Africa are shared opportunities for growth and prosperity. Likewise, reform of the United Nations is necessary. 76 years after the birth of our organization, the multilateral system inspires confidence so long as it brings together and reflects the aspirations and interests of all stakeholders. It is high time for the composition of the Security Council to reflect the realities of the 21st century United Nations in all of its diversity and not the reality of the obsolete post-World War landscape. We reaffirm our commitment to the African position, shared African position, which was set out in the Azzolini consensus. Building our shared future also means taking care of our planet in line with the principle of shared but differentiated responsibility given the ravages of global warming. Under our nationally determined contribution, we will pursue our efforts towards a energy transition, pursuing the goal of of more than 30% of uh, installed power capacities being renewable energy. This will be shored up with the solar electrification project underway for 1,000 villages in line with the partnership for the green, with the Green Climate Fund and the West African Development Bank. Ultimately, thanks to the gas-to-power strategy, we are seeking to achieve the goal of 100% clean energy with the forthcoming use of gas resources. However, our country cannot achieve an energy transition, cannot abandon polluting practices uh, and, and abandon the pol and, and eschew the polluting practices of industrialized nations without a viable, fair, and equitable alternative. Natural gas use as a transition energy should be maintained. For this reason, we believe that an end to financing for the gas sector under the pretext that gas is a fossil fuel without accounting for the fact that it is also and especially clean energy would represent a major obstacle in our efforts to achieve energy transition and in universal access to electricity, competitivity, and economic and social development. Our country is already shouldering the overwhelming burden of the 
uneven exchange. We should not be expected to shoulder the burden of an uneven energy transition. Hence, consequently, I would call for the maintenance of gas financing mechanisms to be maintained as a transition, as an uh, energy of transition. There's another important challenge which we face, that of the status of women worldwide. As we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Program of Action with the Generation Equality Initiative, we know that there is progress that is yet to be achieved. However, we appreciate particularly the long road between us and the goal of eliminating all forms of inequality, discrimination, and violence against women and girls. It is not acceptable for women and girls who represent half of humanity to continue to endure such treatment in the 21st century. Senegal, thereby, in January 2020, criminalized acts of rape and pedophilia. Let us continue the overarching mobilization for women's protection and empowerment, but also for young people, including through the promotion of inclusive financing and in through resource allocation under the Global Financing Facility Campaign, which was initiated by the, global, by the World Bank. Mr. President, dear friends, these are, without a doubt, difficult and uncertain times. However, let us, let us cherish the hope, as, uh, let, us, let us maintain hope, as suggested in the theme for this session. To achieve this, we need to act. And we need to bear in mind that the United Nations was built on the promise of a better world, governed by the principles of sovereignty, of cooperation, of diversity. It is faith in these ideals which has brought representatives of people to this hall for the past 76 years. Consequently, every blow to sovereignty, every blow to cooperation and to diversity represents a blow to our shared ideals, a blow to our reason for being here, a world weary of the blight of war, of isolationism, environmental destruction, and material servitude is headed for a fall. The promise of a better world for all can bloom in the soil of dialogue and mutual respect. It will wither in the dogma of conform conformism and cultural and civilizational contempt. This promise blossoms in the spirit of openness, respect and care for the other, easing the plight of the hungry, the thirsty, the poor, those who are ill and those who lack education. To that end, we cannot merely allow empty promises to take hold. It is our duty to work for a future of fulfilled promises. This future requires that we lay down our weapons, that we stand in stronger solidarity, that we protect our environment, that we cultivate our shared values, that we accept and respect our differences by abandoning civilizational dicta. Thereby, let us bring forth the world of our dreams, a world of peaceful coexistence, a better world for all. I wish every success for the 76th session of the General Assembly. Thank you. On behalf of the, on behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Senegal for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency.
the assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Frank Walter Steinmeier, President of the Federal Republic of Germany. I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Frank Walter Steinmeier, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, and invite him to address the Assembly. Herr President. Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, excellencies, delegates of the United Nations General Assembly, as we meet at this venerable forum, the final election rallies are being held in Germany, a long election campaign. The day after tomorrow, 60 million Germans are called upon to elect a new parliament. They will decide on new coalitions and the successor of a federal chancellor who has governed Germany for 16 years. Distinguished colleagues, at this time of political transition in my country, I would like to assure you that also after this election, Germany remains a country that is aware of its international responsibility and shoulders it. And there are two compelling reasons for that. Firstly, we Germans do not forget that the political and economic rebirth after two world wars and our journey to re-enter the international community after all the horrors for which my country had been responsible and finally our peaceful reunification. This Germany's path of fortune was only possible with the support of our neighbors and partners. Secondly, we are convinced and remain convinced that the path to a more peaceful future, the resolution of the major issues facing humanity will require much, much more cooperation from the international community. The preamble of Germany's basic law formulates our aspiration in brief but precise terms to promote world peace as an equal partner in a united Europe. This aspiration, this obligation, ladies and gentlemen, is one shared by every German government. And this is why it was important to me to come to New York today as federal president and convey this Germany's message to the international community. Our partners can rely on us and our competitors will need to keep reckoning with us. To my mind, our foreign policy responsibility, Mr. President, starts with a frank and undistorted look at the world. And the speakers at this General Assembly over the last few days have been unusually open in their endeavors here. And indeed, the global situation today is in any respect sobering, the fall of Kabul marks a turning point. We have achieved our goal of defeating those who wrought horrendous terror on this city 20 years ago. But despite immense endeavor and investment, we were not able in 20 years to establish a self-sustaining political order in Afghanistan. My country also shares responsibility, and we have an ongoing responsibility, particularly towards the many Afghans who had hoped for a more peaceful, free and democratic future. Yet I believe we need to ask ourselves, what conclusions do we draw from this failure? What lessons can we learn and what tasks do we feel able to perform, having had to acknowledge that we wanted too much? I am convinced that resignation, resignation would be the wrong lesson to draw. To my mind, this moment of geopolitical disenchantment contains three messages for our foreign policy. We need to be more honest, smarter, but also stronger. Firstly, we need to be honest with regard to our options 
and our limits too. We need to be more realistic in defining and prioritizing our aims and interests. Often, ladies and gentlemen, we can achieve more when we want less. Secondly, we need to be smarter in choosing our instruments and in setting our priorities. German and European foreign policy must not restrict itself to being right and condemning others. We need to extend our toolbox. Diplomatic, military, civilian, humanitarian. And for me, being smart also means less sense of mission and more openness in our endeavor to find potential solutions and common ground too also with those who are different from us. And thirdly, even though some may find this paradoxical, we must get stronger when it comes to our means. The citizens in all our nations expect their governments to protect them from threat and attack, and rightly so. This is why in these unstable times my country too is investing more in its defense capability. But one thing is clear as well, future generations will not judge us on our military strength today, but on whether we were able to resolve problems and conflicts. Military strength without the will to forge understanding without the courage to engage in diplomacy, does not make the world a more peaceful place. This is why we need strength at the negotiate, negotiating table, just as we need strength in defense. And also, therefore, Germany shouldered responsibility over the last two years in the United Nations Security Council, and we would like to do so again in the years 2027-28. Excellencies, Honoured delegates, yes, we failed on many things in Afghanistan, but our failure should not be cause for schadenfreude for others, and I'm deliberately using this German word that has made its way into many languages, schadenfreude, a mindset in which loss to one is gain to another, such a mindset fails to do justice to the reality of our interconnected world. Regional instability, weakening state structures, refugee and migrant flows, religious extremism and terror, new forms of conflict, hybrid, digital, environmental and resource-based conflicts, such developments threaten us all. And we all must to have to deal with them, small and large alike. The major powers, the US, China and Russia, show the res particular responsibility, a responsibility also for smaller states, because the privileges the major powers enjoy in the United Nations system are only justified as long as they promote and uphold the international peaceful order in the interest of all and do not ignore or undermine it in pursuit of their own interests. The United Nations are not a boxing ring devoid of values at the disposal of the world powers. And I also do know that the hand pointing the finger at others has other fingers pointing back at ourselves. Those warning now about an American withdrawal should not succumb to similar reflexes at home. We Europeans and we Germans have to do more for our own security, need to do more for peace and stability in our neighborhood and around the world. We need to continue our multilateral efforts in Libya, in eastern Ukraine, in the Middle East, and we are ready to renew the nuclear agreement and we call upon Iran to return to serious negotiations as quickly as possible. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I know we are in agreement with our closest partner, France. We need, we need a strong common foreign and security policy in Europe. Only a strong Europe can expect others to play their part too in building an international peaceful order. And only a strong Europe can do both at the same time, seek cooperation with China, where cooperation is in the interest of both sides and indeed necessary, and at the same time demand China respects human rights and international law and the legitimate interests of its neighbors. A strong rules-based peaceful order also needs a strong transatlantic partnership. We know that the U.S. is setting new and different priorities, and we know that as the world changes, alliances also need to adapt. But no short-term advantage is worth causing cracks to appear in our transatlantic unity. We need to be mindful of that together. The responsibility of major powers, including us Europeans, weighs all the heavier when we call to mind the big global challenges, the major issues facing humanity. Never before have we had such an existential experience of our interdependence, our reliance on one another, as we have over the almost two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. And yet, even though we know that this pandemic will only be over when it is over everywhere, when we take stock of global vaccine distribution, the picture is at best mixed. Too many people are still waiting for the life-saving vaccine. And this is why the distribution must, of vaccines must not be an instrument for countries to showcase themselves or grant tactical favors. The COVAX initiative under the auspices of the United Nations is the right way forward together because it is our common way forward together. One in three COVAX vaccine doses is made available by Europe. And as the second largest donor worldwide, my country with providing 2.5 billion euro, will make another, at least another 100 million doses available by the end of the year. And ladies and gentlemen, what holds true for the existential threat posed by the pandemic is just as true for climate change. Apocalyptic fires, scorching temperatures, tropical storms and hurricanes, failed harvests, drought and famine. They're happening now. They're happening here. And they pose a threat to people, families, livelihoods everywhere, but especially to the most vulnerable, but also to the rich industrialized countries. Devastating floods in Western Germany this summer cost almost 200 of my compatriots their lives. And we also recall recent images from here, from New York City, of huge masses of water in streets, apartments, and subways. And against this dramatic backdrop, Against this backdrop, a regression to the national egoisms I warn against is more than just a step back to the past. It is robbing us of our shared future. And it is harming the very institutions and instruments we now need. We need strong joint decisions shortly in Glasgow. After all, when it comes to climate change, it is also true that the gap between our ambitious goals and our concrete policies remains much too wide. And it is our job, it is our common job to close this gap, and we need to do it now. Because we live in an era in which humankind can irreversibly destroy living conditions on our planet. It is up to us, to our generation, to leave the future open for our children and grandchildren. We have to leave a future open in which climate and environmental protection, economic prosperity, a self-determined life in freedom and social cohesion are all possible simultaneously. 
and this is, and I'm not using this lofty word lightly, this is our historic task. We must not fail. The future of humanity is at stake. Distinguished delegates and colleagues, I began my speech with democracy, the democratic transition unfolding in my country. As I draw to a close, I would like to widen the angle once more and consider the situation of liberal democracy as a whole, its credibility, its impact, its future at this difficult geopolitical juncture. In Afghanistan, a long engagement which cost many lives has failed, but not the idea behind it. My country has a, has a deep-set commitment to the idea of freedom and democracy, perhaps precisely because our German path to get there was long. Of course we know, in reality, political systems will never be perfect. Not in Europe, not in America, not anywhere. Consequently, they can neither be exported nor taking it further imposed. I believe the task is a different one. It is not by missionary zeal we can render the best service to this tremendous idea, but by letting the strength of democracy shine through at home, by bringing democracy to bear in the daily lives of our citizens, and by resisting any authoritarian temptation. And only through that can we render the best service to this tremendous idea. President Biden spoke of the global power of democracy at the General Assembly. And I would like to underscore that democracy is not a force directed against anyone. It is not a Western instrument of political power. It is an open project, regardless of compass, reading, geographical borders, regardless of skin color. It is the project for freedom the project for human dignity that the states of the world have set as their yardstick in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And because this must remain our yardstick, for us Germans, even after the failure in Afghanistan, withdrawal from the world is not an option. While people are being robbed of their dignity, indifference is not an option. And this is why more realism in foreign policy does not mean less responsibility. It does not mean less ambition to make the world a better place. On the contrary, the inherent human yearning for freedom, dignity, and self-determination will never be extinguished anywhere. Doing justice to this human yearning instead of suppressing it that is the real question defining our future in the 21st century. And this question will not be decided on any battlefield in our world. After all, the firepower of the most powerful army comes to an end. The long arm of the strongest state comes to an end. But the appeal of freedom and democracy in the hearts and minds of people lives on. And that is my firm belief. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Federal Republic of Germany for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear and address by His Excellency Borut Pahor, President of the Republic of Slovenia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency.
On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Borut Pahor, President of the Republic of Slovenia, and I invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, almost all the challenges we face are global. The solutions for them can be found only in working together. We have a historic opportunity to steer change in a direction beneficial for all humanity. I welcome the Secretary General's intention to hold a wide debate about our common future. We have to engage in meaningful discussion and dialogue, even with those, and specifically with those we do not agree with. The culture of dialogue has dangerously deteriorated with the widespread intolerant, offensive, and even hate speech. We must do everything within our power to emphasize respect for and consideration of different opinions and their reconciliation. It is about art of listening and speaking to others. Constructive cooperation is possible only through a dialogue, and cooperation is the only way of reaching peaceful solution to all disputes. That being said, I would like, in my speech, to address three main, three main topics, COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and peace and security. First about COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is proving to be a demanding and also, unfortunately, divisive challenge for our societies. I express my deepest sympathies to all those who have suffered. And I pay respect to new heroes, among them medical and care workers, scientists, teachers, and the young generation who struggled with limited access to education. Science, science has once again proved its decisive role. The pandemic uh, has set us to the greatest test in global solidarity in generations. I am proud to say that my country, Slovenia, pledged half a million euros to COVAX and, other share, uh, and our share of uh, donated vaccines measured per capita is among the highest. Second, about the climate change, about the climate change. Friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the recent report of International Panel on Climate Change is alarming. It has become clear that environment is in a worse condition than expected. Let me assure you that in its capacity as the presidency of the European Union Council, in the run-up and during COP26, Slovenia is committed to the objective of climate natu natural European Union by 2050. We will do its utmost to contribute to the success of the COP26 conference in Glasgow. It is imperative we move on climate uh, change uh, mitigation, adaptation and financing in order to meet the objectives objective of the Paris Agreement. The IPCC report is, in fact, a final urgent call for our immediate climate action. More than ever, we need to listen to scientists 
and experts. We can learn from them, and our decisions will be better. My permanent advisory committee on climate change, established two years ago, is an example of good practices. We regularly discuss uh, a lot, a variety of aspects of climate changes and recommend it to the government or the House measures to be adopted. The much needed green transition should go hand in hand with digital transformation. We must commit to achieving climate neutrality through reforms and investments in the areas of energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable mobility, and circular business models. The effects of climate change greatly impact water, both through droughts and the floods we have witnessed this summer and by affecting, affecting its quality. Competition for scarce water resources will, end, uh, will uh, intensify. The imminent water crisis is a threat, but also as an opportunity to rethink water innovations, governance, and collaboration on all levels. Slovenia is a country with a long tradition of integrated water resources management and cross-border cooperation on water. We will continue to raise awareness and understanding to the interlinkages between water and climate change and the importance of water for international peace and security. Mr. President, climate changes profoundly affect food security. For the very first time in modern history, a famine in one country, Madagascar, is attributed solely to global warming. Since 2014, Slovenia has doubled, has doubled its contribution for food security. In particular, through the World Food Program for South Sudan, and for Yemen, but also in other bilateral projects. Slovenia is recently helping to ensure food and water security for children and other vulnerable groups in Madagascar through Akamasoa, founded by Father Pedro Peca, an outstanding example, example of fighting poverty, who over the last 30 years has changed the lives of thousands and thousands of poor people who once lived on rubbish dumps. The Akamasoa community in Madagascar gives hum humanity high hopes that poverty can be eradicated. However, our efforts to fight famine need to go beyond humanitarian aid. We have to accelerate the transition to sustainable and resilient food system. That is why Slovenia welcomes the holding of the very first UN summit on, on food systems. I see it as an opportunity to raise awareness of the importance of responsible investments in environmentally friendly agri uh, uh, agriculture and the prevention of food losses and waste. I believe the responsible use of new and emerging technologies can help us deal with modern technologies and challenges. New technologies offer numerous opportunities to mitigate climate change, support sustainable arg uh, uh, agriculture, introduce smarter mobility, offer better education, and improve the effective use of resources, to name just a few. That is why I was delighted to 
together with the UNESCO Director General, Madame Ozolai, officially launched the International Research Center of Artificial Intelligence back in March in Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia. The pandemic has only increased our dependence on the digital space, while at the same time revealed its vulnerabilities to the spread of already mentioned hate speech. It is important to keep in mind that fundamental freedoms apply both online and offline. And finally, about peace and security. The dependence on uh, digital space has revealed it also our vulnerability to security threats and to cyber attacks. It has highlighted the extent of the damage caused by such attacks, attacks with regard to critical infrastructure, the, the economy, society, or even loss of lives. The nature of conflicts has expanded. To enable peace and security in all domains, we should collectively and more efficiently respond to different crises which exceeded the capacities of individu individual states to, re to react. We should also more energetically promote reconciliation processes once peace and security are established. The interconnected and interdependent nature of peace and, peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights is more evident than ever. COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the situation of most vulnerable members of our societies, children, elderly, human rights defenders. In many societies, we face shrinking space for freedom of expression. The full realization of human rights for all have proven to be key to our resilience and must be an integral part of our recovery. The situation in Afghanistan has exposed the fragility of our human rights system. Let us never forget that women and children's rights, as well as rights of different minorities, are universal human rights. Slovenia thus welcomed the, secu uh, the Secretary's General call for action on human rights and supports allocation a higher regular budget for the work of the UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights. And uh, finally, Mr. President, following the atrocities of the Second World War, we have built international system for the promotion of a dialogue and a peaceful settlement of all disputes. The system is codified by international law, and we must actively ensure respect for the principles of international law and the strengthening of international justice. This is about effective multilateralism, which Slovenia is passionately advocating for. This is the United Nations' finest achievement. Once again, let us work together. Thank you for your attention. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Slovenia uh, for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Paraguay to introduce an address by the head of state. Thank you, Mr. President. Of the 76th regular session of the General Assembly, 
It is my considerable honour to present the pre-recorded message of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Paraguay, Mr. Mario Abdo Benitez. President of the General Assembly, United Nations Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen. We meet here to tackle the most distressing problems for each of our peoples. We are responsible for ensuring that each and every speech is more than mere words to ensure that we can generate a space for deep-rooted and sincere reflection. COVID-19 continues to teach us all a lesson. It has shown us how solidarity and empathy are vital to tackle a pandemic such as this. We have seen how countries made laudably swift progress in vaccine manufacture. But the pandemic also brought to light some realities that we need to face up to. Vaccines. It has been so difficult for many countries such as ours to have to tell our peoples that despite having made arrangements and having paid for vaccines on time through the COVAX mechanism recommended by the, w the World Health Organization to guarantee equitable distribution, vaccines didn't arrive on time. Paraguay and many other countries were made to wait in this way. Paraguay has always stood for multilateralism because we understand that common problems, the, the common problems that transcend our countries, need a joint response, as is the case of COVID-19. However, we cannot conceal our deep-felt disappointment at the response of the multilateral system to ensure an effective and timely vaccine distribution. This reality must be addressed in this forum with a determination to assess what happened and to drive changes for the future. We cannot look the other way and overlook the fact that some attempted to use the vaccine as a tool, both political and ideological, at one of the most trying times in the recent history of humankind. I wish to underscore the cooperation of kindred and friendly countries which selflessly extended a hand of solidarity to the Paraguayan people through the donation of vaccines which allowed us to save lives and to forge ahead with our immunisation programme. Once again, I wish to express my gratitude to the governments of the United States, Qatar, India, Spain, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, the United Arab Emirates and Uruguay for such a noble gesture. Our country will never forget it. Mr President, the Paraguayan economy is to a large extent underpinned by the production of food for the rest of the world and our situation as a landlocked developing country markedly and structurally influences our development. In the context of the post-pandemic recovery, this situation will, once again, be decisive and it will be vital to facilitate the effective access for our products to markets in the most developed countries. For our part, to lessen the impact of this situation, we are making strides to transform our geographic location into an advantage. The ambitious Bioceanic Corridor project that we are working to advance will cross Paraguayan territory and will join the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. It stands as a clear example of how we plan to harness our geographic location and promote the physical integration of our region. Integration and sustainable development are major priorities of the foreign policy of the Republic of Paraguay. Decades ago, my country advocated an energy matrix based on clean and renewable energy, committing to care for the environment and convinced that energy is a crucial requirement to continue to forge ahead with development. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change 
is linked to the current water crisis affecting our region. The low water levels recorded in rivers are compromising the availability of water for human consumption and affecting navigability conditions. The situation is further seriously harming our foreign trade, which depends on waterway transport and threatens the efficiency of our sources of energy generation. Therefore, we underscore the importance of honouring the international commitments made within the Paris Agreement, and particular, particularly those referring to climate financing, and that to support the mitigation and adaptation efforts of developing countries, particularly those of us who are most vulnerable to global warming. Mr. President, terrorism, drugs trafficking and transnational organised crime are real threats for the international community. Thus, Paraguay is committed to directly financing their funding and, in particular, money laundering. To that end, we have taken steps such as updating our legal frameworks in order to build our institutional capacity response capacities and to bolster international cooperation to effectively address this scourge. One of the greatest atrocities of organised crime is the use of children in their activities. Paraguay once again condemns this despicable practice which we have already suffered from. We further condemn the use of inhumane acts such as kidnapping and extortion. Our government will not let up in the firm and decisive battle against criminal groups in accordance with the law. We will spare no efforts to ensure the return of Paraguayan nationals kidnapped by these groups. Our country defends life, families and human rights. Mr. President, as a founding member, Paraguay reaffirms its support to the United Nations and we reaffirm the organisation's importance as a forum for convening most countries around the world. In order to buttress democratic governance and to ensure a more balanced decision-making system within the United Nations, we believe that the role of the General Assembly should be enhanced and the reform of the functioning of the Security Council must be considered. Universality is a basic principle of our organisation. On the basis of that principle, we support the inclusion of Taiwan within the United Nations system. Mr. President, the ideal of a world in which peace, democracy, respect for human rights, freedoms and security reign is an ideal that binds us all. Putting aside differences and respecting the principle of equality that assists all states, we must further dialogue aimed at driving action to reduce poverty and inequality to promote a more equitable de development. I conclude noting what Pope Francis wrote on the very theme of this assembly. He wrote, Hope is bold. It can look beyond personal convenience, the petty securities and compensations which limit our horizon. And it can open us up to grand ideals that make life more beautiful and worthwhile. Let us continue to advance along the path of hope. Thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Paraguay for the statement just made. I now give the floor to the observer of the observer state of Palestine to introduce an address by the head of state. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the recorded statement of President Mahmoud Abbas, the President of the State of Palestine. 
before the 67th session of the General Assembly. I wish you all success in confronting the challenges that we are facing in the world and in the state of Palestine. Thank you. Excellencies, while we wait for the video uh, of the head of state of the state of Palestine being made ready, we may need to move to the next speaker. So allow us a few more time. In the name of God, the most merciful and compassionate, Your Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Your Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, I would now like to give the floor again to the observer of the observer state of Palestine to introduce an address by the head of state. You have the floor, sir. Madam President, 
It is my pleasure to introduce the recorded statement by His Excellency Mahmoud Abbas, President of the State of Israel, before the 76th session of the General Assembly. I wish this session all success in confronting the challenges that the world and our people is facing. The world looks to us to fulfill our duty and fulfill their right. Thank you. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Your Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Your Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, heads of delegations, members of delegations, ladies and gentlemen, May the peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you. This year marks the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba. More than half of the Palestinian people were uprooted from their land and disposed of their property. Myself, my family, and many others still possess the deeds to our land. These deeds are registered as part of the United Nations records. Here is that deed. And many Palestinians carry theirs as they still hold on to the keys of their houses to this day. Nevertheless, we have not been able to recover our properties due to Israeli laws that disregard international law and violate United Nations resolutions, which affirm the right of the Palestinian refugees to return to their homeland and to recover their property and to receive just compensation, most notably as enshrined in Resolution 194. In contrast, Israel, the occupying power, enacts laws and holds court hearings to unlawfully and forcibly displace Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan neighborhoods in Jerusalem which can only be characterized under international law as ethnic cleansing, which is rejected by our people and the international community as a whole and constitutes a crime under international law. This year also marks 54 years since Israel's military occupation of the rest of the Palestinian territory in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip in 1967. This occupation persists, despite having concluded a declaration of principles known as the Oslo Accord to achieve peace and mutual recognition with Israel in 1993. While we remained committed to all of its elements to this day and agreed to every call and initiative to achieve a political solution on the basis of international legitimacy, including the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative and the 2003 Quartet Roadmap, Israel has not honored its obligations under the signed agreements and has evaded participating in peace initiatives and instead pursued its expansionist colonial enterprise, destroying the prospect of a political settlement based on the two-state solution. To those who claim that there is no Palestinian partner for peace, to those claiming that we're missing opportunities just for the sake of it, I challenge them to demonstrate that we have rejected even once a genuine and serious initiative to achieve peace. And I accept the judgment of the world in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, does the Israeli occupying power believe that it can elude its responsibility for the crime of uprooting more than half of the Palestinian people from their land and for committing numerous massacres, killing and maiming thousands of Palestinians in 1948 in Balad el-Sheikh, Deir Yassin, Abu Shusha, Tantura, Ain Zaytun, Qibya and other places? Does it believe it would evade responsibility for subsequently destroying over 
500 Palestinian towns and villages, does Israel believe it can simply ignore the legitimate rights, including the political rights of millions of Palestinians within and outside of Palestine? The owners and sons of daughters of this land, with Jerusalem at its heart, does it believe it can continue its policies to steal their land, suffocate their economy, and prevent them from even breathing the air of freedom? Does Israel believe it can endlessly promote a false narrative that ignores the historical and present rights of the Palestinian people to their homeland? The crimes and aggressive policies of the Israeli occupying power against our people, land and holy sites will not derail our people's struggle to achieve their freedom and independence on their land. The colonial regime that Israel has established on our land will disappear regardless of how long it takes. We will not allow them to hijack our lives and kill our people's dreams, hopes and aspirations to realize freedom and independence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is regrettable that the policies of the international community and the resolutions of the relevant United Nations bodies regarding a solution for the question of Palestine have until now not been upheld and implemented, resulting in a failure to hold Israel accountable and impose sanctions for its violations of international law. Allowing Israel, which claims to be a democratic state, to act as a state above the law. Ladies and gentlemen, there are still some countries that refuse to acknowledge the reality that Israel is an occupying power, participating, rather practicing apartheid and ethnic cleansing. These countries proudly state that they have shared values with Israel. What shared values are they referring to? What shared values are they referring to? This has made Israel arrogant, emboldening it to reject and violate all United Nations resolutions. At the same time, there are those who demand from the Palestinian people and institutions that believe in the culture of peace and the rule of law to provide explanations and justifications to demonstrate that they do not incite hatred or promote violence. For example, we have to explain and justify what appears in our curricula, which reflects our narrative and national identity. While no one is demanding to review the Israeli curricula and media, it is there that the world could see the real incitement by Israeli institutions. We reject these double standards. We reject these double standards. Why should we have to clarify and justify providing assistance to families of prisoners and martyrs who are the victims of the occupation and its oppressive policies? We cannot, ladies and gentlemen, abandon our people and we will continue our efforts until our prisoners are freed. And I salute here the prisoners' heroic stand. If the occupation ends, there will no longer be a prisoner's issue. I cannot but wonder, and I address all people of conscience around the world, is there anyone on this earth who would punish the dead and prevent their families from burying them except those who are deprived of morality and humanity? Until when will this historical injustice against our people continue? Do the states that provide financial and military support to Israel, which it then uses to prolong its occupation and kill Palestinians, Do those that remain silent in the face of Israel's aggressive policies, it besieging and suffocating Palestinians, do these states actually believe 
They're ensuring peace and security for the Israeli people and stability for the region? The answer is no. I say it loud and clear, an emphatic, incontrovertible no. What more do you want from the Palestinian people? We have honored all our obligations under United Nations resolutions. We forced ourselves to endure the suffering imposed upon us, waiting for hope. And what was the result? Historical events over the decades have proven that these international policies towards Israel are misguided. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of unifying our internal front, we reiterate once again that the Palestinian Liberation Organization is the legitimate and sole representative of the Palestinian people. We stress that we are committed to the unity of our people and our land, committed to holding legislative, presidential and national council elections. As soon as holding such elections in Jerusalem is guaranteed as per signed agreements, we call on the international community to help us bring pressure to bear upon the occupying power to ensure these elections are held in Jerusalem as it is inconceivable that we remain unable to hold elections. And let me state here once again, we did not cancel the elections, but we only postponed them as we could not hold them in Jerusalem. Until this situation is addressed, we will continue to work on creating the necessary conditions to form a successful national unity government so that we can assist our people everywhere, so that we can implement reconstruction plans in the Gaza Strip, which requires a complete end to the aggression throughout the territory of the state of Palestine. I'm glad to reaffirm that the coming months will witness the holding of municipal elections in accordance with the law and elections for all unions and universities are already underway. Ladies and gentlemen, regarding building state institutions, we stress that we have a fully fledged state with institutions that operate in accordance with the rule of law and the principles of accountability, transparency, democracy, pluralism, respect for human rights, and the empowerment of women and youth. We have acceded to more than 115 legal instruments and international organizations committed to upholding our people's rights and strengthening our legislation and regulations, including those pertaining to human rights. We will continue our efforts to accede to what remains of the 500 international organizations acknowledged by the United Nations. We have taken the initiative of working jointly with human rights organizations and civil society organizations in Palestine to preserve these national accomplishments and to improve the work of our institutions on the basis of the rule of law. I have issued instructions to take all necessary measures to correct any wrongdoing and to continue upholding the rule of law, the freedom of expression and human rights. And this is the path that we are committed to in my country. I reaffirm to the international community our commitment to political engagement and dialogue as the path to achieve peace, the path for peaceful popular resistance, the path to combat terrorism in all its forms and origins in our region and the world. We have more than 83 agreements with other countries around the world to combat global terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to refer here to the constructive dialogue currently underway with the United States administration to resume Palestinian-US relations and to take 
steps that would ensure that the occupying power would abide by signed agreements. From our side, we are committed to ensuring the success of this dialogue to create conditions conducive to moving swiftly towards a final political settlement that ends the Israeli occupation of our country. And that applies the two-state solution. However, the current and former Israeli governments have persisted in evading the two-state solution based on international law and UN resolutions and insisted on pursuing occupation and military control over the Palestinian people while presenting flimsy, insubstantial economic and security plans as an alternative. These un unilateral plans will not achieve security and stability for anyone as they undermine efforts for a genuine peace and prolong occupation and entrench the reality of one apartheid state. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment of truth with the occupying power. It seems we are at a crossroads. We have had enough. The situation cannot continue and our people cannot endure it any longer. I have dedicated my life to achieving peace and chose the path of peaceful, legal and diplomatic work in international fora. We have extended our hand time and again for peace and still we cannot find a partner in Israel that believes in and accepts the two-state solution. The leaders of Israel today no longer feel any shame when they arrogantly dismiss this solution that is that enjoys global consensus. I warn that undermining the two-state solution based on international law and UN resolutions will open the way for other alternatives imposed upon us by the situation on the ground. As a result of the continuation of the Israeli occupation of our state, the absence of a just solution for the plight of 7 million Palestinian refugees uprooted from their land in 1948, the systematic theft of Palestinian land and the ongoing crimes of the occupation and the demolition of homes as a means of collective punishment, the killings and the detentions of thousands, including women, sick people and children, the imposition of the in inhumane blockade, an unjust blockade on the Gaza Strip and the annexation measures under numerous pretexts and names, including the settlement plant that they now invented in the city of Jerusalem and that we fully reject. All of this coupled with the crime of forcibly displacing Palestinians from their land as part of a policy of racial discrimination and ethnic cleansing pursued by the occupation in the absence of a deterrent international response. Our people will not surrender to the reality of occupation and its, legal, its illegal policies and practices. We will pursue our just struggle to fulfill our right to self-determination and options are available, including returning to a solution based on the partition plan of Resolution 181 of 1947, which gives the state of Palestine 44% of the land, double the territories that we ended up with after 1967. We remind everyone that Israel seized by military force half of the land specified for the state of Palestine in 1948. This solution would be indeed in conformity with international legitimacy. If the Israeli occupation authorities continue to entrench the reality of one apartheid state, as is happening today, our Palestinian people and the entire world will not tolerate such a situation and circumstances on the ground will inevitably impose equal and full political rights for all on the land of historical Palestine within one state.
In all cases, Israel has to choose. These are the options, and Israel has to choose. Ladies and gentlemen, International law stipulates the right to a free and dignified life and calls on states to take the necessary measures to protect and secure this right, as protection constitutes an indispensable and decisive element for the maintenance of peace, security, stability, and development. In this regard, I call on the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to work on the basis of relevant United Nations resolutions on protection, including the resolution adopted during the General Assembly Emergency Special Summit held in June 2018, entitled Uniting for Peace. I call upon the Secretary General to take all the necessary steps towards developing an international mechanism for protection as foreseen in his report of August 2018. And I call upon him to activate this mechanism on the borders of the occupied state of Palestine, including East Jerusalem, to avail our people of international protection, the borders of 1967. In parallel and in accordance with the aforementioned resolution, I call upon the Secretary General to convene an international peace conference in line with the internationally recognized terms of reference and UN resolutions and the Arab Peace Initiative and under the sole auspices of the Middle East Quartet. Ladies and gentlemen, to ensure that our initiative is time-bound, we give Israel the occupying power one year to withdraw from the Palestinian territories it occupied in 1967 including East Jerusalem, and we are ready to work throughout this year on the delineation of borders and solving all final status issues under the auspices of the International Quartet and in accordance with UN resolutions. If this is not achieved, why maintain recognition of Israel based on the 1967 borders? Why maintain this recognition? Moreover, we would go to the International Court of Justice as the highest international judicial body to adjudicate over the legitimacy of the occupation of the land of the Palestinian state and the relevant obligations for the United Nations and states around the world in this regard. All parties will have to abide by the verdict of the court colonialism, occupation and, and apartheid are prohibited under international law and they are crimes that must be confronted, a structure that needs to be dismantled. The international community's support for this initiative, consistent with international law and United Nations resolutions, may save the region from a grim unknown fate. We all have a chance to live in peace and security to have good neighborly relations, to live each in their own state, and delaying the implementation of these steps will keep the region in a situation of turmoil and instability with dire consequences. Do the leaders of Israel dream of maintaining their occupation forever? Do they want this occupation to last forever? Ladies and gentlemen, why should Palestinians continue living either under Israel's racist occupation or as refugees in neighboring countries? Are there no other alternatives? Freedom, for instance? Palestinians everywhere are creative, innovative, hardworking, dynamic people, and the entire world can testify to that. Palestinians deserve to live free in their homeland. From this podium, I call on the sons and daughters of Palestine everywhere around the world to continue their peaceful and popular struggle.
that has shown the true image of the valiant Palestinian people striving for freedom and independence by resisting occupation and apartheid. I salute our people everywhere and salute all nations and countries that have stood in solidarity with our people during the Jerusalem uprising and the prisoners uprising and against the aggression that claimed the lives of hundreds that spread destruction and displaced thousands of our people in the West Bank, Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. I also salute all those who took part in demonstrations in the United States and Europe and everywhere across the globe to demand an end to the Israeli occupation, apartheid and ethnic cleansing and to call for justice, freedom and self-determination for our people. This is a burgeoning awakening to get to know the true Palestinian story and I urge you all to continue defending the true story and defending the Palestinians' rights to freedom, equality and statehood. Criticizing the aggressive policies and practices of the Israeli occupation and settlers and of the Zionist narrative in general is not an act of incitement or anti-Semitism, but rather a duty of every free man and woman in the world. In this connection, I convey to the international community our gratitude and appreciation for their political and material support to our people and for the building of our institutions and national economy. But the time has come to take tangible steps to revive hope and end the Israeli occupation of our land and people and to consolidate the values of justice and peace in our region. I wonder what prevents countries that recognize Israel from recognizing the state of Palestine since they support a two-state solution? And I say to Israel's leaders, do not oppress and corner the Palestinian people. Do not deprive the Palestinian people of dignity, of their right to their land and state, as you will destroy thereby everything. Our patience and the patience of our people is running out. I reiterate yet again that the Palestinian people will defend their existence, their identity, and will not surrender, will not kneel. They will not leave. They will remain on their land, defending it, defending their fate, pursuing the great journey towards ending the occupation. The occupation of the land of the state of Palestine and its capital, its Jerusalem. We say once again, this is our land, our Jerusalem, our Palestinian identity. And we shall defend it until the occupier leaves, as the future belongs to us. And you cannot claim peace and security for yourselves alone. Let us be. Peace be upon you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the State of Palestine for the statement just made. We shall continue with the general debate. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Charles Michel, President of the European Council of the European Union. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Charles Michel, President of the European Council of the European Union, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Madam, La Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, Nadia Murad was born in Iraq. Nadia Murad is a Yazidi. On the 15th of August 2014, her life was appended. Jihadists attacked her village. Six of her brothers were murdered before her very eyes. And for the last 
She saw her mother at that time for the last time. She was captured to become a sexual slave, and she endured the basest atrocities, and she ultimately escaped. Today, Nadia Murad is a Nobel Peace Laureate, and she is fighting indefatigably for the rights and dignity of women. I wish to take this opportunity from here to quote her. I quote, today we have seen the price of conflict marked on women's bodies in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the Tigris, and in many other areas. So much potential has been lost, but if we disregard the power of women in conflict prevention and rebuilding communities, end of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, I met with Nadia Murad, and I saw in her eyes all of the strength of humanity. I heard in the softness of her voice utter determination. She decided to draw from the tragedy, and she, draw, she drew from this tragedy an unshakable strength to transform the world, to transform the world, and it is thus inspired inspired by Madame Murad that I address you today. Ladies and gentlemen. The European Union was forged by Europeans, like an irrepressible search of dignity and freedom after two bloody world wars. Today, we face another turning point in human history because we are entrenched in an other war, a global war, and this global war has no opposing sides, no armies, no land is lost or conquered. Yet, this war destroys lives, brings countries to their knees, and unimaginable suffering to families. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the war that we humans have waged against nature. We have tortured our planet abused our natural resources, we have committed acts of war against our environment. And now, nature is fighting back, bringing us back to our senses, back to humility. No one can say, I didn't know. For decades, scientists have sounded the alarm, but their warnings fell on deaf ears. We turned away so as not to see and today, the shock is brutal. We are reaping what we have sown. The fires that have devastated Australia, the droughts that have ravished Africa, the floods that have scarred Europe, and the hurricanes that have battered the United States. There is another scourge that has afflicted our planet for nearly two years. This also predicted by science, COVID-19. It has killed 4.7 million people and shattered the lives of billions more. But this pandemic has also led us back to the essential life and human dignity. And to safeguard this, we have taken exceptional measures, massive confinements that have brought our economies, our social lives, and more seriously, our freedoms to a near standstill. This pandemic has opened our eyes to the obvious. Our lives and our health are inextricably linked to the health of our fields, forests, oceans, and fauna. We share our planet with other living beings, and it's time. It's time to stop waging war against nature. It's time for humans to sign an armistice with nature, a peace treaty with our planet for the generations to come. It's time for us to transform the world, just as the previous generation did after the last World War. Inspired by the visionary signatories of the United Nations Charter, it's time to get back to basics, reason, and good judgment. Inspired by these principles, they left us an international order based on rules to promote peace. They built liberal democracies to guarantee the dignity of each individual. 
they championed the development model based on the freedom to trade and to pursue economic opportunity to ensure prosperity. And these choices have ushered in progress and greater stability. But the world of yesterday is not that of today, and even less the world of tomorrow. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, brutal unilateralism too often elbows out multilateralism. The ambition to dominate creates new dependencies and leads to tensions and conflicts. Democracies are under pressure, both from within and from without. Authoritarian regimes openly or not meticulously undermine the principles of freedom at home and even beyond their borders. And finally, our model of economic development has run its course. Its flaws are increasingly visible. The extreme exploitation of resources and increasing inequality. We must escape this vicious circle. Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, we are indeed at an inflection point, and we must ask ourselves, what world do we want for tomorrow? We want a world inspired by wisdom, a world that trusts in science, that guarantees the dignity and freedom of every human being. We want a fairer and a safer world. We want cooperation rather than confrontation, solidarity rather than isolation, transparency, not secrecy. And we want loyalty, honoring our word when our word is given. Mesdames et messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, you can count on the European Union by supporting Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals and fully in line with the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres. A fairer world is a world where we are all protected against COVID-19. The European Union has sought to provide massive support for research, and we have developed tremendous capacities for vaccine production. We have exported 700 million doses to 130 countries, and 3 billion euros have been invested in COVAX. It is important for us to acknowledge the fact that there is a gulf in vaccination between developing countries. This is not acceptable. There's a need for us to act more. We have launched tangible projects. One billion euros were mobilized to, to develop to pharmaceutical production capacities, including vaccine capacities in a number of African countries. And we also stand ready to support partnerships in Latin America. And we are aware of the fact that uh, winning, uh, vanquishing this pandemic is not enough. There's a need to prevent next pandemics, and there's a need to shore up global resilience to them. There's a need to that end. With Dr. Uh, uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, we have proposed an international treaty on pandemics, and we call upon all to support the launch of negotiations to that end, a, a, a fairer, more secure world is a world free of the climate threat. There's a need for us to have ambitious, far-reaching goals. The Paris Agreement was a milestone, and the European Union was a consequential actor in this. Contrary to others, we have honored our commitment to defend this agreement. And the 27 heads of government two years ago paved the way by adopting the commitment of climate neutra uh, neutrality by 2050 for the European Union. Others are following this example, and in the same spirit, the European Union has decided to raise its goals by 2030. Of course, there's a need for us to continue to make headway in international cooperation to move towards a carbon tax. At our level, we have a ET an ETS, Emissions Exchange System. This is an approach which we believe stimulates innovation and generates results. There is an overriding need to further build investments in greening the economy, and we wish to be in a position to build global approaches to establish a regulatory framework for green financing. We are aware that not all 
are equal in the race against time vis-a-vis -vis global warming. Industrialized countries shoulder particular responsibility in supporting developing countries. And since the pledge in 2019 and 2020 to mobilize 100 billion additional dollars to finance the international fight against global warming, since then few have honored their word. From two th 2013 to 2019, the EU and member states have disbursed 127 billion euros. That is one third of the total. And the commitment, and we call upon other partners to honor their pledges as well. It is a question of trust and a question of equality. Ladies and gentlemen, a fairer world, a safer and more secure world is also a world in peace. At this very moment, Women are brutalized. They are being raped because they are women. And this weapon of war is used, and particularly in the Horn of Africa, in Ethiopia. We call for a ceasefire and an immediate end to ethnic violence. Access uh, uh, to humanitarian assistance needs to be provided without any obstacles. Poverty and radicalism are two scourges which are feed off one another. Education, basic services, health infrastructure are, as we know, the best solutions uh, to address the related instability. In the Sahel, the European Union and nine of our member states have mobilized. We are standing alongside uh, with populations for security and defense and for development assistance. And of course, the restoration of s institutions of state governance and ensuring good governance are vital importance to achieve lasting results. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues, the new situation in Afghanistan is a failure for the international community, and there's a need for lessons to be drawn from this. However, one thing is certain, the end of military operations is not the end of the European commitment to Afghan men and women. We wish to avoid any humanitarian disaster and, and to the greatest possible extent to safeguard the gains made in the past two decades, specifically for women and girls. In the Indo-Pacific region, the European Union is the leading investor and one of the most important trade partners. 40% of our trade transits there. And we have decided to massively strengthen and shore up our cooperation. This is the thrust of the now strategic partnership between us and ASEAN. Freedom of navigation and security in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean need to be guaranteed. In line with international law, the European Union stands ready to fully shoulder its responsibility in that regard. Ladies and gentlemen, never will the European Union turn a blind eye to violations of human rights. Rule of law non-discrimination, respect for minorities, including LGBTQI, are fundamental values. This is the thrust of the human rights dialogue which we have been engaged in with many states throughout the world. We fully uphold these values, but we also stand ready to remain committed and to engage in dialogue in order to surmount global challenges related to climate, biodiversity, and the fight against pandemics. Peace is far more than the absence of war. Peace is never guaranteed. Peace is worked at every day. Peace is nourished by interconnections among our societies. The more interests we share, the less we engage in conflict. Economic, scientific, cultural, intellectual exchanges are the bedrock for stability, and this hinges on regional or continental integration projects. This also hinges on wide-ranging partnerships among our integrated spaces, be this Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, and also Africa. With our African brethren, we are working assiduously for a new alliance with the African continent through listening, through mutual respect, by taking into account the specificities, realities, transparencies, transparency and good governance needs to be the hallmark for all parties. We are mobilizing in private sectors to invest in both infrastructure and new technology, so we support all efforts to promote education. This is because education is the surest way to provide for a better future. Our shared interests are a, an engine to ensure a successful new partnership. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we, the European Union and member states, are one of the leading economic powers in the world, and we are also a leading sponsor of peace and sustainable development. We are financing with member states one quarter of the regular budget of the United Nations, 30% of the overall budget for peacekeeping, and half of global development assistance. This is a deliberate choice. This is a co a choice which aligns with our vision of an open and interconnected world. We have values to promote, citizens to promote, to protect, and interests to defend. And in this spirit, we're developing the strategic autonomy of the European Union, including in our capacities of security and defense, to be less dependent, to shore up our positive influence, and also to strengthen our Atlantic Alliance. This is an alliance which is anchored in our democratic values, and it is a staunch pillar of our security and stability in the world. Stronger, al stronger allies make for a stronger alliance in transparency and loyalty. Our positive influence is something which you have also seen strengthened in our immediate neighborhood. This is the thrust of the Eastern Partnership, which is a long-term commitment with Ukraine. Georgia, Moldova, Moldova, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. This is also the thrust of our support for the Belarus, Belarusian population and our strong stance vis-a-vis -vis the Lukashenko regime, specifically when he attempts to exploit migrants as a hybrid weapon to destabilize members of the European Union. And lastly, this is the thrust and the focus of the efforts that we have been engaged in in order to strengthen ties with Western Balkans countries. The recent uptick in violence in the Middle East was a fresh reminder of the overriding need to resume peaceful dialogue towards a two-state solution between with Israel and Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues, transforming the world, making it fairer, more secure, guaranteeing the dignity for every person. That is the promise. That is the pledge of the United Nations. And it is incumbent upon all of us to meet this promise, to honor the commitment, to rise to the ambition for all the Nadia Marads of the world and for succeeding generations. You can count on the European Union. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the European Council of the European Union for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by Her Excellency Issa Tuturi, Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia. May I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming Her Excellency Issa Tuturi, Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia, and I invite her to address the General Assembly. Mr. President, the Secretary General, Your Majesties, distinguished heads of state and government, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we thank Almighty Allah for making it possible for us to gather in person in this August Assembly to collectively discuss and find solutions to our shared challenges as members of the international community. This is even more important today as we strive to overcome the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. On behalf of His Excellency, President Adam Abaro, and the entire people of the Gambia, let me express our sincere gratitude to His Excellency Volkan Boskir for his excellent leadership during the 75th session of the General Assembly. Similarly, Mr. President, the Gambia welcomes your presidency of the General Assembly with renewed hope and enthusiasm for what we can collectively accomplish during the 76th session. We are optimistic that the five points agenda 
encapsulated in your presidency of hope would enable us to deliver to the satisfaction of a global body. Let me assure you of my delegation's unflinching support and cooperation during your tenure. We also commend the Secretary General for his sterling leadership and reform initiatives during one of the most difficult moments when the world is facing an unprecedented health, socioeconomic, and environmental crisis. Mr. President, I bring you warmest greetings from His Excellency, Mr. Adam Abaro, President of the Republic of the Gambia, who would have loved to be here in person, but due to urgent state matters, could not, and has asked that I extend his best wishes for a successful 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Mr. President, the importance of the theme that you have chosen for our general debate, building resilience through hope to recover from COVID-19, rebuild sustainability, respond to the needs of the planet, respect the rights of people, and revitalize the United Nations cannot be overemphasized. The challenges we face today as the international community requires resilience building, recovery from COVID-19 while building sustainability in response to the needs of our planet and its people. This would require having a revitalized United Nations that is fit for purpose. Mr. President, today Africa in general is grappling with negative effects of conflict and insecurity. The challenge of addressing the root causes of conflict and climate change require greater global solidarity and UN leadership. Apart from the heavy cost in human and material terms, conflicts impede production, damage infrastructure, prevent the reliable delivery of social services, and disrupt the growth of societies. Due to conflict in the continent, poverty continues to be perpetuated with a negative impact on our collective strive for sustainable peace and security. The socioeconomic conditions and the governance and security situation in the Sahel continues to alarm us. A more urgent and holistic response to the problems of the Sahel is currently needed. Without a stable Sahel, the West African region will lag in its development aspirations. In Africa today, there is undisputed recognition of strong interlinkages between peace and development, with studies confirming that armed conflicts remain a major obstacle to development in the continent. Against this background, my delegation calls on the international community to come together and act coherently to address the root causes of conflicts and recovery in Africa by adopting new approaches and narratives that suit the demands of our times. The international community should intensify its collective efforts to accelerate progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals and the goals and targets of Agenda 2063, including silencing the guns in Africa. We must equally strengthen the partnership between the United Nations and the African Union in formulating joint responses to existing and emerging threats to peace, security, and development in the continent. We call on the United Nations and the rest of the international community to help in building resilience and sustainability in Africa by promoting global engagement and actions around issues of health, education, COVID-19 recovery, vaccine accessibility, democracy, social protection, human capital development with a view to consolidating regional integration. We must continue to accelerate structural transformation while promoting industrialization in the continent. Furthermore, our partners should adopt a conflict-sensitive lens to development programming in Africa, including approaches that would prioritize prevention, stabilization, transformation, and sustainability to help African countries in their post-pandemic recovery and long-term development. Mr. President, like the rest of the global community, we are deeply concerned about the challenges of vaccine access and equity, abject poverty, the crushing debt crisis, and youth unemployment. Building back better from COVID-19 
reviving the momentum towards achieving the SDGs, as well as addressing ongoing development challenges, would require extraordinary international engagement and solidarity. For, for our continent, delays in addressing these challenges would continue to have devastating consequences on our economies. We are calling for a new strategic orientation and partnership that would accelerate recovery from the pandemic. In our view, building back better initiatives should focus on job creation, digitalization, increased SDG financing, strengthened health systems, scientific research, and increased utilization of local experts in program and project intervention in the continent. Global recovery will only be achieved when vaccine equity, availability, and accessibility are adequately addressed in all countries, big or small, developed or developing. Mr. President, as we continue to count on the UN development system for a renewed development partnership in this decade of action to help us address our development challenges, we call on partners to increase their funding without heavy earmarking. The UN agencies and other development partners need funding, flexibility, and predictability to deliver programs that support building prosperous and structurally transformed economies that leave no one behind, especially the LDCs and the middle-income countries. Mr. President, while the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly exacerbated human suffering in all spheres, it has also challenged us to mobilize all efforts and resources to address the eradication of poverty and inequalities through collective action and a renewed momentum towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mr. President, the pandemic has exposed existing fragilities and vulnerabilities and disrupted economic activities and employment, causing a sharp reduction in revenues and ability to achieve the SDGs, given the fall in growth of Africa's gross domestic product on an estimated minus 3.4% in 2020. At the national level, the government of the Gambia recently completed the midterm review of the National Development Plan 2018 to 2021 to take stock of the successes and gaps that exist. In light of the review, we are taking concrete steps to redefine the strategic priorities of the NDP in view of new challenges resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. We convey our appreciation to the United Nations and all development partners for providing us with timely, innovative, and critical support during the pandemic, which helped in ensuring government business continuity, provision of social protection, and the strengthening of our healthcare system. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have significant socioeconomic impact on the LDCs, which must be reversed through new and innovative programs, policies, and financing to help them recover and build back better inclusively. With the preparation of the fifth UN conference on the LDCs currently underway, it will be important for the international community to calibrate and commit to concrete actions that will support a resilient recovery and the attainment of the NDGs, SDGs in this decade. As an LDC, the Gambia believes it is crucial for governments to be equipped with necessary tools and adequate resources to finance our development priorities. And this is what we are articulating as part of the LDC-5 process. Mr. President, as the state of our collective security continues to be tested by unprecedented threats and challenges, so has the call to action become more urgent for the international community to support the efforts of the UN Security Council in the maintenance of international peace and security. In this regard, United Nations peacekeeping operations has proven to be the organization's strongest instrument and most impactful tool in assisting countries transition from conflict to peace. UN peacekeeping deserves our renewed support and participation. The government of the Gambia has consistently demonstrated its commitment to UN peacekeeping through its contribution to troops and police to various missions with an ever improving level of performance, discipline, and commitment. We continue to enhance our participation by, develop, by deploying more women peacekeepers. 
better training in areas requiring critical skill sets, and forging partnerships with stakeholders to expand our participation in more peacekeeping missions. Mr. President, once again, with the support of all our friends, the Gambia continues to progress on a positive and upward trajectory. The government's policies and approach continues to be guided by our awareness of the difficult history that we traveled as a country to usher in democracy. The Gambia is at a crossroad as we continue to seek national reconciliation, entrench our democracy, and consolidate the rule of law. We are on the verge of organizing presidential elections in December 2021 and legislative elections in 2022. No effort will be spared by the government in ensuring that these elections are held under free and fair conditions as we march towards the next phase of a political transition. We are going into these elections with the knowledge that our journey towards reform and transformation is in the area of good governance, transitional justice, or the civil service and security sector is an ongoing one. Our gratitude goes to our partners who continue to accompany us in our sustaining peace and peace building efforts. Mr. President, developments within the international community continue to be a matter of concern to my delegation. On Palestine, we must always remember that peace and security in Palestine and Israel means peace and security for the Middle East region and the world at large. It is therefore imperative for the international community to encourage genuine dialogue with a view to ending the deadlock. We must intensify efforts to bring both sides of the conflict to the negotiating table. Use of force and violence will only add to the suffering of the people living in the area. We continue to be deeply traumatized by the negative consequences of this conflict and cannot continue to ignore the humanitarian catastrophe that goes with it. Mr. President, it is our strong view that peaceful coexistence is the only viable way forward. Therefore, ending occupation, impunity, upholding international law, lifting of blockades on the Gaza Strip, addressing the dire humanitarian and ref refugee crisis, and having an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital should be urgently pursued by all and sundry. A new peace and political process must be launched by the Quartet. Mr. President, since we last met in this August Assembly, the plight of the Rohingya Muslim minority in Myanmar and elsewhere has not improved. The Gambia will continue to pursue the case at the International Court of Justice, ICJ, till the victims of the atrocity crimes receive justice. The international community must not relent in its quest for accountability in alleviating the dire circumstances of the Rohingya victims communities. Mr. President, the Gambia believes in friendly relations between states as the bedrock of international solidarity and cooperation. In this regard, we call on the United States to end the embargo against Cuba and pursue meaningful cooperation with its government and people. Let the embargo be a relic of history. Furthermore, Mr. President, the Gambia is strongly committed to the principles of recognizing one China. This is a cardinal principle of our foreign policy, which hinges on further strengthening our excellent bilateral relations on the basis of mutual respect, sovereign equality, and shared prosperity and win-win approach. Mr. President, we are aware of the geopolitical competition for influence by regional and global powers, but as small states members of the United Nations. We are more interested in seeing you cooperating more in fighting poverty, climate change, conflicts, and global insecurity. We want to see a world of shared prosperity and innovation. We share one planet, and we owe it to posterity to live it in a better shape. Let us eliminate this pandemic together and build forward better by leaving no one behind. Mr. President, the biggest lesson we have learned from the pandemic is that no one is safe without the other, and that our institutions are not fit for purpose. We must use the lessons of this pandemic to engender critical reforms of our institutions so that we are better prepared for the next pandemic, climate event, or humanitarian catastrophe. The United Nations Development System 
is currently undergoing critical reforms, and we are happy that it is adapting in ways that are contributing to the mitigation of the impact of COVID-19 in the developing country. Mr. President, one of the last holdouts of reform is the United Nations Security Council. Africa's quest for greater representation on the Security Council is legitimate, just, and overdue. One of the, we, uh, we must not relent until our demands are met and fulfilled. We want to have a greater voice in deciding issues that affect us. We call on all true friends of Africa to support our demands based on the Ezulwini Consensus and the CIRT Declaration. Once again, on behalf of the President Barrow and the Government of the People of Gambia, I extend sincere gratitude and appreciation to all our bilateral and multilateral development partners for accompanying us on our march towards greater democracy, good governance, development, and prosperity. I wish you all a successful 76th session of the General Assembly. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank Her Excellency Issa Toturi, Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia, for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Bena to introduce an address by the Vice President. Excellence, Mr. Excellencies, Mr. President of the General Assembly, heads of state and government, heads of delegations, Your Excellency, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to this August Assembly Ms. Miriam Shabitaleta, Vice President of the Republic of Benin, who has the privilege of delivering to the General Assembly the message of Mr. Patrice Talon, President of the Republic of Benin, Head of Government, Head of State. Madam, you have the full attention of the 76th session of the General Assembly. Your Excellency, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency, Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, his Excellency, Mr. Patrice Talon, President of the Republic of Benin, who is unable to attend, has instructed me to deliver the following statement on his behalf. I quote, I would like to begin, Mr. President, by thanking you for the excellent conduct of the work of this 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly. The theme of this session is Building Resilience Through Hope to Recover from COVID-19, Rebuild Sustainably, Respond to the Needs of the Planet, Respect the Rights of People, and Revitalize the United Nations. When we observe the current state of the world on different levels, we recognize that this theme is indeed very significant, meaningful, and in line with our experiences. It invites us to let go of the ever-present and growing skepticism of the despair that is increasingly gaining ground in our hearts in order to solve our current problems and rebuild sustainably. Mr. President, for some time now, the international community has been facing the global and destructive reality of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this regard, my country appreciates the high priority accorded by the United Nations and its specialized agencies, in particular the World Health Organization, to the search for a definitive solution to this health crisis. Broad and ongoing mobilization, as well as the pooling of efforts, have enabled the development of vaccines 
immunization rates across the world are fairly high, even if Africa still has a low vaccination rate and continues to face other infections which are just as deadly, such as malaria and HIV AIDS. Regarding our national management of COVID-19, the state of Benin has opted for the comprehensive vaccination of all citizens, as well as granting subsidies of several billion CFA francs to people and companies whose activities have been impacted by the pandemic. Here, I would like to thank all the partners who have supported our country in its fight to achieve the SDGs in line with the government's action program. Regarding the need to rebuild sustainably, for us, this is a matter of working to anticipate the occurrence of future calamities. Isolated, one-off local actions alone are no longer enough. Each state, each continent must open up to others so that through coordinated joint efforts, through synergies of action, the world can definitively and permanently rid itself of its fears. As for the insecurity generated by violent extremism and banditry, my country faces two situations with crisis generating potential. The terrorist threat, which constitutes a real danger to its northern borders, and maritime piracy in the south. To cope with this, in addition to taking the necessary measures domestically, Benin is joining all initiatives at the regional and international level in order to guarantee peace, free movement, and security to all its citizens and all those living on its territory. The same is also true for the needs of the planet. The same kind of attitude and behavior I hope for are expected to save a planet subjected to all sorts of abuse, overexploitation, excesses of production and consumption. We must go beyond our individual sovereignties and force ourselves to plan all actions relating to the needs of countries and the planet together, meeting food needs, water and energy needs, needs that I would call strategic must be done taking into account current threats and future generations. Turning now to respect for human rights, the SDGs remind us of them daily through the goals adopted by all of us. Our country believes that achieving the SDGs is the most concrete and surest way to respect human rights. This is why Benin is endeavoring through different strategies to mobilize resources that would enable our fellow citizens to have access to an adequate food system with school canteens throughout the entire country, quality lifelong education, healthcare through the insurance for strengthening human capital system which protects the most disadvantaged, drinking water by extending our distribution networks and energy by extending the electricity network and expanding clean energies. Today, thanks to the successful issuance of SDG Euro bonds, our country has been able to mobilize most of the resources needed to achieve the majority of the SDGs. At the political level, with the reform of the party system, the regular organization of elections, good governance, and fighting corruption, Benin guarantees its citizens the enjoyment of human rights. Mr. President, the progress made by our country in recent years is tangible, palpable, concrete, and it leads us to believe that due to this, we deserve a seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council for the period 2022-2024 so that we can share our experiences in the protection and promotion of human rights. Speaking from this rostrum is therefore a solemn occasion for me to recall that our country's candidacy has already been formally endorsed by the African Union. And backed by this support from our continent, we also invite all member states of the United Nations to support Benin's candidacy during the elections to be held in New York in October 2021. Mr. President, 
Finally, on the question of the revitalization of the United Nations, a reform of the institution is absolutely necessary, one that is founded on the principles of equality, justice, and solidarity between member states. Times have changed, the world has changed, and our organization must also change and adapt to the times. We appeal to the spirit of universal consensus to make the United Nations a modern, free, and just institution. In the meantime, my country reaffirms its support for diplomatic initiatives aimed at the creation of, of a viable Palestinian state entitled with the attributes of full international sovereignty and coexisting peacefully with the State of Israel. Benin also supports the efforts of the United Nations to find a definitive solution to the question of Western Sahara. Finally, my country remains in solidarity with the resolution adopted by the 34th Summit of the African Union in February 21 in Addis Ababa regarding the economic blockade imposed on Cuba by the United States and reaffirms the need to put an end to it in the name of promoting peace and development. Benin therefore calls for the normalization of relations between Cuba and the United States, two countries that are friends of Benin. Our hope, because one must always live with hope, is that the various appeals made here will be heeded by all in order to bring about a world that is modern, united, free, just, safe, and prosperous for everyone. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Vice President of the Republic of Benin for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by Her Excellency Rebecca Niandang de Mabior, Vice President of the Republic of South Sudan. May I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming Her Excellency Rebecca Niandeng de Mabio, Vice President of the Republic of South Sudan, and I invite her to address the General Assembly. Madam. Your Excellency, President of the General Assembly, Your Excellency, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellency, Heads of the Delegation, and fellow delegates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of President, His Excellency Salfa Kir Mayadid, I stand before you to share the recent development in our country. I intend to do so in the spirit of constructive engagement. On July 9, 2011, we emerged from a long liberation struggle against oppression and domination. After 10 years of independence, we remain on a path of nation building founded on the vision and inspiration of our liberation struggle and what we have committed for ourselves under the revitalized agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan that was re re uh, realized through the support of the UN, the UA, uh, AU, and key friend, friendly nations. While our determination to fulfill implementation, uh, imp impl impl to, to implement the provision of the agreement has been impacted by many challenges, uh, foremost of which is a global COVID-19 pandemic outbreak and the limited resources needed for its implementation, it has enabled the formation of an inclusive transitional government of national unity, the establishment and operation of local governments, and setting up of the transitional national legislative assembly that are fervently serving the people. President Salfa Kir launched the national dialogue to complement the agreement while the revitalized peace, peace process was underway. The national dialogue followed a bottom-up approach conducting grassroots consultation 
that covers all the regions in the country and articulate, articulated the views and recommendations from the people on the South Sudan they would like to see and of a government that would be serve, serving them. The President received the report of the National Dialogue in May 2021 and pledged to implement its recommendations. The same recommendations are providing the foundation as we embark on the process of developing our first ever constitution. Mr. President, the revitalized agreement and national dialogue are necessary historical steps in our country's quest for peace, but we are still far from building a nation that can provide essential services and development for our people. As a national leaders, we ad uh, admittedly have occurred mistakes that may have disappointed our friends, supporters, and the world. We have learned from those mistakes, and I am here to engage in constructive dialogue with our international partners, bearing in mind the lessons and, con and consequences of our actions, and more importantly, the dreams, aspirations, and, and marching order from our people of the kind of government, society that they want. Permit me to highlight some key points on our efforts to bring about uh, much needed peace, security, and development to our people. First, I would like to acknowledge that although our independence was product of the struggle and sacrifices of our people, we could not have won without the political and material support from our friends, allies, and partners from around the world. We are deeply grateful to them. Second, I want to assure our friends and partners that we are determined to never go back to war. We pledge to pursue the promises our liberators made to our people. We must ensure peace, security, dignity for all without distinction. We must replace the destruction of war with the productive use of our vast natural resources and national assets for good of our people. Third, we fully realize that the responsibility for pursuing this vision is our own as a people. We believe that the partnership we seek can only be accomplished through constructive, mutually beneficial engagement. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, the failure to fulfill the promises of our struggle is due to objective reasons for which our partners and ourselves must co cooperate in finding practical solutions. While there should be no doubt about goodwill of President Salfa Kiir and the government he leads to secure peace and the an establishment of a just, peaceful, inclusive, and prosperous South Sudan, we need to identify and address the objective reasons for these failures. President Kiir has recently stated that it is now time to correct the past mistakes and open a new page for building a better future of peace, development, and prosperity for our people. Mr. President, we should recall that at our independence, the international community pledged to help build the capacity of our infant country in all areas of nation building. As a result, the United Nations mission in South Sudan, UNMIS, was created to help establish the foundations of our new nation. However, after the outbreak of war, that vision was abandoned and priority was placed 
on protecting civilians and providing humanitarian assistance. As a result, support for capacity building of the, uh, of the state was terminated. The protection of civilians is a priority. As the Vice President responsible for the humanitarian cluster in our government, I champion this cause, but it should not be at the expense of capacity building and sustainable development. Building state capacities to govern responsibly and effectively is essential. It is also necessary to guard against the unintended consequences of dependency on humanitarian assistance. With the, con with the constant improvement in peace security, it is time to, trans to, to transition from emergency and place our efforts to, res to resetting the sustainable development agenda. The development of the revitalized national development strategy is the government of South Sudan's clear and deliberate road roadmap to accelerating the implementation of our axis while laying the foundations of sustainable peace and the stabilization of our economy. It is a painful and shameful situation for a country in doubt with vast fertile land to be regarded as poor. We must ensure peace and security in the country and double our efforts to support our people who wanted to return and are returning to their areas of origin for them to participate fully in nation building and contribute to, br to bringing food security in the country. At the core of our efforts are the youth. South Sudan is a young and useful country. And we call on our partners to help us in our continuing efforts to develop the skills of women and youth, providing them with jobs and livelihood opportunities, and harnessing their energy and productive capacity to, pro to, to provide an alternative to picking up the gun against, again and engaging in destructive behavior. I am glad to note that encouraging steps have been recently have recently been taken in this direction. For example, our security forces and their UNMIS counterparts have begun to promote rural peace and security. We are soon unveiling a national youth service program and setting up a youth empowerment fund in partnership with the United Nations Development Program and other partners. The government welcome and appreciate such fruitful and positive engagements. To fulfill the vision of our liberation struggle, we must use our oil revenues to fuel economic growth through investment in agriculture. We will invest in infrastructure to connect our rural communities to the markets. We need the public and private sectors, including foreign investors, to join hands in turning South Sudan's uh, potential wealth into a reality. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I am glad to report on the implementation of the various chapters of the agreement. We have formed executive and legislative organs at the national and state levels. In line with power sharing formulas in chapter one of the agreement. More importantly, we have made significant progress in implementing public financial management reforms in chapter four. These measures have met the expectation of international financial institutions and other external partners. In addition, the constitution making process has recently taken a significant steps forward and with convening 
a workshop that charted a, a roadmap towards the drafting and adoption of their permanent constitution. Towards, towards the drafting and uh, adoption of the permanent constitution, the implementation of chapter five on transitional justice, accountability, reconciliation, and healing is moving forward at a relative slow pace. This is not for lack of political will, but rather for objective reasons that are address, addressing with our regional and international partners. We can therefore say that the glass is half full in the implementation of most chapters of the revitalized peace agreement. Where the glass remains half empty is in chapter two on a permanent ceasefire and transitional security arrangements. There is a, an urgent need to form a unified professional army under one command and control. The security sector reform is the most challenging part of the agreement as it, is con it, it contains elements at the center of the, of the violent conflicts in the country. The parties to the agreement and other stakeholders should continue dialogue to build the mutual understanding and confidence needed to address and resolve long-standing differences. Building sustainable peace requires inclusivity, collective investment, determination, diligence, and patience. Mr. President, having celebrated the 10th anniversary of independence this year, the next decade, the United Nations Decade of Action to deliver on the SDGs by 2030 is an opportune moment that coincides with our efforts to develop the country's economy by investing in agriculture. Moreover, with the youth estimated at 73.6% of the population, the government promises to leverage women and young people's contribution to agriculture and economic development. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, climate change has already impacted the lives of at least one million people across South Sudan. Torrential rains have resulted in the worst flood, flooding in 60 years and have inundated in, vill villages and towns and destroyed livestock. South Sudan has developed and submitted its second nationally determined contribution which lays out the framework of the country's string commitment, uh, commitments to Paris Agreement and its contribution to the global effort to reduce emission to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, despite the country already having amongst the lowest carbon emission. The NDC not only ple uh, places the country towards a sustainable low carbon growth pathway, but also develop its resilience against climate-induced shocks uh, and stresses. South Sudan is contributing more than its fair share in reducing global emission. Yet, it is among the countries that is suffering the most from the impact of climate change. We call upon member states to aggressively respond to the call for action to further cut emissions if we are to avert catastrophic situation that will be a defining moment for mankind. South Sudan stands ready to help the world, and this is to our national interest, as we have the natural resources and capacity to enhance climate mitigation and adoption measures. However, funding these measures is essential, and so we join the call 
to make climate finance accessible to developing countries to enable us to help the world more while, as, while also preventing climate change impacts from revising our, develop, revising our developmental gains and increasing the vulnerability of our people and country from shocks and stresses. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I am happy to report that bilateral relation, relationship between South Sudan and Sudan has significantly improved. We have cooperated effectively to resolve our national problems, positively reinforcing our mutual relationship. There are, however, issues that still need to be resolved between our two countries. First and foremost is the issue of the contested area of ABI. The ABI protocol of CPA already states the basis for resolving this issue. Unfortunately, we disagree on the implementation of the ABI protocol and have entered into several additional agreements without, without a final solution. Now Khartoum has called for, for the withdrawal of the Ethiopian forces in the United Nations Interim Security Force in Abia. Any alternative ar arrangements will take time and leave a dangerous security gap in the area. This issue can be resolved peacefully through an arrangement that will give Abia people their freedom and dignity. Moreover, that will enable them to play a positive role at the border between the two Sudans. We are determined to learn from the past and look forward to engaging in a constructive dialogue, revitalized cooperation, and being more effective in pursuing our shared objectives. We must make the revitalized peace agreement succeed, and we can only do that with support of our regional and international partners. Simply stated, South Sudan desires and is ready to turn a new page. Last, Mr. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I have come to this assembly with the spirit of my late husband, Dr. John Garang de Mabur, and all those who paid the ultimate price in the struggle. It was a dream for Dr. John to liberate his people and address the global community at this very podium. Being here as a female vice president from an independent South Sudan realized Dr. John's dream. Thank you, Mr. President and distinguished delegates for this opportunity and your attention. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank Her Excellency Rebecca Niandeng de Mabur, Vice President of the Republic of South Sudan, for her statement, and I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Armenia to introduce an address by the head of government. Uh, I have the honor to introduce the pre-recorded statement by uh, His Excellency Nikol Pashinyan, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Armenia. Honorable President of the General Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to once again deliver a statement at the United Nations General Assembly. First of all, I would like to congratulate Mr. Abdullah Shahid on his election as President of the General Assembly, as well as Mr. Antonio Guterres on his re-election as Secretary General of the United Nations. I am confident that with your leadership, you will help us overcome the vast challenges we are facing. Today in my speech, I would like to refer to the situation in the South Caucasus region. 
present our views and proposals on the solution of the existing problems. As you know, in the fall of 2020, Nagorno-Karabakh was subjected to aggression. The war that lasted 44 days took the lives of several thousands of people. Tens of thousands of residents of Nagorno-Karabakh were displaced. The aggression was accompanied by numerous gross violations of international law by the Azerbaijani armed forces, including deliberate targeting of civilians and vital infrastructure, extrajudicial killings of prisoners of war and civilian hostages, torture and many other documented crimes. As a result of these actions, the Armenian people were subjected to complete ethnic cleansing in the parts of Nagorno-Karabakh which came under the control of Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, the international community here again could not prevent the mass atrocities. Today, no Armenian lives or practically could live in the territories under the control of Azerbaijan. Thanks to the mediation efforts of the Russian Federation, it was possible to stop the bloodshed. On November 9, a trilateral ceasefire statement was signed. Peacekeeping forces of the Russian Federation were deployed in Nagorno-Karabakh, which today ensures stability and security there. Dear colleagues, one month ago, the Republic of Armenian National Assembly approved the government's action plan for 2021-2026, where one of the key provisions is to open an era of peaceful development for our country and the region. Moreover, as per the results of the early parliamentary election held on June 20, 2021, the people of Armenia gave to our government a mandate to move towards this key goal. It should be emphasized that our government received this important mandate based on the results of elections that were held to overcome the domestic political crisis. This was the second election in our country after the non-violent, velvet People's Revolution in Armenia in 2018. Both elections were assessed by international observers as competitive, transparent, and in line with democratic standards. So, how are we going to achieve the goal of opening an era of peaceful development for our country and the region? Through dialogue, overcoming incrementally the atmosphere of painful hostility in our region. We realize that the path will be difficult and long. Unfortunately, the incidents designed to delegitimize the peace agenda and deepen and institutionalize the atmosphere of hostility currently occur on a daily basis. Violations of the ceasefire Aggressive and insulting statements against Armenia and the Armenian people continue to escalate the atmosphere. An act against the peace agenda is the fact that, contrary to Article 8 of the November 9 statement, Azerbaijan not only still holds several dozen citizens of the Republic of Armenia in captivity, but also has sentenced many of them to 6 to 20 years of imprisonment on trumped-up charges. In addition, there are citizens whose captivity fact has not yet been confirmed by Azerbaijan, although there is clear evidence that they are in captivity. This becomes even more unacceptable against the background that, in the fall of 2020, Azerbaijani Internet users posted videos of the capture of specific Armenian soldiers and later that the decapitated or shot bodies of these soldiers were discovered. We have irrefutable evidence that our captives have been tortured. An outrageous example of the deepening of the atmosphere of hostility is the opening in Baku of the so-called 
Park of Trophies, where Azerbaijani schoolchildren are taken on excursions to watch the mannequins of captured, killed or bleeding Armenian soldiers. These and other steps are taken to demonstrate the impossibility of peace in our region, but we shall consistently advance this agenda by using every opportunity and by creating new opportunities to open an era of peace for our region. In this sense, I consider the opening of regional communications to be of extreme importance, which is stated in point nine of the trilateral declaration signed by the President of the Russian Federation, the President of Azerbaijan, and the Prime Minister of Armenia on November 9, 2020, and 11 January 2021. The interconnected transport arteries of the region will be an outcome of resolving this issue. Opportunity will be created for establishing economic ties, which is an important prerequisite for peaceful development. While examining the topic of reopening transport links, we discovered that there are options that aim at sustaining regional isolation and hostility, but there are also options that emphasize regional interconnectedness and can be a step-by-step -step solution of the problem of hostility. We are an advocate for this latter option. If the railway connecting Armenia to Turkey is opened too, then the topic of opening regional communications will cover broader scope. Honorable Mr. Secretary-General, Armenia is ready for a constructive dialogue which should lead to the establishment of sustainable and lasting peace in the region. In this regard, we propose to complete the process of return of prisoners of war, hostages and other captives without delay. It is also necessary to resume the peace process for the settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict under the auspices of the OSC Minsk Group co-chairs. There is no doubt that the situation created through the use of force cannot gain legitimacy from the point of view of international law. The right of the people of Artsakh to self-determination cannot be suspended through the use of force. The conflict cannot be considered resolved through the use of force. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is awaiting its just settlement. This is evidenced also by the statements of the co-chair countries which emphasize the need to resume the negotiation process based on the well-known principles. We believe that the contacts mediated by the co-chairs will enable the parties to find common ground and to open avenues for addressing many difficult issues. Next is the issue of delimitation and demarcation of the Armenia-Azerbaijan border. I must state with regret that it is difficult to imagine a border delimitation process on the backdrop of almost daily shootings and various provocations on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border, on the backdrop of units of the armed forces of Azerbaijan having infiltrated the sovereign territory of the Republic of Armenia on May 12, 2021 in the Sotk Khoznavar section. To overcome this situation, we have suggested the following actions. In the above-mentioned section, the armed forces of both Armenia and Azerbaijan should withdraw simultaneously to the Soviet Times border. International observers would be deployed along that border, and under international auspices we would start delimitation and demarcation. We are ready to implement this proposal at any time. Dear colleagues, in my speech I touched upon issues of vital importance for our country and for the region. These issues need urgently to be addressed today and require the urgent attention of the international community. At the same time, as I conclude my speech, I would like to reaffirm that Armenia as a responsible member of the international community and a reliable partner will continue to contribute to the strengthening of comprehensive international order, to international cooperation based on the purposes 
and principles of the UN Charter, promoting sustainable development, and protection of fundamental human rights. We are committed to a constructive and inclusive dialogue with all of our partners. Armenia is ready to make every effort to contribute to overcoming the current global challenges such as climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, issues of international peace, security, and sustainable development. With this, let me complete my speech by wishing success to the works of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. Thank you for attention. May I invite the General Assembly to hear a pre-recorded statement by Honorable Praveen Kumar Jagnat, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Mauritius. President of the General Assembly, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Mr. President, it is indeed a great pleasure to see you steering the proceedings of the 76th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Mauritius and Maldives share common challenges as developing islands of the Indian Ocean. We wish to assure you of our full cooperation and support during your presidency. I extend my gratitude to His Excellency Mr. Volkan Bozkir, for his successful presidency of the last session. Let me also congratulate His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, upon his re-election as Secretary General of the United Nations, and thank him for his comprehensive report entitled, Our Common Agenda. Mr. President, you have chosen a very appropriate theme for this session, given the unique situation we are in for the past 20 months. Building resilience through hope, recovering from COVID-19, rebuilding sustainably, responding to the needs of the planet, respecting the rights of people and revitalizing the United Nations, cover the whole range of activities which are not only urgent but also crucial if we are to ensure our long-term continued existence on our planet in a manner that enhances multilateralism and cooperation, protects the rights of people by reinforcing our institutions and the rule of law, and leaves no one behind. The COVID-19 pandemic caught a totally unprepared world with unparalleled intensity, disrupting governments and societies, the multilateral system, and more importantly, the lives and livelihood of people. It has brought to light the scale of global interconnectedness. Events in one country can have rippling effects across the globe. Almost two years later, we are still grappling with the pandemic and its mutations. And despite the fact that vaccines have come out amazingly fast, we are still not in a position to say that life is back to normal. In fact, just as many countries were finding it hard to find basic protective equipment at the beginning of the pandemic, they are now facing similar challenges to have access to affordable and effective vaccines. 
while advanced economies have been able to deploy massive fiscal stimulus to cushion the pandemic's impact and have succeeded in achieving mass vaccinations, the policy response of developing countries has been constrained by several factors and access to vaccines is still limited. Inequitable vaccine distribution is not only leaving millions of people vulnerable to the virus, but it is also allowing new variants to emerge with the result that recovery will take longer. We welcome the US initiative to organize a leaders summit to consider ways of eradicating the pandemic. The meeting held this week shows that bringing together world leaders, economic partners and vaccine producers and the scientific community can lead to concerted actions to fight the pandemic. We should strive towards producing more vaccines more rapidly and decentralize their production to cater for the needs of the people around the globe. Multilateral facilities such as the COVAX should be fully funded and empowered to redistribute surplus vaccine doses. Necessary technology and resources should be shared with developing countries, including seeds like Mauritius, to enable the rollout of vaccines for faster return to normalcy. In the same vein, unilateral economic sanctions should be reviewed in the light of humanitarian urgency to fight the pandemic. Mr. President, with these initiatives, we stand a good chance to eradicate the pandemic or at the very least be able to learn to live with it. But the world will still have to face the economic challenge that has come with the pandemic. COVID-19 has severely impacted the world economy. Mauritius was not spared and our GDP contracted by 14.9% in 2020. Public health spending has had to be increased significantly together with a string of measures to assist business transformation, support the tourism sector, increase local food production and support various sectors of the economy. Along with the pandemic, Mauritius has also faced other challenges concerning its financial services sector, and we have had to address these as a matter of great urgency in order to keep the sector afloat. Mr. President, before the pandemic, small island developing states were already facing significant levels of debt distress. While we welcome the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative, we believe this facility should be extended to include small island developing states, in particular the middle income countries as well. A new global financial architecture focusing on fiscal space and debt sustainability is urgently needed for SEEDS. Mauritius fully supports the proposal to produce a multi-dimensional vulnerability index to be used in determining the type and measure of support that will be needed by a country, not only to build its resilience, but also to put it on track to achieve its SDGs. Mr. President, the Paris Agreement was hailed as a major breakthrough in our efforts to tackle climate change. But the climate events since show that unless we commit to doing much more, our planet and indeed our existence are severely threatened. The last intergovernmental panel on climate change report is unequivocal. We are in the red and human influence is to a large extent responsible for the state of our atmosphere, ocean, and land. 
The world has great expectations from the COP26 summit. We all know what needs to be done. It is not sufficient to simply raise ambitions, but more importantly, we need to commit to deliver on them. We owe this to future generations. Mauritius welcomes the fact that the Green Climate Fund has nearly reached the level of contributions that has been pledged. But this will be meaningless unless access to it is simplified, especially for seeds. Mr. President, oceans are host to huge amounts and varieties of biodiversity that need to be protected. We support ongoing work for a legally binding instrument on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction that would allow an equitable sharing of benefits. Mr. President, the protection and promotion of human rights and gender equality should remain at the center of all our endeavors. We have an immense responsibility towards our future generations. Throughout the world, students and young people have been facing growing frustration because of confinements, education disruptions, and fewer job opportunities. Special efforts need to be made to bring them in the mainstream. Mauritius stands ready to support all initiatives in that regard. Mr. President, one sector which has thrived during the pandemic relates to infodemics and criminal activities in cyberspace. This has to be addressed globally. We support the elaboration of an international convention on countering the use of information and communications technologies for criminal purposes. Mr. President, the use of force to legitimize governments is a matter of grave concern to the international community and affects peace and regional stability. We condemn such acts just as much as we condemn the resurgence of violence, extremism, and terrorism in Africa. We stand in solidarity with the Afghan people and hope that peace prevails and brings stability to the region. We support all regional and international initiatives aimed at finding sustainable, peaceful solutions we also call for a just and lasting settlement for the Palestinian people. Mr. President, Mauritius expresses the hope that under your presidency, the process of reforming the Security Council in order to make it more representative of the new realities will be accelerated. The historical injustice done to Africa must be corrected. Africa should have its rightful place in an expanded Security Council, which should also include a seat for seats. Mr. President, it remains a matter of concern that more than two years after the International Court of Justice ruled that the decolonization process of Mauritius has not been lawfully completed in view of the unlawful accession of the Chagos Archipelago from its territory prior to independence and that the United Kingdom has an obligation to withdraw its unlawful administration from the Chagos Archipelago as rapidly as possible, we still see no action on the part of the colonial power. And yet, the findings of the ICJ have been affirmed by the UN General Assembly Resolution 73-295. And in January this year, a special chamber of ITLOS has held that those authoritative determinations of international law by the ICJ have binding legal effect, rendering it beyond legitimate dispute that Mauritius is sovereign over the Chagos Archipelago as an integral part of its national territory. 
The ITLOS Special Chamber also underscored that in adopting Resolution 73-295, the General Assembly has set out modalities for the completion of the decolonization of Mauritius, which the ICJ has ruled every member of the UN and UN agency has an obligation to support. The ITLOS Chamber will now proceed to delimit the maritime boundary between Mauritius and Maldives on the basis of Mauritius being the coastal state in relation to the Chagos archipelago. We note with further satisfaction that specialized agencies of the United Nations, such as the Universal Postal Union, have recently adopted by a large majority a resolution to give practical effect to General Assembly Resolution 73-295, thereby ensuring respect for international law and its obligations under the agreement it signed in 1947 with the United Nations. Mauritius looks forward to further implementation of Resolution 73-295 by other international and regional organizations with the support of UN member states. Mauritius remains committed to implementing a program for the resettlement in the Chagos Archipelago of Mauritian nationals, in particular those of Chagosian origin who were forcibly removed by the UK from the Chagos Archipelago in violation of their basic human rights. I express on behalf of the government and people of Mauritius, and in particular the Mauritians of Chagosian origin, our sincere gratitude to all the countries that have been supporting us in completing our decolonization, and we appeal to the colonial power to comply with the rulings of the international courts and the resolutions of the General Assembly. Compliance with international law is the responsibility of all law-abiding states. Mr. President, I would like to reiterate the commitment of Mauritius to ensuring the continued operation of the defense facility in Diego Garcia. Mauritius considered the facility vital to the maintenance of international peace and security in the Indo-Pacific region and to efforts to combat terrorism, piracy and the illicit trafficking of drugs and persons. In this regard, Mauritius as sovereign over the Chagos Archipelago, which includes Diego Garcia, stands ready to enter into a long-term agreement with the United States in respect of Diego Garcia. Mr. President, with regard to Tromelin, which also forms an integral part of the territory of Mauritius, we call for the early resolution of the dispute over the island in the spirit of friendship that characterizes the relations between Mauritius and France. Mr. President, we can no longer afford to be fractious. We need to promote, preserve, and strengthen multilateralism. Together, we can build more sustainable, equal societies and economies. Together, we can transform our world into one that recognizes and respects the dignity of every human being. I thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister, Minister for Defense, Home Affairs and External Communications, Minister for Rodrigues, Outer Islands and Territorial Integrity of the Republic of Mauritius for the statement just made. I have the honor now to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sweden to introduce an address by the head of government. Madam President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Mr. Abdullah Shahid on taking up the position as president of the 76th session of the General Assembly. I also welcome the reappointment of Mr. Antonio Guterres as UN Secretary General for a second term. Both of you can count on Sweden's full support for your important work. It is my honor now to introduce Sweden's pre-recorded national address to the general debate on the 76th session on the General Assembly, delivered by His Excellency Stefan Löfven, Prime Minister of Sweden. Thank you. Excellencies, this year marks 75 years since Sweden became a member of the United Nations. Today's global challenges demonstrate the urgent need to strengthen international cooperation with the modern UN at its core. The devastating impact of the pandemic has tested the resilience of our societies and put pressure on the multilateral system. More than half of the world's population have not yet been vaccinated against COVID-19, making sure that vaccines are accessible equally to everyone must be our priority. COVAX remains our best instrument. Sweden is its largest per capita contributor, and I'm proud to announce that we intend to increase our support for global access to vaccines. We look forward to cooperating with all member states in identifying ways to improve health system prevention, preparedness, and response capacities. Excellencies, the extreme weather events we have witnessed with forest fires, flooding and heat waves underline the urgent need to act against climate change. We must listen to the science and transform our societies. And we must keep the 1.5 degree goal alive. Lower emissions, adaptation, and protecting of biodiversity must be our priority. Recovering from the pandemic will provide an opportunity to build back greener. This year, we need to stand up to the test as we gather at COP26 in Glasgow, COP15 in Kunming, and prepare to conclude a legal instrument to protect biodiversity in the high seas. Next year marks 50 years since the world gathered in Stockholm for the first ever UN conference on the environment. In June, we will host Stockholm Plus 50, which we expect will be a catalyst for necessary transformative actions for systemic change as with regard to the environment and climate change agenda. Let's take this opportunity to help redefine humankind's relationship with nature. Excellencies, a renewed commitment to strengthening international cooperation must be based on our joint responsibility to uphold international law. Human rights are universal and apply to all. We reiterate our strong support for the Secretary General's call to action for human rights and advancing human rights across all of the work conducted by the UN. We remain deeply concerned that respect for democracy continues to decrease globally. And Sweden will continue our strong support to democratic institutions and processes and to defenders of democracy. Through Sweden's cross-regional Drive for Democracy initiative, we aim to push back against authoritarianism and promote democracy worldwide. Excellencies, the pandemic has exacerbated critical gaps in equality, particularly gender equality. Women and girls have been disproportionately affected. Sustainable development, peace and security 
are not possible when women and girls are left behind. This is why my government is a feminist government. Sweden will always stand up for sexual and reproductive health and rights. Excellencies, international solidarity is part of the Swedish DNA. We remain firm in our global commitments, including to provide 1% of GNI to overseas development assistance. Free, fair and sustainable trade is key in order to create new jobs and increase prosperity. The World Trade Organization has an essential role in upholding a rules-based international trading system. We must ensure that we have the means to build back better and greener. As chair of the ILO governing body this year, we will promote labor rights. Excellencies, the pandemic has also increased the suffering of the most vulnerable. The number of people in need of humanitarian assistance to survive has reached a new record level. Global hunger, driven by armed conflicts and climate change, is soaring. We urge member states to urgently step up funding to save lives and alleviate suffering. Sweden remains one of the largest humanitarian donors. We need to find new ways to support the Afghan people to sustain the achievements made in the last 20 years. The increasingly acute humanitarian crisis and the protection and promotion of human rights, in particular regarding people belonging to minorities, women and girls, must be addressed. In this, the UN plays a critical role. Sweden's long-standing engagement and our support to the Afghan people remain steadfast. Excellencies, Sweden continues to be a champion for long-term peace building and we are a substantial contributor of personal to UN peace operations. In Yemen, relentless fighting has worsened the humanitarian catastrophe. Sweden remains deeply engaged. We urge the parties to agree on a ceasefire and take part in political talks under UN auspices. The implementation of the Stockholm and Riyadh agreements remains a key step. Sweden is committed to leading international efforts to mobilize additional funding for the world's largest humanitarian operation. In Ethiopia, the Tigray conflict's expansion is causing immense human suffering. We urgently call on all parties to ensure full and sustained humanitarian access, agree to ceasefire and work for a political solution. Excellencies, one year ago, peaceful protests in Belarus were followed by ruthless repression. Sweden and the EU demand respect for human rights. We support the Belarusian people's right to democracy, freedom of expression, and the rule of law. Sweden remains a steadfast supporter of Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence. We continue to unequivocally denounce Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol. This year, Sweden is sharing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Our guiding principle is to return to the basics by defending the European security order based on respect for international law and the UN Charter. Strengthening the OSCE's cooperation with the United Nations is a priority, not least on the ground in conflict situations. Excellencies, the nuclear threat is as present as ever. To reverse this negative trend, we welcome recent steps such as the extension of the New START Treaty and the US and Russian joint statement reaffirming that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. 
The Stockholm Initiative for Nuclear Disarmament aims to ensure that concrete steps towards nuclear disarmament are taken, not least in view of the upcoming review conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Some progress has been made, but much more remains to be done. We call on all states, in particular nuclear weapon states, to do their part. We call on the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to adhere to its international obligations and take steps towards denuclearization. Excellencies, this will be my last address as Prime Minister of Sweden to the General Assembly. As I look back at my seven years in office, I can only conclude that global challenges are becoming ever more pressing. But together, we have also made important progress. Sweden remains an active champion of finding common solutions to the challenges we jointly face. Our roadmap is global implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Gender equality is the unfinished human rights struggle of this century. Gender equality has always been a key priority in decision-making and resource allocation in my government, and I have promoted gender equality globally. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. In 2017, the Swedish parliament adopted the most ambitious climate reform in Sweden's history, aiming at net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2045. Together with India, I'm proud to have launched the Leadership Group for Industry Transition. Inequality has further accelerated. Together with the ILO and the OECD, I launched the Global Deal Partnership for Decent Work and Inclusive Growth in 2016. The objective is to improve the global labor market and enable people to benefit from globalization. In October, I will host the Malmö International Forum on Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism. Remember, react. The rise of racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and antisemitism must be rigorously countered. The forum aims to take concrete steps in the work for Holocaust remembrance and the fight against antisemitism. Excellences, last year's adoption of the UN 75 Declaration, co-facilitated by Sweden and Qatar, was a recommitment to strengthening international cooperation with a modern, innovative, and inclusive United Nations at its core. Together with the Prime Minister of Spain, I have launched a network of leaders to support the Secretary General in taking the common agenda forward. Future generations should be at the center of these efforts. We look forward to contributing to the preparations of a summit of the future in 2023. Sweden joined the United Nations 75 years ago. Rest assured that we will continue working with all of you, all towards a peaceful, green, more equal, and healthier planet. We will remain as committed to international cooperation in the future as we have been over the last 75 years. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank His Excellency Stefan Levine, the Prime Minister of Sweden, for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by Her Excellency Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister, Minister for National Security and the Civil Service, and Minister for Finance, Economic Affairs and Investment of Barbados. May I request protocol to escort Her Excellency.
I have great pleasure in welcoming Her Excellency Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister, Minister for National Security and the Civil Service, and Minister for Finance, Economic Affairs, and Investment of Barbados. And I invite her to address the General Assembly. Madam Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Um, please permit me at the outset to congratulate the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Mina Mohammed, on their reappointment as to the post here, and also to the election of the President for this 76th General Assembly. If I use the speech prepared for me to deliver today, it would be a repetition, a repetition of what you have heard from others and also from me. Equally, how many more times will we then have a situation where we say the same thing over and over and over to come to naught? My friends, we cannot do that anymore. And I ask simply that we recall and three years ago when I made my maiden speech, I indicated from this very podium and told the international community that the world appeared awfully similar to what it looked like 100 years ago. Barbados made that position clear. Regrettably, we have not come to say we told you so but we have come to say that the needle has not moved and that we have not seen sufficient action on behalf of the people of this world. I am not here, therefore, to keep you long today and shall be very, very brief. How many more variants of COVID-19 must arrive? How many more before a worldwide action plan for vaccinations will be implemented? How many more deaths must it take before 1.7 billion excess vaccines in the possession of the advanced countries of the world will be shared with those who have simply no access, no access to vaccines? How much more fake news will we allow to be spread without states defending the public digital space? We've come together with alacrity to defend the right of states to tax across the digital space, but we are not prepared to come together with the same alacrity to defend the rights of our citizens to be duped by fake news in the same digital space. And how many more surges must there be before we ask, when will the world take action? None are safe until all are safe. How many more times will we hear that? And how much more must we do, Madam Vice President, before the global moral strategic leadership that our world needs comes? How much more global temperature rise must there be before we end the burning of fossil fuels? And how much more must sea levels climb in small island developing states before those who profited from the stockpiling of greenhouse gases contribute to the loss and damage that they occasioned, rather than asking us to crowd out the fiscal space that we have for development to cure the damage caused by the greed of others? And how many more hurricanes must destroy, locusts devour, and islands submerge before we recognize that $100 billion in adaptation is simply not even enough. The answer, Madam Vice President, is that we are waiting for urgent, global, moral, strategic leadership. How many more crises must hit before we see an international system 
that stops dividing us and starts to lift us up. How many more times must people come to this podium and speak about the plight of the people of Cuba and Haiti and see very little being done to lift the floor of social development to give those people the right to pursue legitimate ambitions? How many more, how many more crises and natural disasters before we see that all conventions of aid mean that assistance does not reach those who need it most and those who are most vulnerable? And how much wealthier must tech firms get? The top five tech firms have a market capitalization of 9.3 trillion. I didn't say billion, trillion dollars. How much more wealthier must they get before we worry about the fact that so few of us have access to data and knowledge and that our children are being deprived of the tools that they need in order to be able to participate in online education? The answer, Madam Vice President, is that we have the means to give every child on this planet a tablet. And we have the means to give every adult a vaccine. And we have the means to invest in protecting the most vulnerable on our planet from a change in climate. But we choose not to. It is not because we do not have enough. It is because we do not have the will to distribute that which we have. And it is also because, regrettably, the faceless few do not fear the consequences sufficiently. How many more leaders must come to this podium and not be heard before they stop coming? How many times must we address an empty hall of officials in an institution that was intended to be made for leaders to discuss with leaders the advancement necessary to prevent another great war or any of the other great challenges of our humanity? How many more times will we stand idly by and see women of color and men of color and women, period, be attacked at the leadership of international organizations disproportionately? And yes, how many more times must the great needs be met simply by nice words and not have before us the opportunity to see the goodwill that is necessary to prevent nationalism and militarism? The answer, Madam President, is that this age dangerously resembles that of a century ago. A time when we were on the eve of the Great Depression and a time when we fought a similar pandemic and a time when fascism and populism and nationalism led to the decimation of populations through actions that are too horrendous for us to even contemplate. Our world knows not what it is gambling with. And if we don't control this fire, it will burn us all down. As I said two years ago, this is not science fiction. We heard the Secretary General make the same comment on Tuesday morning. This is our reality. It is not science fiction. And if the truth be told, the Secretary General's speech said it all. But who will stand in here and support him to give him the mandate and our institutions, be it the WHO, the IMF, or the World Bank, or the regional development banks, or the development institutions? Who will give them the mandate to go forward if we continue to refuse to summon the political will to confront what we know we must confront. 
I ask us who in here will sign the new charter, a new charter for the 21st century that is appropriate for the, not the next 75 because the world in which we live moves too quickly. But let us try for the next 25 years to meet the needs of a 21st century, not the needs of the middle of the 20th century on the aftermath of a world war that none of us can really relate to today. In the words of Robert Nesta Marley, who will get up and stand up? Who will get up and stand up for the rights of our people? Who will stand up in the name of all those who have died during this awful pandemic? The millions. Who will stand up in the name of all those who have died because of the climate crisis? Or who will stand up for the small island developing states who need 1.5 degrees to survive as we go to COP26? Who, who will stand up? Not with a little token, but with real progress. And who will stand up for all in our countries who remain and suffer the indignity of unemployment and underemployment and whose access to food is now compromised by increased food prices and increased transportation prices and transportation, quite frankly, that is being manipulated. It is not beyond us to solve this problem. If we can find the will to send people to the moon and solve male baldness, as I've said over and over, we can solve simple problems like letting our people eat at affordable prices and making sure that we have the transport. We have been told that democracy is what matters in our country, and democracy is fundamentally an issue of the majority and numbers. But why don't we count who stands up in here? And why don't we take a reckoning for the numbers in here? My friends, it is against that background that I say to you, this is not 1945 with 50 countries. This is 2021 with many countries that did not exist in 1945, who must face their people and answer the needs of their people, who want to know what is the relevance of an international community that only comes and does not listen to each other, that only talks and will not talk with each other. It is against this background that I say that our voices must be heard and our voices must matter. And today, Barbados calls at this dangerous fork in the road that the nation states of this assembly and the people of this world must indicate what direction we want our world to go in and not leave it to the faceless few who have worked so hard to prevent the prosperity from being shared that is sufficient in this world from being shared with all of our people. I ask you today to support us because we will bring a resolution in plenary to endorse the approach of Antonio Guterres as Secretary General. When I met with him two days ago, I told him we share the same philosophy. We want the same destination. The only issue is what road we take and what are the obstacles in that road and what are the potholes we must overcome. My friends, I fear we leave anger in need of another anger. One with real engagement and one to secure real progress. That is what he called for on Tuesday. I regret that the token initiatives will not close the gap. On Monday morning, I said to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom that I was a student in his country, and that as we got off the train, there would be a pre-recorded message each time that simply said, mine the gap. Let us, my friends, not only mine the gap, but determine as a global community of nations that numbers matter and that we have the population and the member states to send the signal of the direction that we want our world to go in at this dangerous moment. 
And let us do so with the calm assurance that those who labor in great causes never ultimately fail, but we must summon the courage to do it. I ask us in the name of our people to find the global moral strategic leadership. Global because our problems are global. Moral because we must do the right thing. And strategic because we cannot solve every problem of the world, but we must solve those within our purview immediately. Thank you. I, on behalf of General Assembly, I wish to thank Her Excellency Mia Amor Motley, the Prime Minister, Minister for National Security and the Civil Service, and Minister for Finance, Economic Affairs, and Investment of Barbados for her statement, and I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh. May I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. It's my distinct honor and privilege now to welcome Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, and I invite her to address the General Assembly, Madam Prime Minister. Mr. President, Assalamu Alaikum. I congratulate you on your election as the President of the 70 sixth session of the United Nations General Assembly. We have confidence in your presidency of hope to steer us through a sustainable recovery that leaves no one behind. I also congratulate Mr. Volkan Boskir, the preceding president, for his leadership in the face of unprecedented challenges during the historic 75th session of the General Assembly. It's my great pride that this is my 17th participation in the UNGA to represent my country, Bangladesh. The 76th UNGA comes at a time when COVID-19 is claiming lives across the globe. Many countries are being affected by recurring waves of new variants. The pandemic has battered the health systems and economies across the world. I pay tribute to all the frontline workers for their dedicated service and sacrifice during the crisis. Against the grim reality of COVID-19, the theme of this session centering around hope is very timely. As an avowed supporter of multilateralism, and the UN system, Bangladesh wishes to see this organization as a source of hope and aspiration during this critical time. We must set aside our differences and rise as one, harnessing our collective strength to build back a better world for all. Mr. President, this is a very special year for us. This year, we are celebrating the golden jubilee of our independence. This celebration coincides with Mujib year, the birth centenary of the father of the nation, Bongo Bundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I pay my profound respect and homage to the father of our nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, whose selfless, lifelong struggle and visionary leadership brought us our long-cherished independence. I also pay my deepest tribute to the valiant freedom fighters 
for their courage and sacrifices to free our motherland. Our father of the nation was a strong advocate of multilateralism and called our United Nations as a center of people's future hopes and aspirations. On the first day of our journey in the United Nations, he had said, and I quote from his maiden speech to the UNGA on 25th September 1974, Our goal is self-reliance. Our chosen path is the united and collective efforts of our people. International cooperation and the sharing of resources and technology could no doubt make our task less onerous and reduce the cost in human suffering. He called for a building a world free of economic inequalities, social injustice, aggression and threats of nuclear war. These are relevant as relevant today as they were 47 years ago. As such, we continue to lend our voice and leadership to all those issues that aim at building an inclusive and equal society. Our calls for fixing equality, our firm position against any form of injustice as against the Palestinian people, resolution of Rohingya crisis and promoting climate justice are a few examples of our global commitment. We have been working hard to fulfill the unfinished dream of our father of the nation. We are now among the five fastest growing economies of the world, ranking 41st in terms of GDP. Over the past decade, we have reduced the poverty rate from 31.5% to 20.5%. Our per capita income jumped to more than threefold in just one decade to 2,227 US dollars. Our foreign currency reserve has reached all time high to 48 billion US dollars. Bangladesh has made impressive progress in socioeconomic sphere and women empowerment during last decade. The infant mortality rate has been reduced to 23.67 per 1,000. Maternity mortality rate to 173 per 100,000 life per. The average longevity of people rose to 73 years. According to World Economic Forum, in political empowerment of women, Bangladesh is ranked seventh ahead of its regional neighbors since 2014. Our Digital Bangladesh initiative has stimulated transformative impacts on socioeconomic development, education, disaster risk reduction, women empowerment, and so on. Our social safety net programs have also made significant expansion. As for SDC, SDG index score, the Sustainable Development Report 2021 identified Bangladesh as having progressed the most since 2015. Such progress was due to heavy investment in women's advancement and empowerment, which contributed to our transformative development. We have achieved the milestone of LDC graduation this year. Our vision is to transform Bangladesh into a knowledge-based society, developed country by 2041 and a prosperous and resilient Delta by 2100. Mr. President, the COVID-19's impact on Bangladesh has been much less than fair. It is mainly because of, because of our healthcare system that has been strengthened from the grassroots level. 
Besides, we adopted a timely, multi-pronged, multi-stakeholder approach to tackle its challenges. From very beginning, we took some firm decisions to balance between life and livelihood. They included 28 stimulus packages to the tune of 14.6 billion US dollars or 4.45 44% of our GDP to keep our economy afloat. We have allocated 1.61 billion US dollars for vaccines in the current budget cycle. Notably, we, give, we gave serious attention to the most vulnerable sections of our society, like the ultra poor, disabled, elders, returning migrants, and vulnerable women. At the outbreak of the pandemic last year, we immediately distributed cash and other kinds of assistance to nearly 40 million people. Our well-timed intervention and our people's resilience helped us achieve over 5% economic growth in 2020. Mr. President, humanity since time immemorial has faced the onslaughts of nature and pestilence as well as man-made conflicts and disasters. Yet humanity has survived these monumental challenges with hope in their hearts and belief in themselves. This pandemic is another such crisis from which many inspiring stories of human survival and magnanimity have been born. Sadly though, this malaise seems likely to be here for a while. And therefore, as we have in the past, must come forth with fresh, inclusive, and global ideas to fight this common enemy. Let me highlight a few specific issues in this regard. First, for a COVID-free world, we must ensure universal and affordable access to vaccines for people across the world. In the last UNGA, I urged this August Assembly to treat COVID-19 vaccines as a global public good. This was echoed by many other leaders. Yet, these calls remain largely unheeded. Instead, we have seen growing vaccine divides between the rich and the poor nations. According to World Bank, 84% of vaccine doses have so far gone to people in high and upper middle income countries, while the low income countries received less than 1%. This vaccine inequality must be addressed urgently. We cannot chart out a sustainable recovery and be safe by leaving millions behind. Therefore, I reiterate my call to ensure equitable and affordable access to vaccine for all. Immediate transfer of vaccine technologies could be a means to ensure vaccine equity. Bangladesh is ready to produce vaccines in mass scale if technical know-how is shared with us and patent is waiver is granted. Second, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted the climate vulnerable countries.
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 1 report provided a grim scenario of our planet. Unless there are immediate measures, the devastating impacts of climate change will be irreversible. No country, rich or poor, is immune of the destructive effects. We therefore call upon the rich and industrialized countries to cut emissions, compensate for the loss and damage, and ensure adequate financing and technology transfer for adaptation and resilience building. As the chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum and the Vulnerable 20 Group of Ministers of Finance, we have launched the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan Decade 2030, outlining a transformative agenda for, from climate vulnerability to climate prosperity. The upcoming COP26 summit in Glasgow provide us with a good opportunity to rally support for such new and inclusive ideas. Let us not miss out on this opportunity. Third, the pandemic has severely disrupted our education system. According to UNICEF, close to half of the world's students were affected by partial or full school closures. Millions of students in low-income countries did not have the resources and technologies to join remote learning facilities jeopardizing decades of gain in enrollment, literacy rate, etc. We need a global plan to prioritize education recovery by investing in digital tools and services, access to internet, and capacity building of teachers. We also call the UN system to rally partnership and resources to make that happen. Fourth, despite the unprecedented challenges by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are on the track to graduate from the LDC category. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, has put at risk the graduation prospect and aspiration of many countries. To motivate and incentivize sustainable graduation, we look forward to receiving more support from our development partners for an incentive-based graduation structure. As one of the co-chairs of the preparatory committee of the LDC-5 conference, we expect concrete outcome of Doha conference enabling more countries to sustainably graduate out of the LDC category. Fifth, Migrants have been the frontline contributors during the pandemic as essential workers in the health and other emergency services. Yet, many of them have been particularly hard hit due to loss of jobs, salary cuts, lack of access to health and other social services, and forcible return. We urge the migrant receiving countries to treat them fairly and protect their job, health, and well-being during this trying time. Six. The Rohingya crisis is in its fifth year now. Yet not a single forcibly displaced Myanmar national 
could be repatriated to Myanmar. Despite the uncertainty created by the recent political developments in Myanmar, we expect enhanced focus and active support of the international community to find a durable solution to this crisis. Myanmar must create the conditions conducive for their return. We are ready to work with the international community on this compelling priority. On our part, to ensure their temporary stay in Bangladesh, we have relocated some of the forcibly displaced Myanmar national Rohingyas to Bhashanchor. We have also included all eligible from them in the national vaccination drive to curb the spread of COVID in the camps. I would like to reiterate that the crisis was created in Myanmar and its solution lies in Myanmar. International community must constructively work constructively for a permanent solution of the crisis through safe, sustainable and dignified return of the Rohingyas to their home in the Rakhine state. For that, the international community needs to support all the efforts. While we expect the ASEAN leadership to step up their ongoing efforts, the international community needs to support all the accountability process. Mr. President, we envision a peaceful, stable and prosperous South Asia. We firmly believe that it is upon the people of Afghanistan to rebuild their country and decide the course of the future themselves. Bangladesh stands ready to continue to work with the people of Afghanistan and the international community for its socio-economic development. Peace remains a preeminent focus of our foreign policy. As a proponent of the flagship resolution on culture of peace, we remain deeply committed to creating a peaceful society. The menace of terrorism and violent extremism are jeopardizing peace and security in many parts of the world. Therefore, we maintain a zero tolerance policy towards these menaces. Today, we take pride as the leading peacekeeping nation and for our contribution to global peace. Despite unprecedented challenges of the pandemic, our peacekeepers are serving in some of the most difficult circumstances across the globe with utmost dedication and professionalism. The international community must do everything possible to ensure their safety and security. As per our constitutional obligation, we have always been a steadfast supporter of complete disarmament. We firmly believe that the ultimate guarantee of international peace and security lies in the total elimination of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. It was from that conviction we ratified the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, which entered into force earlier this year. Mr. President, the COVID-19 has brought to the fore the inadequacy of the global response to tackle emergencies. It has also put a spotlight on the critical need for global solidarity and collaboration to effective COVID-19 response. We must demonstrate our ability to work and act together on global common issues and create space for new partnerships and solutions, and that must start right here at the UN. 
with the member states across regions rising above narrow political interest. Only then can we pursue any meaningful collaboration towards a resilient and inclusive recovery. At this critical juncture, the United Nations stands as our best hope. Let us join our hands together to keep that hope alive. Before I conclude, I wish to humbly remind this revered body established to ensure peace and justice around the world that I am still seeking justice for the brutal massacre of my family that took place 46 years ago. It was early in the morning of August 15, 1975. A band of renegade killers ruthlessly assassinated my father, the father of the nation and the then president of Bangladesh, Bangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. My loving mother, Sheikh Fazilotin Nisa Mujib, my three brothers, freedom fighter Captain Sheikh Kamal, freedom fighter Lieutenant Sheikh Jamal, 10 years old Sheikh Russell, and my paternal uncle, freedom fighter Sheikh Abu Nasir. Eighteen of my close family members were brutally murdered. My younger sister Sheikh Rehana and I survived the carnage as we were abroad at that time. For six years we were on exile, suffering from the agony of losing near and dear ones. Nevertheless, my struggle continued and upon returning to Bangladesh, I have devoted my life to fulfilling the dream of my father, father of the nation, Bangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, for a happy and prosperous golden Bengal. I have faced death threats multiple times. I have been imprisoned multiple times but I never stopped. My only target is to fulfill the dream of my father to establish a golden Bengal. I shall continue to do so as long as I live, inshallah. Inshallah, the people of Bangladesh will have a prosperous life. Thank you all once again. Khoda Hafiz, Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundhu. May Bangladesh live forever. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh for her statement, and I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Mark Rutter, Prime Minister and Minister for General Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and may I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure and honor in welcoming His Excellency Mark Rutter, Prime Minister and Minister for General Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and I invite him to address the General Assembly now. Mr. Prime Minister. Madam President, 
Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. This spring, after a year in the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic, we looked forward to the summer. We are full of hope and anticipation. Despite our concern for our loved ones and our economies, there was light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to the scientific community, which developed vaccines in record time, offering a way out of the crisis. Defeating the virus seemed like only a matter of time. The summer of 2021 will be the summer of freedom regained. But in fact, it became a summer of worry. It's true that in the most affluent parts of the world, vaccination campaigns are well underway. And globally, vaccination coverage is growing by the day. But it is not growing fast enough, and it's not growing everywhere. Not by any means. What's more, the virus hit back, and the Delta variant took hold. The pandemic itself is far from over, let alone the long-term consequences of the crisis. And there were other major concerns too. Different parts of the world were battered by extreme weather and devastating natural disasters. From heavy flooding in Africa, China and Western Europe to forest fires in North America and the Mediterranean and hurricanes in the Caribbean. Using hard science and clear statistics, the IPCC's climate change report confirmed what we could see with our own eyes. Climate change is happening now. It's impacting us all and it's hitting us hard. On top of all that, this summer a tragedy unfolded in Afghanistan. None of us will forget the heartbreaking images of the violence, the people trying to flee, the desperation and the humanitarian need. Right now, it's hard to predict the consequences of these recent developments. But I'm sure that, like me, you felt powerless and despondent. There was a sense of fighting a losing battle, a feeling that the negative forces are winning over the positive, a fear that our efforts are futile. I understand those feelings, but at the same time, I want to appeal to everyone here, let us not give in to cynicism and fatalism. That is my message today, especially today, and especially here. This place, UN headquarters, this beacon of international cooperation, has proved in the past that we can find solutions together, even if our problems seem too big and too complex. You only have to think back to the start of the UN over 75 years ago, when much of the world lay in ruins. At the very point when the world faced an impossible task, countries united and got to work. And although these starting points are very different, we need the same approach now. As Secretary General Guterres wrote in the latest report on our common agenda, in our biggest shared test since the Second World War, humanity faces a stark and urgent choice, a breakdown or a breakthrough. The choice is ours to make, but we will not have this chance again. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us to make the right choices. I see it as our solemn duty to bring about that breakthrough, to work together on solutions to the major problems of our time, together with people from all walks of life, together with NGOs and businesses, for today's generations and for generations to come. 
Today, I'd like to focus on three critical developments, three crises, in fact, which have dominated our attention this summer. First, the fight against the coronavirus and the road to post-pandemic recovery. Second, the disruptive impact of the climate crisis and what we need to do in response. And third, the situation in Afghanistan. Let me start with the most acute challenge we face, finding a way out of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to realize how dependent we are on each other, because the reality is that no one is safe until everyone is safe. COVID-19 will remain a threat for as long as a large part of the world is not fully vaccinated. So global solidarity is not simply the right thing to do, it's the only thing we can do to end the pandemic. To that end, we need to put all our effort into stepping up vaccine production and sharing the available doses fairly. So we can vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. The King of the Netherlands is fully committed to that goal. We have contributed 172 million euros to the WHO's ACT Accelerator, for example. And for every vaccine dose we administer in the Netherlands, we aim to give one away. By the end of the year, we hope to have donated over 20 million vaccines to countries in need via the COVAX program. Alongside the public health crisis, COVID-19 also led to a shadow pandemic. Staying at home under the lockdowns proved especially dangerous for women as domestic violence increased dramatically. And more broadly, the most vulnerable sections of society are the ones who have been hit the hardest by the crisis. The impact on young people, women and girls, has been enormous. Young people couldn't attend school and faced other obstacles to their development. Many women lost their jobs in global supply chains, like the clothing industry. What's more, some governments have used anti-COVID measures as a pretext to restrict fundamental human rights such as freedom of expression. Many human rights defenders and civil society organizations have suffered as a result. Given all this, it's essential that we work to achieve a socio-economic recovery that benefits everyone, and that we get back on course to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, together with the Paris Goals, the SDGs are our guide towards a sustainable recovery in an uncertain world. To support that objective, the King of the Netherlands has become the second largest donor, after Norway, to the UN COVID-19 Response and Recovery Trust Fund to bolster countries' socio-economic resilience. And we are supporting valuable initiatives, like the Global Financing Facility, which aims to lessen the impact of the pandemic on sexual and reproductive health and rights. In short, the breakthrough we need requires a two-track approach. One, getting the virus under control around the world, and two, working towards an economic recovery that benefits everyone and is green and sustainable. And that brings me to my second point, the disruptive impact of climate change. This is no longer a theoretical doomsday scenario. For many, it's now a stark reality. We felt it this summer. Every part of the world experienced extreme weather and devastating natural disasters that are clearly the result of climate change caused by humans. The King of the Netherlands wasn't spared either. The six low-lying islands of the Caribbean part of the kingdom live with the constant threat of sea level rise, drought and tropical hurricanes like much of the global south. In Europe, the Netherlands and its neighbors were hit by extreme rainfall this summer. 
tranquil rivers transformed into raging torrents that destroyed everything in their path. Elsewhere in the world, extreme temperatures had devastating impacts, including severe forest fires that forced many people to flee their homes. Clearly, we need to collectively embrace climate action. And we need to do it fast. So it's more vital than ever that the COP26 summit in November succeeds. Together, we must find a way to reduce harmful emissions to net zero by 2050. And we must keep the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees within reach. We can't allow political tensions between countries to get in the way of achieving those goals. We can't settle our future generations with the problem. And limiting emissions is not the only challenge. Climate adaptation is at least as important because the impact of climate change is already a threat, one we have to arm ourselves against now. For the King of the Netherlands, this is not new. For centuries, we have been battling the elements, from North Sea floods to Caribbean storms. Climate adaptation is in our DNA. That's why we hosted the online Climate Adaptation Summit at the start of this year. An event which saw the launch of the Adaptation Action Agenda, which aims to turn words into deeds. The King of the Netherlands understands that we not only need to get our own house in order, but we also help, have to help others do the same. So we are providing expertise and financial support to protect vulnerable areas against the elements. We are increasing our public climate finance and supporting Secretary General Guterres' call to spend at least half of it on adaptation. In fact, in recent years, the Kingdom of the Netherlands has spent almost 70% of its public climate finance on adaptation. Of course, it's not a matter of either or. We need to step up our efforts on both adaptation and mitigation and help each other to do so. We are all facing the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. That means developed countries have a responsibility to help developing countries take the necessary measures. Only together can we turn things around. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, this summer we saw a tragedy unfold in Afghanistan. The situation is desperate. We cannot abandon the millions of Afghans who need urgent humanitarian aid and whose rights are being trampled, especially the rights of women, girls and minorities. Various UN organizations are doing all they can to provide that aid. The people of the UN are our eyes and ears on the ground. And even more important, they are the helping hands reaching out to those who need aid and protecting the weakest in society. We must support and facilitate that good work. To that end, at the donor conference on the 13th of September, the Netherlands pledged an extra 13.5 million euros for the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund and the Regional Refugee Preparedness and Response Plan. The people of the world and the Afghan people in particular are counting on the UN. Over the past 20 years, the international community, including my country, has worked very hard in Afghanistan. Many countries, together with the UN and the Afghan people, have tried to ensure a better future for all Afghans. One where everyone has opportunities, regardless of their gender, ethnicity or beliefs. And it's important to note that we have definitely taken steps in the right direction. The Netherlands would like to express our thanks and appreciation to all the military personnel, 
diplomats and aid workers and of course the many brave and driven Afghans themselves who made that possible. And we will never forget the many people, including 25 Dutch military personnel, who paid the ultimate price. Thanks to their courage and commitment, a generation has grown up in Afghanistan with better opportunities. Child mortality fell by 16 percent. More girls and women were able to get an education. And life expectancy rose by 16 years. These are figures that matter. But the harsh reality is that we have to pause those efforts now. The question is whether all the hard work of the past 20 years will be undone by recent developments. It's too soon to tell. There are still many possible outcomes for Afghanistan. But we must be mindful of the Taliban's track record. Whatever happens, we will continue working to push developments in Afghanistan in the right direction, however difficult that may seem right now. Because ultimately, we have to keep defending the international legal order and universal human rights in Afghanistan and around the world. For the Kingdom of the Netherlands, this is especially true in the context of the downing of flight MH17. Together with the other countries of the joint investigation team, we are still doing all we can to ensure that justice is done. At the moment, family members of the victims are getting the opportunity to share their stories in court. And the emotional impact of that is enormous. One of them said, we will never be able to come to terms with our loss as long as those responsible refuse to accept responsibility. So once again, I call on all countries to cooperate fully with the investigation in line with Security Council Resolution 2166 so that justice is served and responsibility accepted. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in recent months we have been confronted with our own vulnerability and that of the world around us. I began my remarks by urging you not to give in to cynicism and fatalism. Because as the philosopher Karl Popper once wrote, we are all responsible for what the future holds in store. Thus it is our duty not to prophesy evil, but rather to fight for a better world. Please be assured that the country of the King of the Netherlands will continue working with full conviction to that end together with you. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister for General Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Kiriakos Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Kiriakos Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, uh, heads of state and government, 
Excellencies, Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, for nearly two years, the world has been grappling with one of the greatest challenges we have faced in modern times. The impact of COVID-19 is an ever-present reminder of the realities we continue to face in the battle against this pandemic. But as we gather here this week, I believe that in spite of the pain and the disruption brought about by this horrible disease, there are real reasons to be optimistic. And if these events have taught us anything, then it is this, that hope is born out of cooperation. For the first time, for the first time in human history, our planet joined hands and delivered a collective scientific miracle. The discovery, development, and production of not just one, but several safe and effective vaccines in an amazingly short period of time. What in the past took us decades was now achieved in months. And Europe led the way on numerous fronts. We led the way on vaccine procurement. Vaccines were purchased by the European Union and distributed to all member states based on their population, regardless of size, regardless of economic might. It was a true act of solidarity. Europe led the way on vaccine donations to countries outside the European Union. In my country, Greece's case, 1.5 million doses so far, with 4 million more to come, to countries ranging from Iraq to Rwanda and from Libya to Jordan. We have also committed 510,000 doses through the COVAX facility. We agreed as Europeans last July on an unprecedented EU-wide fiscal stimulus package, next generation EU, that is now driving a sustained economic recovery across the continent. And we agreed on the development of the EU Digital Certificate, an innovative concept that Greece was first to propose, the implementation of which has been absolutely central to the restoration of our freedoms, the support of our tourism industry, but also the rejuvenation of our economies. And as we stand here today, less than six weeks from COP26 conference in Glasgow, we continue to talk about the other great issue of our time, climate, with a renewed sense of urgency. The question is whether we're capable of aligning our flowery rhetoric with the necessary action to avert a catastrophe of unimaginable consequences. Let me be clear. This is no longer about climate change. This is about addressing an acute climate crisis. Our collective response to COVID crossed borders and proved that when the world needed to stand up and stand together, it could truly confront global issues. Our collective response to the climate crisis must do exactly the same. Ladies and gentlemen, scientists tell us that the Mediterranean ecosystem, which is home to some of the world's most ancient civilizations, is particularly susceptible to the consequences of rising temperatures. And of course, my country, Greece, is not immune. This summer, we paid a very heavy price as unprecedented megafires ravaged my country. And yet, help to fight the fires came from across Europe and beyond. And I am deeply, deeply grateful to the 23 countries that send us support to help us tame a natural phenomenon of ferocious intensity. I am very pleased that uh, last Friday, alongside Greece, 
the leaders of eight other Mediterranean countries made the climate crisis the focal point of the eighth annual EU Met Summit in Athens. The Athens Declaration, adopted by Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Croatia, Cyprus, Malta, Slovenia, and Greece, focuses on key areas of the climate crisis, areas which are of particular relevance to the Mediterranean, including biodiversity, forest management, the marine environment, and civil protection, prevention, and preparedness. My country's commitment to addressing the climate crisis is unwavering, and it transcends all aspects of public policy. Two years ago, before COVID struck, I announced from this very podium that Greece would shut down all its lignite, that is, brown coal-fired electricity production plants by 2028. Now we're working to bring this date even sooner, possibly to 2025. We are investing 24 million of European and national funds to support the green transition. We're addressing the issue of plastics pollution on land and at sea. We intend to effectively protect our marine environment by designating 10%, 10% of our seas as no-catch zones by 2030. We're also implementing ambitious plans in partnership with the private sector to accelerate the use of green energy in our most sensitive ecosystems. For example, on the island of Astipalia in the Dodecanese, we have begun a long-term project alongside Volkswagen to develop Europe's first fully green island. And Greece is leading a global initiative that aims to accelerate action to protect cultural and natural heritage from the impacts of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to the escalating complexity of international relations and our continued efforts to consolidate regional peace and security. Since our last meeting, the United Nations General Assembly, the Eastern Mediterranean has unfortunately seen more days of instability than calmness. While it is true that there are diverging views between Greece and our near neighbor Turkey, Greece has always been committed to the rules and principles of international law and remains a strong advocate that all disputes need to be settled peacefully, always in accordance with the UN Charter. And let me point out that it is the UN Charter which bans the use or threat of force. However, since 1995, Greece has been facing a formal, regularly renewed, and clearly illegal and unacceptable threat of the use of force by Turkey, what is known as the casus belli. Furthermore, given that Greece is a maritime country made up of many thousands of islands and a coastline that stretches for more than 14,000 kilometers, the longest in the Mediterranean, and of course, as a global maritime power, we are fully committed to the law of the sea as reflected in the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. We have recently signed, after many years of difficult negotiations, delimitation agreements on our maritime zones with Italy and Egypt. And we have agreed with Albania to refer delimitation to the International Court of Justice. This, I believe, is the best proof that disputes regarding maritime delimitations, no matter, no matter how complex, no matter how long-standing, can be resolved, provided we agree on a common rule book. And the only rule book available is that of international law of the seas. And it is that mindset that defines our approach to Turkey. 
We have always, always supported the need for open channels of communication and cooperation between our two neighboring countries. What happened last year when Ankara raised tensions unnecessarily and without provocation, threatening confrontation between two NATO allies must not be repeated. And Turkey should understand that its aggressive attitude in this respect undermines prospects for a mutually beneficial relationship and jeopardizes regional security and stability. More than this, it makes Turkey's relationship with Europe that much more complicated. Let me be absolutely clear. We will continue to protect our sovereignty and our sovereign rights across our territory, on land, at sea, and in our airspace. At the same time, I will spare no effort to continue reaching out to Turkey to explore avenues of cooperation. I have a vision for the Eastern Mediterranean. Instead of fighting last century's battles over hydrocarbons, a fading commodity, we can, we have to join forces and cooperate against new common enemies. The climate crisis, which affects both our countries equally, but also the threat of illegal migration, where Turkey has an important role to play in cooperation with us to eradicate the networks of illegal smugglers that prey on the desperation of vulnerable people. There is much our two countries can do together. We are bound by history and geography to coexist, and it is in our common interest to do so peacefully and prosperously. Ladies and gentlemen, where I'm less optimistic is on the issue of Cyprus. And it is indeed regrettable that Turkey continues to ignore a series of UN resolutions, amongst them Resolution 541 and Resolution 550, and insists on the militarization of the island. It continues its illegal violation of Cyprus's maritime zones and airspace and violates UN resolutions on the fenced area of Arosha. Greece remains fully committed to supporting the efforts led by the UN Secretary General for the resumption as soon as possible of result-oriented negotiations for a viable solution of the Cyprus issue. And that solution can only be found on the basis of the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council which call for a mutually acceptable settlement of a bizonal, bicommunal federation with political equality, a single sovereignty, a single international personality, and a single citizenship. Any talk, any talk regarding a two-state solution is simply unacceptable. In our immediate neighborhood, Libya continues to suffer from the devastating effects of a decade-long civil war. Libyan people deserve a peaceful future, where their destiny is in their own hands, free from the presence of foreign troops, mercenaries, and foreign fighters. Libyans want the right to freely elect their own government without foreign intervention. We stand by them, and we support their demand for the withdrawal of all foreign forces and for the holding of free elections on December 24, 2021. We appreciate the work done by the United Nations and its special envoy, Jan Kubis. I also want to briefly address the issue of the Western Balkans. Greece has always been an active supporter of greater European integration as a vehicle for a more prosperous, stable, and democratic future for the region. Ever since the adoption of the Thessaloniki Agenda in 2003, that U European perspective has been the driving force for reform, democratization, and change. But let's be honest, there has also been fatigue and disappointment. 
18 years is a long time. In a matter of days, the EU Western Balkan Summit will take place in Slovenia. And let us not miss the opportunity to use this summit to take a bold step forward. It is time for the European Union to deliver. Ladies and gentlemen, Greece believes in a multilateral approach to our complex, complex global challenges of today. But I'm also a firm believer in the absolute necessity of Europe's strategic autonomy. Recent events have clearly demonstrated that we must be both willing and able to do more as Europeans on our own. And this should not come at the expense of our transatlantic bonds. If anything, a European Defence Union will strengthen NATO. It will oblige European countries to address issues of interoperability and meagre defence budgets. It will accelerate our cooperation on cyber and space. If Europe is to be not just an economic, but a geopolitical powerhouse, it is time for this debate to start in earnest. And those countries most eager to proceed can do so at a faster pace. Our strategic interests in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Middle East, in the Sahel, force us to address this challenge with a renewed sense of urgency. Because there will be missions where NATO or the UN will not be present, but where the EU should be. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying this. Earlier this year, on March 25th, Greece celebrated the 200th anniversary from the beginning of our War of Independence. Our ancestors fought for freedom, dignity, and respect for the rule of law. And they prevailed against all odds because they were doing the right thing for themselves and their children. The challenges we're facing are no less formidable. 6,000 years of civilization and the futures of every generation to come rest on our shoulders. And armed with the power of reason and science and a determination to rise to the occasion, I'm convinced we will also do the right thing for ourselves, our children, and the future of this fragile but beautiful blue planet humanity calls home. Thank you very much for listening. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. We have heard the last speaker in the general debate for this meeting. The, the 13th plenary meeting to continue with the general debate will be held immediately following the adjournment of this meeting. The meeting is adjourned. <coughs> The 13th plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. I would like to remind members of the following mitigation measures that are in place for this meeting. All delegates are required to wear a face covering at all times whilst in public spaces and in the General Assembly Hall, except when directly addressing the meeting and the size of a delegation should not exceed four delegates in the General Assembly Hall. We shall now continue the general debate. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Japan to introduce an address by the head of government. Well, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Suga Yoshihide, Prime Minister of Japan.
議長。Let me start by expressing my deepest sympathies to those who have passed away due to COVID-19. I would also like to convey my deepest respect for healthcare workers and all who are at the forefront of the fight against the pandemic. The Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games were held with the aim of building a peaceful and better world through sport under the Olympic Truce Resolution. Adopted in this very venue of the General Assembly, while there were various views about holding the games this summer, we, as the host country of the games, fulfilled our responsibilities and achieved what we set out to do. Many people were deeply moved by the outstanding performances of the athletes, which gave hopes and dreams to everyone across the globe. The games also demonstrated the barrier-free mindset to the world, with aspirations for an inclusive society, where all people, with or without disabilities, support each other to live in harmony. Above all, while humanity has been faced with immeasurable hardships, the Tokyo 2020 Games proved to be a symbol of global unity among people around the world. I would like to commend all the athletes who inspired us with their performances, and express my gratitude to all who made this event possible. Mr. President, many challenges confronting us, such as climate change, economic recovery, and competition with authoritarianism, require our collective efforts. In particular, COVID-19 has inflicted unprecedented health crises. Causing profound changes to people's lives and global systems, we now face questions on how to overcome these crises and build a better future. Today, I would like to share with you Japan's vision of how to address these urgent challenges, which could shape the course of the world. Mr. President. Let me first talk about how we will overcome this pandemic. Save as many lives as possible and leave no one's health behind. This has been the conviction that Japan, as a country upholding human security and universal health coverage, and I myself, have adhered to throughout this battle against the pandemic. Japan is determined to lead the global efforts to this end. It is particularly important to ensure equitable access to vaccines in every corner of the world, which is the decisive factor in the fight against the pandemic. We must create an environment where all countries and regions can secure vaccines equitably, with no political or economic conditions. With this in mind. I co-hosted the Covax AMC Summit together with Gavi in June this year. We were able to secure funds, including one billion U.S. dollars from Japan, that go well beyond the funding target of securing 1.8 billion vaccine doses for 30 percent of the population of developing economies. Additionally, Japan has provided countries and regions. With approximately 23 million doses of vaccines manufactured in Japan through the Covax facility and other initiatives so far, today I am pleased to announce that, with additional contributions, Japan will provide up to 60 million vaccine doses in total. At the same time, we will steadily implement Japan's last one-mile support program. To ensure the delivery of vaccines to vaccination centers in each country and region, through these initiatives, Japan has provided assistance of the order of 3.9 billion U.S. dollars worldwide, and will continue to make the utmost effort in overcoming COVID-19. Mr. President. I would like to share with you four points that Japan considers particularly important in guiding our world towards a better future. 
First, we need to build resilient global health systems. We must learn from this pandemic and prepare ourselves for the future. Our experiences this time have taught us that there should be no geographical vacuum in addressing global health issues, and it is important that relevant information and knowledge on all countries and regions is shared promptly and extensively in a free and transparent manner. From this perspective, Japan attaches importance to the role of WHO and will continue actively contributing to discussions on its review and reform. The pandemic has also led to renewed recognition of the importance of universal health coverage. In order to ensure equitable access to health care services and protection for socially vulnerable people, Japan intends to formulate its global health strategy, thereby contributing to building a new architecture for global health security in collaboration with the international community. I should also speak to the discussions in the United Nations on human security of the new generation, which I proposed at this very venue last year. Japan will render its full support to these discussions with high expectations that they will provide valuable guidance for the future. Not only in global health, but in addressing various challenges across the world. To build more resilient global health systems based on the principles of human security, it is necessary to tackle not only infectious diseases, but a broad range of relevant areas such as nutrition, water and sanitation. Japan will host the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit 2021 in December this year to improve nutrition for people around the world. Second, we need to create a green and sustainable society. Climate change is an imminent challenge that calls for the collective efforts of humanity as a whole to resolve. At the same time, addressing climate change will be the driving force of dynamic growth and a necessity for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Japan aims to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 46% in fiscal year 2030 from its fiscal year 2013 levels setting an ambitious target which is aligned with the long-term goal of achieving net zero by 2050. Furthermore, Japan will continue strenuous efforts in its challenge to meet the lofty goal of cutting its emission by 50%. I would like to encourage other countries, including major emitters, to make further efforts as well. In achieving global decarbonization, any developing country which genuinely needs assistance should not be left behind. Japan will provide climate finance, both public and private, to developing countries including small island states, totaling approximately 60 billion US dollars over the next five years, from 2021 to 2025. With these efforts, Japan is resolved to take the lead in achieving global decarbonization and creating a green and sustainable society. Third, I would like to emphasize the importance of a free and open international order based on the rule of law. We must uphold universal values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law that our predecessors have established to maintain peace and prosperity in each region and in the world. I am convinced that the foundation of this undertaking is not force, but a free and open international order. Our vision for achieving this task is the free and open Indo-Pacific Japan will closely collaborate with like-minded countries and regions and work strategically to fulfill this vision. 
At the same time, Japan continues to play a leading role in the establishment of a free and fair economic order. In the area of digital technology, Japan will exercise its leadership in making rules to advance the data free flow with trust. In order to counter protectionism and inward looking tendencies, as we maximize the use of the potential of digital space, new technologies must not be used to undermine our universal values. Japan will contribute constructively to the discussions at the UN and other multilateral forums, and also provide capacity building support to ASEAN and other countries in order to work towards the realization of a free, Fair and secure cyberspace. Moreover, infrastructure building and development finance under appropriate rules are also essential to build back better and achieve growth. Japan will further promote and implement its quality infrastructure investment program and take the lead in establishing an environment. Where all countries abide by the international rules on development finance with transparency and fairness. Fourth, we must realize a more peaceful and secure international community. Japan is determined to play a proactive role in the maintenance of international peace and security and in establishing a rules based international order. With the support from member states at the election of non permanent members of the Security Council in 2022. Japan will also remain committed to peace building. At the same time, Japan calls for the launch of concrete negotiations for the reform of the Security Council in order to make it a more effective body that reflects the realities of the 21st century. To realize a more peaceful and secure world, it is crucial for all countries to make sincere efforts in a transparent manner in international arrangements on arms control and disarmament. As the only country that has experienced the devastation of atomic bombings, Japan will endeavor to bridge the gaps among countries with different positions. And contribute to international efforts towards the realization of a world free from nuclear weapons. Regarding the Treaty on the Non Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, we aim to achieve a meaningful outcome at the review conference to be held next year. We will also continue to work on the control and disarmament of conventional weapons, or disarmament that saves lives. Japan also continues to actively engage in promoting the peace and stability of the Indo Pacific region. We must prevent Afghanistan, which is still under a tense situation, from becoming a safe haven for terrorists once again. It is imperative to ensure that humanitarian aid organizations can safely deliver assistance. And that human rights, especially those of women, are protected. We will carefully monitor the actions, not words, of the Taliban to see whether or not they will honor the commitments they have publicly announced. We will also work closely with relevant countries and organizations to that end. The recent launch of ballistic missiles by North Korea. Is a clear violation of Security Council resolutions. And we condemn this action. The recent nuclear and missile activities by North Korea pose a threat to the peace and security of Japan, the region, and the international community. I strongly hope that North Korea will engage in diplomatic efforts. And the dialogues between the United States and North Korea on denuclearization will progress. The issue of abductions by North Korea is a matter of serious concern for the international community. 
and also a top priority for Japan. As the families of the victims continue to age, there is no time to lose before we resolve the abductions issue. Japan will continue to seek to normalize its relationship with North Korea. In accordance with the Japan DPRK Pyongyang Declaration, through comprehensively resolving the outstanding issues of concern, such as the abductions, nuclear and missile issues, as well as settling the unfortunate past. Establishing a constructive relationship between Japan and North Korea will not only serve the interests of both sides, but also contribute to regional peace and stability. Turning to Myanmar, Japan spares no efforts in supporting the will of the people of Myanmar to achieve democratization and the protection of human rights. We strongly support ASEAN's initiatives towards a breakthrough in the current situation and will work closely with the international community. Today, I discussed how to overcome the pandemic and the role Japan will play in realizing a better world. What I have consistently emphasized across these points are international collaboration and multilateralism. Mr. President, 10 years ago, Japan suffered an unprecedented scale of devastation due to the Great East Japan earthquake. The international community kindly extended countless assistance to Japan, which allowed our country to take steps towards recovery. These experiences remind us of the importance of international collaboration. Japan continues to further promote multilateralism so that we can resolve the challenges facing the world and advance our common agenda as upheld by the UN. In this regard, we attach importance to dialogues with partners in various regions. In July, we hosted the Pacific Islands Leaders Meeting. And next year, we aim to elevate the cooperative relationship between Japan and Africa to new heights at TICAD 8, which will be held in Tunisia. Japan will also host the 6th World Assembly for Women next year to realize gender equality and promote the empowerment of women in the world. In cooperation with the international community, particularly UN women and other partners, Japan is determined to do its utmost in collaboration with the members of the United Nations to overcome the crisis and build back better for a world full of hope. Thank you very much for your kind attention. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of Japan for the statement just made. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Malta to introduce an address by the head of government. President, I have the honor to introduce the pre-recorded statement by the Honorable Robert Abela, Prime Minister of the Republic of Malta, to the general debate of the 76th session of the General Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished delegates, before COVID-19, nearly two years ago, we were planning to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations by reinvigorating multilateralism. As the pandemic struck and disrupted all states, large and small, it showed us that only when working together can we tackle common challenges. If anything, COVID only reaffirmed the priority of multilateralism and that it is the key to a strong and sustainable future. As the international community present here today, we would all agree that this pandemic was not just a health crisis, but a multifaceted one due to its domino effect 
upon our humanitarian, security, human rights, and socio-economic stability. We mourn the tragic loss of life it has caused, despite all our efforts. These are immensely challenging times. And as country leaders, we have to also deal with the increasing isolation and the fear that COVID-19 caused among our citizens. The height of the pandemic necessitated unprecedented sacrifice and restrictions that affected our freedom of movement severely disrupted the education of children and young people, left millions jobless, and isolated the most vulnerable around the world. Yet, this experience also taught us that we could defeat hopelessness by supporting each other, by pooling our knowledge base, our scientific research, and by offering humanitarian support. It is this spirit of multilateralism that supported our determination to tackle the pandemic. And it is this same spirit that will enable us to build a strong and sustainable future together. As we slowly emerge from the pandemic, we must come together to forge ahead with plans that demonstrate our determination and commitment to a strong recovery that leads to a more equal, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable world. Here, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and refer to the fact that for the first time in 20 years, the World Bank announced a significant rise in poverty numbers, with the 2021 figures showing an estimated increase in COVID-induced poor of between 143 and 163 million. This means that the goal of bringing the global absolute poverty rate to less than 3% by 2030 is now beyond reach unless we embark on swift, significant and targeted policy actions. We cannot afford to respond to the devastating effects of COVID-19 merely by limiting ourselves to rhetoric. The principles of leaving no one behind and building back better must be implemented by providing and mobilizing sufficient aid and resources, ensuring that, to give one example, vaccines are fairly distributed to those who urgently require them, and ensuring a level playing field by assisting regions of the world that continue to have difficulties in importing vaccines. This is why Malta is a proud co-sponsor of UN Security Council resolution that seeks to ensure equitable and affordable access to COVID-19 vaccines in armed conflict and post-conflict situations and during complex humanitarian emergencies. And as a nation, we welcome the work being undertaken to address vaccine inequality. Whilst I am proud to say that as of today, Malta has vaccinated around 91% of its population, we also stand fully committed to vaccine sharing with countries in need. It is in this spirit that this summer, Malta donated 40,000 vaccine doses to Libya, and we will assist even further with the aim of helping our neighboring country get a million doses by the end of this year. Despite all the ongoing efforts, however, the crisis is far from over. Echoing the words of the United Nations Secretary General, a significant push at the highest political level is needed to reverse some of the effects of the pandemic, to avoid a global recession and get back on track to fulfill the 2030 agenda for sustainable development within this decade of action and delivery. Malta, has formulated a post-COVID-19 strategy that places the community at the center stage. The strategy was formulated using a bottom-up approach that looks at our strengths, vulnerabilities, and potential in a bid to make Malta a smarter and more resilient economy. Mr. President, the pandemic has significantly slowed global economic activity. 
and the effects represent one of the largest international economic shocks the world has experienced in recent decades. As the global trade environment continues to be in a state of flux, ensuring an economic, environmental and social recovery that is fair and inclusive is of the utmost importance that guarantees financial aid and loans from international financial institutions are required in order to provide the impetus for economic recovery and revitalization. The EU Digital COVID Certificate, for example, was a successful step forward to recovery via tourism. I also believe that upon assessing the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to rethink our basic economic model and adapt it to similar events which are likely to take place in the future. With this in mind, I firmly support the idea of an inclusive and resilient post-pandemic recovery that is based on an open and rules-based approach to international trade and foreign direct investment. Action should be focused on ensuring the proper implementation of existing rules, as well as the negotiation and implementation of new rules on issues that have emerged over the years. Fair competition should be at the heart of any approach for a post-pandemic economic recovery. While we refocus our efforts on recovering together, we have to work and collaborate with the UN and other organizations to usher in a more networked and inclusive multilateral approach. To echo what the Secretary General stressed in his International Day of Diplomacy message earlier this year. It is also the best form of preparedness against the global challenges that are impacting us all, particularly climate change. Only through collective efforts that transform our present economic model into one that truly fosters social and environmental cohesion can we truly and effectively respond to the needs of our planet responsibly by building networks at all levels to foster a change in mindset across all strata of society. As political leaders, the major responsibility falls upon us, but we must engage with the private sector, academia, and entities from all walks of life to stop human-induced climate change and seek solutions to adapt to its negative repercussions after we have done all we can to mitigate it. In this regard, a successful COP26 is critical to meet our long-term climate neutrality objective. I am proud to state that achieving carbon neutrality is one of the five major pillars of my country's economic vision for 2030. My government has adopted a low carbon development strategy that integrates mitigation with adaptation, which includes significant investments in the sectors of waste management, road transport, renewable energy, and the energy efficiency of buildings. Despite the severe economic impact COVID-19 has had upon national finances, our program for an ambitious decarbonization program has not wavered. As one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change within the European Union, Malta is a keen advocate in favor of a focus on adaptation. Small island states are amongst the lowest emitters, but the most vulnerable to climate change. We also have limited options to reduce emissions, leading us to incur higher marginal and disproportionate abatement costs. As leaders, we have a significant role to play and the responsibility to act without delay. In this regard, I welcome the adoption earlier this year of an EU strategy on adaptation and the renewed focus on this topic by the UN. Climate change by itself and as a threat multiplier poses significant challenges that may exacerbate long existing vulnerabilities and emerging conflicts as well as threaten the very existence of some countries and regions. 
in view of this, the relationship between climate and security will be high on Malta's agenda if elected to the UN Security Council for the term 2023-2024. As part of this agenda, we will place particular emphasis on bridging the gap between science and global security concerns, especially the ocean as the single largest habitat on our planet. Malta is committed to ensuring that the voices of those states mostly affected by the impacts of climate change are heard. As we are continuously witnessing, climate change is triggering severe and frequent weather phenomena that bring entire regions and states to their knees. We need to act before it is too late. To this effect, as a country, we have been actively and continuously working within the relevant UN structures and with other member states to raise awareness on the needs and capabilities of such countries. Our belief is that genuine and durable partnerships can assist in the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals, the fight against climate change and the opportunities for decarbonization, as well as in addressing the threats to our ocean and the potential we share to develop the blue economy. As a founding member of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, Malta's goal is to become a leader in small island state governance, standing ready to share our plans on decarbonization and also digitalization. Small island states face challenges regarding their critical infrastructure, but in parallel can also demonstrate how effective the community-based approach is. As our society will go through a digital transition in parallel with the climate one, as a country we also advocate the need to close the digital gap across nations to ensure a level playing field. Although Malta enjoys a positive and professional relationship as a digital island, we aim to further enhance our potential in the field and fast track our digital transformation. Our aim is to implement modernized and secure digital services that are accessible to all. These efforts will circumvent any of the disruptions caused by COVID-19, notably in the economy, education, health, and the public administration. Digitalization will benefit and empower humanity if it is accessible to all our peoples, even those in the most remote parts of the world. Mr. President, another common goal and shared priority is that of ensuring human rights remain at the core of what we do. The full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms is a priority for Malta. And we are especially concerned with reports of increased violence against women around the world. Our systems must be strengthened to prevent the proliferation of the scourge. We must ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice, victims are supported, and an enabling environment is created for women to be able to fully, equally, and effectively participate in public life. Malta on the Security Council will continue to stress the need to include women and youths in peacekeeping and peace building efforts. Their voices must be heard if we are to build fair and inclusive societies. Just as peace agreements have been seen to last longer when women and youth are present at the peace table, so can women and youth contribute to various spheres of society and ensure that all voices are heard and the needs of the most vulnerable are met. It is our responsibility to ensure that women are given the space to become enablers for change. It is similarly our responsibility to provide a safe and secure environment where our society can flourish, a commitment that cannot easily be achieved when peace and security continues to be threatened across the continents. As a prospective elected member of the Security Council, 
Malta believes that refocusing and revitalizing our efforts at addressing and mitigating tensions is paramount. More must be done to assist the main actors on the ground and to address the root causes of conflict. Such goals can be achieved by providing basic needs which instability and conflict have taken away, whether it is basic education, literacy or food security. On this occasion, I have to say a few words on Libya. The future of Libya must remain at the forefront of our common agenda for international peace and stability. The international community needs to provide support to the Libyan authorities under the auspices of the United Nations to make sure that the political transition is a successful one for the Libyan people, the region, the African continent and the world. The will of the Libyan people must be respected and the October 20 ceasefire agreement fully implemented while the work of the independent fact-finding mission on Libya set up last year should continue to be supported and reinforced. Mercenaries, foreign fighters and forces must withdraw from Libya and the arms embargo must be respected. In the run-up to Libya's upcoming national elections, this process should continue to be strengthened with the adoption of the necessary social and economic reforms combined with an underlying national reconciliation process. All of this should translate to, amongst others, the unification of state institutions, the commencing of the security sector reform, as well as disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. We hope that the strengthening of these elements would bring Libyans together as they determine their collective effort towards a common future and a peaceful, prosperous Libya. Malta is actively supporting Libya in its economic development and just a few days ago, we marked our first commercial flight between our two countries. This is an important step forward for Libyan stability and prosperity. At the same time, however, we cannot ignore the impact that political developments in the wider region have on the situation in Libya. The situation in the Sahel remains tenuous, necessitating an integrated approach driven by a strong political commitment. This instability in the region will have implications and spillover effects in other areas, including migration and terrorism. More specifically on the latter, terrorism is a trans-regional phenomenon, which knows no border and continues to pose a major threat to peace and security in various regions across Africa, particularly in Western and Central Africa, as well as the Sahel. It remains imperative for the international community to continue to work together and address the root causes of violent extremism and radicalization with the aim of countering terrorism as well as its financing. Terrorists are adept at exploiting countries with weak counter-terrorism capabilities. Hence, the need to address such challenges is even more important. Action against terrorism must be firm and decisive at all times, and the UN is central to the fight. Literacy has, in my view, a critical role to play in empowering individuals to counter radicalization efforts. This also links with the importance of strengthening the capacities of national criminal justice systems to administer fair and effective justice for perpetrators of terrorist crimes while undertaking effective preventive measures in accordance with the rule of law. From a local perspective, the International Institute on Justice and the Rule of Law Malta, founded in June 2014, has been very active in convening practitioners from across the world to provide rule of law based training to lawmakers, police, prosecutors, judges, corrections officials and other justice sector stakeholders on how to address terrorism and related transnational criminal activities within a rule of law framework. 
and calm maintained. Afghan nationals must not be abandoned to their fate. Humanitarian access is crucial, and all humanitarian actors must have unimpeded access to deliver timely and life-saving services and assistance. Similarly, I want to show my support for the words of the UN Secretary General that the international community must unite and ensure that Afghanistan is never again used as a platform or haven for terrorist organizations. Regarding Syria, the situation on the ground remains unstable. Not only have 10 years passed since the conflict began, but the struggles that families and children are facing have become even more precarious. The persisting violence in Syria, particularly in view of ongoing reports of sexual and gender-based violence, attacks on children, hospitals, schools, and other vital civilian infrastructure, including potable water production plants, is indeed of grave concern. We welcome the unanimous adoption of UNSCR 2585, extending the use of the humanitarian aid corridor at Bab al Hawa. We urge all parties to refrain from further violence and take any and all appropriate actions leading to a resolution of this humanitarian and political crisis. The international community must redouble its efforts to bring peace to Syria. We cannot remain idle. Peace and security are fundamental if we have any ambition to protect international humanitarian principles and minimize the impact of conflict on innocent civilians, including those who are the most vulnerable. Too many people live in countries where their access to water, food, education, and other essential needs is not met or is denied. As potential members of the Security Council, we will commit to addressing the root causes of conflict and to promote recognition of the crucial role of humanitarian space. Conflicts affect the lives of many people and on a yearly basis we fail tens of thousands of children. We fail to protect them from violence, from cruelty, from harm, and from realizing their full potential. We fail to protect their right of being children. Every year, children are forced into armed movements, abducted, abused, and forced to take part in conflicts that they have not created. The new worrying trends, together with the multifaceted impacts on children, exacerbated by the pandemic, are calling us to redouble our efforts to tackle this plague together. The protection of children must be central in our policy and decision-making processes. This goal is indeed attainable, but we must act with urgency. UN peacekeeping operations have a key role to play in protecting children in armed conflict, as well as others within the UN system, including UNICEF. We strongly encourage the Council and Member States to support the full implementation of strong child protection mandates, including through the speedy deployment of senior child protection advisors and teams, and by prioritizing the protection of children in peacekeeping transitions. Should Malta be entrusted to serve on the Council in 2023-2024, children and armed conflict will be a priority during our tenure. We firmly believe that this issue, which greatly impacts our societies, should be mainstreamed across the work of the Security Council. Mr. President, we live in an interconnected world in which actions and policies taken by an state can leave a severe impact on third countries. Consequently, I firmly believe that a response which is multilateral in its approach for a strong multilateral framework with a revitalized United Nations at its core is the need of the hour. We need to strengthen our work on the affirmation of universal rules and principles. And we need to join forces and make rapid progress on the common goal 
of rehabilitating multilateralism. Only by working together and in solidarity can we end the pandemic and effectively tackle its consequences. Only together can we build resilience against future pandemics and other global challenges. Multilateralism is not an option, but a necessity, as we build back better for a world which is more equal, resilient, and sustainable. Only through collective action can we truly recover together. Without an adequate global response, the cumulative effects of the pandemic and its economic fallout, armed conflict, and climate change will exact high human and economic costs well into the future. This is a risk that we cannot take, especially in these unprecedented times where cooperation and solidarity among states is needed more than ever before. Malta is ready to support the global effort and be an effective international change agent by assisting the alignment of economic strategies, promoting a collaborative international conversation and driving technological innovation whilst remaining sensitive to societal and cultural implications. If elected to the UN Security Council for the term 2023-2024, Malta will commit to support the UN as a neutral member state actively pursuing peace, security and social progress among all nations across the world. Malta stands united with the international community to build a better world where understanding and cooperation are at the heart of our policies and the work we do on the ground, where we work together in a unified and multilateral manner. Our citizens and our children who will inherit the world after us truly deserve it. Thank you. I wish to thank the statement by the Prime Minister of Republic of Malta. Now the GA will listen to the Toasters of Ireland, His Excellency Miguel Martin. He's coming. Okay. It is my great pleasure to introduce the Ireland from Mr. Michael Martin. And he will make a statement at the GA. Distinguished heads of state and government, esteemed heads of delegations, Mr. Secretary-General, Deputy Secretary-General, friends. This week, in this hall, a series of alarms have sounded. They have sounded for conflict. They have sounded for COVID. They have sounded for climate. We have heard the alarms. Now we must respond. I believe that this is what the General Assembly or Assembly of Nations was created to do, or purpose, or obligation. The United Nations is a symbol of hope for billions of people around the world. The UN flag, a beacon of peace across the globe. The blue helmets, guardians to the most vulnerable. UN convoys, a lifeline to millions. The obligation we assume in this hall is to transform that hope in the face of our common challenges into a better future for all our peoples. Mr. President, today the climate crisis threatens our very existence on this shared and endangered planet. The COVID-19 pandemic has cast a shadow over our world. It has deepened global inequality, even as it has heightened our sense of interdependence. The people of the world now look to us, to this General Assembly Hall, to act and to lead. We cannot let them down. The simple fact is that we cannot succeed 
in addressing these global challenges without a strong, effective, and fair multilateral system. As we begin to emerge from the shadow of the pandemic, let us do so more united in our resolve and firm in our conviction that the United Nations delivers for those who rely on it most. Let us commit to tackling this pandemic together, to make leave no one behind more than a mere slogan in our words and more importantly, in our deeds. Mr. President, vaccine inequity is a moral test for our global community. The rapid establishment of COVAX and the ACT Accelerator represents multilateralism at its best. I urge all member states to continue to support the COVAX mechanism. This is the only way we can meet the target of a fully vaccinated world by mid-2022. Ireland is in the process of donating 1.3 million vaccine doses to low-income countries, mainly through COVAX, with a further significant donation planned in 2022. Our support to global health since the outbreak of the pandemic has reached over 200 million euros. The World Health Organization should remain at the heart of our global response to this and future pandemics. However, we must provide it with the political and financial support it needs to do this job. In Ireland, we have quadrupled funding to the World Health Organization in response to the pandemic. We must also consider change where needed to stre strengthen the multilateral architecture on pandemic prevention and response. Mr. President, when we reflect on the last 18 months, one thing is clear. The pandemic caught the world off guard. It has put into stark relief the simple and regrettable fact that we have not made sufficient progress in reducing poverty, that we have not made sufficient progress in increasing access to quality health care and education, nor in combating the climate crisis. Had we made more progress in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, our societies would have been more resilient, better prepared to weather the storm, and lives would have been spared. We have less than a decade to achieve these ambitious global goals. We have a rare opportunity now to build back fairer, greener, and better. The SDGs provide us with the blueprint so too does our common agenda, the Secretary-General's vision for a future of global cooperation through an inclusive, networked and effective multilateralism. It is incumbent upon all of us to grasp this moment, to invest in a better world for all. Mr. President, for Ireland, our membership of the European Union has shown us that pooling our sovereignty enhances not diminishes it, that abiding by international law brings immeasurable benefits, and that our commitment to multilateralism is not simply a stock phrase to insert into a speech, but is at the heart of who we are as a nation and as a people. Last year, in my address to this Assembly, I assured you that Ireland was ready to assume its responsibility at the Security Council a responsibility entrusted to us by you, our fellow members of the General Assembly. We do not take this responsibility lightly. Our own experience of conflict on the island of Ireland has taught us that building peace is painstaking, long, and often frustrating. We expected that our time on the Council would reflect that complexity would require stamina, ingenuity, compromise, and determination. And so it has proved. Every day for the last nine months, we have sought to use our voice to defend our principles and to make progress towards the peaceful resolution of some of the world's most pressing conflicts. Progress has not always been possible. Too often, the Council has been divided. It is a lesson hard learned that when we in this building are divided, it is the most vulnerable 
who suffer the consequences. The promise of the Charter is to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Today, I call on all members of the Council to set aside political differences and to work to uphold that promise. Syria presents an urgent example of where this is needed. This year, we marked 10 years of conflict in that country. For many, the conflict in Syria is emblematic of the failure of the United Nations and of the Security Council in particular. On too many occasions, in the face of immense suffering, the Council choose inaction. Often, in response, it has been the General Assembly that has stepped up and stepped in. This body has taken bold action, critical to the resolution of this conflict. With Norway, Ireland is leading work in the Security Council to ensure that humanitarian aid continues to reach all those who need it in Syria. In July, the Council acted as one when it adopted Resolution 2585. That resolution ensured the continuation of the vital UN operation, which provides aid to 3.4 million people in northwest Syria. But humanitarian aid cannot be a substitute for political will. What 13 million Syrians in need of humanitarian assistance require most is a political solution. Mr. President, since January, Ireland has consistently urged the Council to act in response to the deteriorating situation in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. We have been horrified by reports of gross human rights abuses and violations, including widespread and systematic sexual and gender-based violence. For 10 months, a humanitarian catastrophe has unfolded before our eyes. The threat of famine looms large. This is unconscionable. We are speaking out clearly here today, as we have done in the Council for months. We must stand firm and united in support of the Secretary General's call for a negotiated ceasefire, unimpeded humanitarian access, and restoration of basic services to all affected areas and a political solution to the crisis. Mr. President, a hallmark of Irish foreign policy is our firm commitment to a world free of nuclear weapons. Next week at the Security Council, we will mark the 25th anniversary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. We are committed to achieving a successful and substantive outcome to the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. We warmly welcome the entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. As Security Council facilitator for Resolution 2231 on the Iran nuclear deal, we have engaged extensively to encourage a return to compliance by all parties. We welcome the commitment of the United States Administration to return to the agreement. We urge Iran to seize this opportunity to return swiftly to talks in Vienna and to come back into full compliance with the agreement, including by cooperating fully with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Excellencies, the escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in May resulted in more lives lost, including the shocking deaths of more than 70 children. Ireland was deeply frustrated by the Council's inability to speak throughout this latest outbreak of hostilities. While we welcome the press statement agreed on the 22nd of May, it was too little, too late. A comprehensive, just and lasting peace is possible. Ireland is committed to achieving a two-state solution with a viable state of Palestine based on the 1967 borders alongside the state of Israel living in peace and security with Jerusalem as the capital of both states. Young people, Palestinians and Israelis are losing hope that peace can be achieved. As leaders, we must act now. I call on the international community to come together 
to renew efforts for a just and lasting resolution, including through a reinvigorated quartet. Mr. President, Excellencies, the world has watched in horror at the violence and chaos in Afghanistan. Millions of Afghans require urgent support, including those recently displaced by conflict, violence, and intimidation. Full, safe, and unimpeded access to humanitarian organizations and all of their personnel, regardless of gender, must be facilitated. The most vulnerable, women, girls, boys, men, LGBTQI persons, and persons with disabilities must be protected. The situation of Afghan women and girls has been foremost in our, talk, in our thoughts. Over the last 20 years, Afghan women have asserted their rights and continue to assert their rights. And these rights include full and equal access to education, the right to health care, the right to freedom of movement in their own country, and the right to participate fully in public life. Women and girls have been educated in enormous numbers and have been leading and participating in all aspects of society. They refuse to be silenced, to be erased from public life. Our role and responsibility is to stand with them. So much has been achieved in the past 20 years. There can be no going back. For all of us in this hall, we can and must agree that the rights of Afghan women and girls be a non-negotiable principle. Excellencies, at its best, United Nations peacekeeping is a remarkable and meaningful expression of multilateralism and international solidarity. We have always seen this service as a noble and important calling. For more than six decades, Irish women and men have served. Every village, town and neighbourhood in our island has bid farewell to a blue beret upon deployment and counted the days to their return. Some never made it home. Today, there are over 500 Irish personnel serving in UN and EU peacekeeping and crisis management operations. Every person who serves in a blue helmet deserves a mandate that matches the reality of the conflict on the ground and that resources in turn match mandates. Equally, the transition from peacekeeping to peace building is a critical moment when sustainable peace is within our grasp, but often times at its most fragile. Resolution 2594, led by Ireland and adopted unanimously earlier this month by the Council with the support of 97 members of this Assembly, sends a strong and united message that the United Nations is committed to supporting its members through this sensitive juncture on the path to peace. There can be no gaps when it comes to protecting civilians. Excellencies, in Ireland, we have learned the importance of an inclusive approach to building peace. Those who make war cannot and should not have a monopoly on the terms of peace. It is crucial that women, young people, and civil society, who are often excluded, are at the centre of our shared work to build and maintain peace. The promotion of gender equality and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is a golden thread throughout our work. Human rights are universal and indivisible. They belong to us all. We will not falter in calling for full compliance with international law, including international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and international refugee law. We will stand by the International Criminal Court, the cornerstone of the international system of criminal justice. Excellencies, yesterday I had the privilege to chair a council debate on climate and security. As we heard from the Secretary General on Tuesday, we can no longer deny the reality. Climate change is the single greatest challenge facing our generation. Its impact is devastating on our environment 
and ecosystems, and our collective security is at risk. We have seen time and time again that the most catastrophic impacts disproportionately affect the most vulnerable and the least responsible. We must deliver on the Paris Agreement commitments, and we will shortly have important discussions at COP26. But we can see the adverse effects of climate change already exacerbating conflict and insecurity, compounding other drivers of conflict such as poverty, inequality and human rights violations. We have ample evidence of this. As co-chair of the informal expert group on climate and security, along with Niger, Ireland has worked throughout the year with our fellow Council members to better understand these links, to inform the Council as to what steps we can take to address climate-related security risks. We know not all Council members are of one mind on this. My hope is that by working together, we can and we will reach a shared understanding of how the Security Council can meet the challenge of climate and security. There is no time to waste. For this reason, in the coming days, Ireland will convene a discussion on a thematic Security Council resolution on climate and security. Excellencies, at COP26, we must all, north and south of this vulnerable planet, muster the courage to take bold and ambitious action. We need to keep global warming to as close to 1.5 degrees Celsius as possible. For our part, Ireland will reduce our emissions by 51% by 2030 compared to 2018 levels. Along with our partners in the European Union, we will achieve net neutrality by 2050. It is also critical that we meet our collective commitment to provide $100 billion in financing to developing countries. We cannot fail. Our future depends on it. Mr. President, Excellencies, we can all identify times when we, the United Nations, have fallen short. The UN can only do what we ask of it when we, its members, allow it, when we deliver the resources, the support, the political will, and the constructive engagement needed for it to deliver. As I stand here today, I am reminded of the ambitions, the goals, and the dreams of billions of people. They have placed their trust in us, and they expect us to work together to solve the greatest challenges facing our global community. We know that with political will, we can be deserving of that trust. Mr. President, Ireland will continue to play our part, to build consensus, and to advocate fiercely for the multilateral system and the people we have pledged to serve. Thank you very much indeed. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the Taoiseach of Ireland for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Eddie Rama, Prime Minister of the Republic of Albania. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency? I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Edi Rama, Prime Minister of the Republic of Albania, and I invite him to address the General Assembly. Mr. President of the General Assembly, distinguished delegates, it is a special honor to hold this speech as the representative of a country that is for the first time in its history joining the Security Council of the United Nations as a non-permanent member for the term 2022-2023. The significance of this event for a state 
that until not too long ago was considered one of the most isolated and repressive countries in the world and the sense of responsibility with which we take up this role cannot be overstated. I would like to start by thanking all UN members for their overwhelming support and their trust. Albania brings to the Security Council the perspective of a small but engaged country, aware of the burdens of the past and of the challenges of the future, that has experienced firsthand the limits of isolation, isolationism and has discovered the opportunities of multilateral cooperation. Albania is now a country characterized by respect for differences, tolerance of different religions, and appreciation of the contribution that every culture brings. It will sit in the Security Council with a clear agenda of priorities, which reflect what modern Albania stands for, the promotion of peace and security, peaceful conflict resolution and mediation, the respect for the rule of law and human rights for all, increased participation of women and youth in decision-making, universal adherence and full implementation of all non-proliferation and disarmament treaties and conventions, concrete and continued active co commitment to the fight against international terrorism and violent extremism. It is a special pleasure to return physically in this great house of peace and be able to share our thoughts on today's world, including my country's effort in facing one of the biggest shared challenges, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which for more than 18 months has inflicted terrible pain everywhere. Like every other corner of the world, Albania has suffered from this devastating scourge. To this day, more than half of the Albanian population is vaccinated, and we expect to have the whole recommended population fully vaccinated during the next 10 months. One of the big lessons of this tragedy is that no country can face it alone, and we know now no one will be safe until everyone is. As we have seen far too often, without cooperation, solidarity, and joint actions, the price we pay individually and collectively will only be higher. This is why at the height of the COVID crisis last year, dozens of Albanian doctors and nurses went to Italy to help their colleagues in the Lombardy region. In return, we have been fortunate and grateful to welcome Italian doctors, assistance in the same fight home. I owe here a very heartfelt thank you to many that have been there for helping us, to the Republic of Turkey, who made possible for us in really difficult moments the necessary doses to start massive vaccination, to the European Union Commission, who fought hard to speed up the provision of vaccines from EU to Albania and the Western Balkans, and also the governments of Italy, Greece, Croatia, Lettonia, which were there for us with their vaccines donations, and to the governments of Poland, Austria, and Denmark, which have pledged to help us in the way. I brought here these examples to not forget that we will be able to prevail in this war for life only through a common approach based on deeper solidarity, continued assistance, and uninterrupted cooperation. The sharp inequality to vaccine access, the only way to stop the virus, has once more highlighted the urgency for a different approach, for global initiative, inclusiveness, solidarity and fairness, as well as trust to science. This is why we continue to advocate international cooperation and support the proposal for a new international treaty for pandemic preparedness and response. We must be and stay together, resist any temptation of isolationism and nationalism. It is necessary to urgently improve vaccine access for all, 
as unvaccinated people carry the high risk of enabling the emergence of more dangerous and deadly variants that could reverse the gains so painfully made and expose us all to even more dire consequences. If the 75 years long and strong experience of the United Nations has taught us anything, it is that challenges to peace, development, justice, health and security need the contribution of all, rich and poor, big and small. We firmly believe that 75 years after its founding, the United Nations remain the cornerstone of the multilateral rule-based world order. With dialogue and concerted efforts through the entire UN system, humanity has made remarkable gains in peace, security and development, in the respect of human rights and human dignity, in empowering women and motivating youth, in helping hundreds of millions of people leave poverty behind. We must conti continue to build on these achievements. The people, our fellow citizens, are right to ask for more, for better, and faster initiatives, and we must be up to the task. Dear colleagues, let's remind ourselves that our future, the future of humanity, is shaped by the way we respond and cooperate in the present. Multilateralism is challenged when selfish nationalism prevails. This is one of the most important lessons of the past. Multilateralism can be slow, sometimes frustrating, and it does not always produce quick results. But a world without shared rules, obligations, and multilateral institutions is a nightmare we know all too well. Therefore, we cannot afford to lose faith in the multilateral system. We must work to reform it, not to undermine it, and certainly not abandon it. We share UN Secretary General's concerns in his report on our common agenda, and we think that all UN member states have the responsibility to contribute to increasing the functionality of multilateral institutions and mechanisms in order to make a tangible difference to people's lives. It is exactly in this spirit that Albania successfully chaired the OSCE in 2020 as part of its continued in engagement and efforts to strengthen peace, human rights, cooperation, and equality in the OSCE area. The Ministerial Council of Tirana agreed on several new commitments on combating transnational organized crime, countering corruption, and preventing torture in the OSCE region. Climate change is another key priority in our national agenda. We do not need to have repeated extreme weather events, catastrophic flooding, and unbearable heat waves to understand that, we, that the continued loss of biodiversity and the unsustainable use and degradation of ecosystems are causing profound and adverse consequences to millions of people and threatening peace and security. Convinced of the urgency to curb greenhouse gas emissions in line with Paris Agreement, and the 2030 Agenda, as of July 2019, the government of Albania is the first country in the region with an endorsed strategy on climate change and related action plans, with policy objectives and concrete actions to reduce greenhouse emissions. A special law on climate change has been adopted on, in December 2020. Further, in support of the objectives of the European Union Green Deal, Albania and other Western Balkan countries signed two declarations in November 2020. The Western Balkan countries on the Green Agenda, as well as the creation of a common regional market, which aim at making the economy sustainable and climate neutral by 2050. Albania, as a net clean energy produ producer, is also actively engaged in doing its part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% in the next decade and to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, the European integration process represents an anchor for Albania's future, and we look forward to the first intergovernmental conference 
in accordance with the previous decision of the European Council to open accession negotiations with Albania. I have said it in Tirana, in Brussels, and everywhere, and I want to repeat it here. Albania has been ready for a while. It is waiting for the EU to do its part. European integration is a national priority goal. It is a region-wide aspiration and a source of inspiration. In a completely transformed regional context, all six Western Balkan countries have agreed to enhance economic cooperation by developing a common regional market based on EU rules and standards. We have entered a new and ambitious phase of cooperation and are also working con to concretely implement the four EU fundamental freedoms, freedom of movement of people, goods, services and capital through the Open Balkan Initiative. It is the mark and proof of our regional ownership, convinced that it will generate economic growth, reduce unemployment, increase trade, investment, employment in the Western Balkan, and last but not least, make peace irreversible and help the resolution of conflicts once and for all. Dear colleagues, the history of the United Nations is one of uninterrupted enlargement. It started with 50 members in San Francisco, and we are now 193. But still, this large assembly is not and will not be complete without one of the states of our region, the Republic of Kosovo. You have heard me more than once here call for the recognition of the independence of Kosovo. It is not an obsession nor do I mention it just to pay lip service to the cause. It is an invitation to acknowledge the new realities in the heart of Europe, through the Balkan region, where a new state was born with the help of an international community committed to the cause of freedom, human rights, and self-determination. But that work needs to be finished. And I want to reiterate this call and do so because reality has shown to us, to the Kosovars, to the Serbs, to all Balkan people, to the Europeans and to everyone anywhere who wants to see it, that an independent sovereign Kosovo, a reality already 13 years strong, has brought more peace and stability in the region, has contributed to move ahead from the bitter past, and is undeniably part of the common future of the Western Balkans. Albania supports as the only alternative the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia, which would lead to mutual recognition between two states, two neighbors. Every day without such an agreement is a day lost, a day stolen to the youth in both countries, a day taken off the common future. And I say it in a friendly way, but with absolute conviction, only wisdom, courage, and vision will finally liberate Serbia from the burden of its past. Before concluding, let me say a few words on Afghanistan. It is our duty to do whatever possible, not to abandon the Afghan people who find themselves once more in the crossroads, to preserve the undeniable achievements of the last two decades, prevent and resist any return to the age of darkness the world has seen before. As dramatic events were unfolding in front of our eyes, we could not stand idle. Despite limited capacities for receiving immigrants, but with unconditioned humanitarianism, we opened our doors to Afghan refugees. We did it just as we have done in other critical moments of our history when we saved thousands of Jews during the Holocaust and Albania became the only country in Europe to have more Jews after than before the war, or when we welcomed half a million of our Kosovo brothers and sisters escaping the hell of ethnic cleansing in 1999. We welcomed Afghan refugees because we have a moral duty to be in solidarity with those in danger. We owe it to our own history as refugees 
until 30 years ago. And also, we owe it to our own children that we believe should learn not just by words, but also by deeds, that in this life there is a time to get and there is a time to give. As the Nobel Prize laureate, the Albanian saint Mother Teresa once said, even when you cannot do great things, do small things every day, but with great love. We are humbly doing our part. Thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Republic of Albania for the statement just made, and I request a protocol to escort His Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of New Zealand to introduce an address by the head of government. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honour to introduce a pre-recorded statement of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern. In a mana, in a reo, rauranga tira ma o tēnei whare nui o te ao. Prestigious people, speakers of note, chiefs one and all of this General Assembly, nā mihi mahana ki a koutou katoa, mai e tōku whenua o Aotearoa. Warm greetings to you all from my home country of New Zealand. Nō reira tēnā koutou katoa, greetings to you all. Mr President, Mr Secretary General, friends, I greet you in Te Reo Māori, the language of the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. As I deliver this address to the General Assembly from here in New Zealand, it strikes me that even when global events threaten to disconnect and divide us, a shared instinct to connect with one another still prevails. I've often described New Zealand as being remote but connected. The COVID-19 pandemic has made both parts of this statement truer than ever. In some ways, we now feel that remoteness more keenly. The vast oceans surrounding our islands have taken on an even greater significance in a time where our border controls are our first line of defence against a highly contagious global virus. Despite this physical distancing, the pandemic has demonstrated more starkly than ever just how closely connected we all are. We live in a world where domestic decisions made half a world away are as significant to us as those made by our nearest neighbours. In many ways, COVID-19 is an illustration of global transboundary problems at a local level. Here is an invisible threat which no one is safe from, and the very thing keeping us safe is each other. We have placed our trust in the actions of neighbours and strangers to wear masks, to distance, to get vaccinated and support others to do so, and we live collectively with the consequences. It has been a privilege for me as a leader to witness the practical application of New Zealanders' values to these challenges. Values like manakitanga and whanaunatanga, which in Māori language means kindness and a shared sense of humanity, humanity and connectedness. Values like kotahitanga, or a shared aspiration and unity towards a common goal. These values have seen New Zealanders take care of one another and work together to limit the transmission of COVID-19 in our communities. Now, these values are not unique to New Zealand. They are universal. They underpin the charter of the United Nations. One need only read the preamble to see them reflected back at us. No community, nation or region acting alone can address COVID-19. It is a complex global problem that requires a global solution. Equitable access to safe and effective vaccines for everyone is essential to our response and recovery. New Zealand is working with others, especially Australia, to support full vaccine coverage for Pacific Island countries. And the COVAX facility is doing essential work distributing vaccines worldwide. But more must be done to support this effort. New Zealand is proud to have been amongst the first countries to donate doses to the COVAX advanced market commitment in addition to our financial support. 
New Zealand continues to work with the WTO and APEC to support a waiver of intellectual property protections for vaccines and other measures to increase availability. Without equitable access for all, we risk further variants developing which could undermine or undo our progress. At the same time that the direct impacts of COVID-19 have brought immeasurable pain to many across the world, it has also exacerbated and further complicated other existing global challenges. We know what these challenges are. We articulated them as areas of action in the UN 75th Anniversary Declaration. The pandemic has been the ultimate disruptor. It has changed our realities and given us cause to pause and reflect. In the disruption is an opportunity for us to reset, to adjust some of our fundamental settings, to put us in a better position to respond to our shared challenges. We've heard so much about building back better. We must do better. Like the drafters of the Charter, we owe future generations our commitment to hound down a better world forged through cooperation. Fortunately for us, we already have a blueprint for such a world in the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. The 2030 Agenda recognises that as our shared challenges are interconnected, so too must be our responses. As we face a series of interlinked global crises that demand action, now is the time for us to recommit to the SDGs. COVID-19 cannot be an excuse for not achieving the SDGs. In fact, it's a further reason why we must. There is perhaps no better example of a global crisis that demands action, though, than climate change. Climate change is one of the most pervasive crises of our time. From rising sea levels to shifting weather patterns, the impact are, are global in scope, unprecedented in scale, and happening right now. Climate change touches all of our lives. The countries in the Pacific are some of the most affected, despite having contributed at least to the problem. Pacific leaders view climate change as the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security, and well-being of the peoples of the region. Any global response that fails to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels is unacceptable. This is our goal, and our collect collective efforts must achieve it. The latest science from the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is stark. The climate crises cannot be beaten through incrementalism. The science demands that we do so much more. New Zealand has made the 1.5 degree limit the heart of our domestic climate change legislation. We have committed to a 2050 target and we are revising our nationally determined contribution. As we mitigate, we must also adapt. This year, New Zealand conducted its first national climate change risk assessment to tell us where to focus our effort, and within two years, we will have a national adaptation plan. But we've already begun our journey. New Zealand has a program to plant, for instance, one billion trees by 2028. This will store carbon, but it will also support forest resilience, prevent erosion, improve biodiversity, and support our rural and indigenous communities. Lifting the ambition of our nationally determined contributions is vital, but there are also collective actions we need to take. This includes bringing an end to fossil fuel and other environmentally harmful subsidies. It includes pooling our resources and knowledge through the Global Research Alliance so that we can grow more food without growing emissions. It includes negotiating an agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability. New Zealand is actively pursuing all of these outcomes. We must collectively address the unjust and potentially destabilising consequences of climate change. For small island developing states, one of the gravest consequences is sea level rise. The ocean is central to the culture and livelihoods of the people of the Pacific. Pacific countries have also planned their economies in long-term development and reliance on the maritime zones and resources guaranteed to them under the Law of the Sea Convention. It is only right that as an international community, we work to ensure the maintenance of those zones and rights in the face of climate change-related sea level rise. 
Now, as a contribution to this objective, I was pleased to join my fellow Pacific Islands Forum leaders in issuing the Declaration on Preserving Maritime Zones in the Face of Climate Change-Related Sea Level Rise in August this year. Climate change is closely interlinked with another crisis of a planetary scale, that of global biodiversity loss. As much as we are all interconnected as nations, so too are we connected with nature and the services it provides. We depend on it for the air we breathe and the economies we have built. Biodiversity loss threatens our well-being, our prosperity and our health. It will both accelerate climate change and make its impacts worse. This is a challenge that requires us to work across barriers and silos. For New Zealand's part, we've adopted the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy 2020, Te Mana o Te Taiao, which will guide our actions domestically for the protection, restoration and sustainable use of biodiversity. We simply cannot achieve the 2030 Agenda unless we unite with collective ambition to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. We have an opportunity to do this by adopting and implementing an ambitious and transformational post-2020 global biodiversity framework at the upcoming Conference of Parties. New Zealand is committed to this, and I urge you to join us. As with biodiversity on land, ocean biodiversity is equally important. New Zealand looks forward to concluding the negotiations on a UN treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of high seas biodiversity. But as we turn our mind to the challenges we face globally, we must turn to the most important thing of all. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, people, people. More than 120 million people have been pushed into extreme poverty as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Inequality within and between countries has deepened. These consequences were never inevitable. And there are steps we can take to reverse these trends and improve the lives of those impacted. Too many people go hungry every day. New Zealand invests heavily in sustainable food production and what we produce feeds many times our own population. But we've seen that at the global level, food systems are neither sustainable nor resilient. They suffer from and contribute to the overlapping impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Transformational change is needed to ensure that everyone has access to the nutrition they need. This week's Food Systems Summit is an important step and it must be the beginning of an ongoing effort. We will do our part in supporting these efforts, including on initiatives that acknowledge the leadership of Indigenous peoples and food systems and increase global ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. For our part, this is an area where we are working hard, with a unique agreement between our food sector, government and Māori to reduce agricultural emissions through pricing mechanisms. We are determined to show the world what is possible. At the same time, we must include making trade more open and inclusive. COVID-19 disrupted global supply chains, while well, at the same time it illustrated the importance of open trade to protecting the health of people and lifting them out of poverty and hunger. We must commit to ensuring the flow of essential goods and services and reject any temptation to turn inwards and focus on protectionism. We know that poverty and inequality drive conflict and instability, and we're also seeing this in heightened civil unrest and conflict. Humanitarian crises have worsened. We're seeing this in Afghanistan, and there are many more. As an international community, we must rise to the challenge of meeting the growing humanitarian need but we also have to intensify our efforts to prevent conflict and build peace. New Zealand looks forward to playing a part in this effort as we join the Peace Building Commission in 2022. As leaders, we have a responsibility to foster and sustain peace in our societies. We know what the necessary conditions are. Yes, this includes the absence of poverty, hunger and material deprivation, but it's also something more. Peaceful societies are inclusive societies where diversity is embraced and everyone has both the means and the opportunities to contribute to the fullness of their potential. Where women and girls are lifted up and encouraged to exercise their voice and their agency. Whatever our political or constitutional systems, no nation will ever be truly peaceful in the absence of these basic conditions, 
founded on the fundamental and equal rights of every person. And where peace fails, we must all do our part to strengthen and improve respect of the laws of armed conflict and to enhance the protection of civilians, preventing both the use of illegal weapons and the illegal use of legal weapons is essential, as is ensuring there is no impunity for any such use. This work is a shared responsibility and one which we pursue alongside our tireless efforts to rid the world of nuclear weapons and the spectre of a conflict that no one can recover from. All of these challenges we share might cause us to re-examine our response to being so interconnected. We have a choice to approach our shared challenges from a place of fear, hoping to protect narrowly defined interests by turning inwards, or we can reaffirm our trust and cooperation, understanding that our greatest fears can only be tackled by concertive collective action. Our forebears were once at this fork in the road, and they chose the path of trust. They founded the United Nations. And it's times like these when we have the most to gain by reminding ourselves of what the Charter's preamble says. It speaks to a concern for future generations. It speaks about universal observance of human rights, respect for international law, and living together in peace as good neighbours. It speaks about uniting our strength and combining our efforts to accomplish our aims. Now, these words of determination were in response to the devastation of war. They apply equally to the collective challenges we face today. And if we are to resolve those in an enduring way, we must look beyond government. Inclusive multilateralism is one in which our common understandings are enriched by diverse perspectives. Now, as governments, we owe it to ourselves to be open to the expertise and partnerships offered by stakeholders, whether they're from civil society, industry, or indigenous groups. Now, I've seen in the progress we've made through the Christchurch call to action what can be achieved when governments, industry, and civil society work together in a multi-stakeholder capacity to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. And I'm utterly committed to further efforts on this important work. New Zealand is committed to advancing our common agenda and sadly, as we've seen in recent times, an essential element of this is preparedness. No one can argue, for instance, that the global community as a whole was adequately prepared for a global pandemic. It's clear that we will face further global health risks and we have no excuses for remaining unprepared. New Zealand strongly supports the ambitious and practical approach of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and response. We will not just passively support the independent panel's recommendations. We will actively engage on work streams to develop a pandemic treaty, convention or other international instrument to improve global surveillance, validation and early response, and importantly, to strengthen the World Health Organization. If there is any lesson we can draw from the events of the past 18 months, it is the need for more and better cooperation. And with the need for better cooperation comes the need for responsive and adaptive global institutions, including the United Nations. I commend and thank the Secretary General on his report and recommendations to advance our common agenda. These provide us with a roadmap for a more inclusive and effective multilateralism, one that includes a voice for the needs of future generations and leaves no one behind. As leaders, we have the power to shape our shared institutions and to make them fit for purpose. We must not shy away from this task. And I can think of no better way to reaffirm our kindness towards one another, our shared humanity and our unity. I hope you'll join us. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā tātou katoa. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister for National Security and Intelligence, Child Poverty Reduction and Ministerial Services of New Zealand for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency James 
Marape, Prime Minister and Minister for Bongaville Affairs of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea, may I request a protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency James Marape, Prime Minister and Minister for Bougainville Affairs of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Said, the President of the General Assembly. His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General, fellow leaders, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinguished honor and pleasure on my own behalf and that of my 8 million plus people and government to join other global leaders in addressing the General Assembly today. I also take this time to extend our condolences to the families in your countries, including my own country, who have lost loved ones due to COVID-19, and I'll get well wishes to those who are sick. I also pay tribute to the global frontline workers and service personnel who have toiled over and beyond the call of duties to care for those who are sick and vulnerable especially our medical workers. Mr. President, this being my first attendance at this global forum, I am greatly humbled and warmly congratulate you and the government and people of the Republic of Maldives on your mandate, particularly as a small island developing state, to lead our collective work this session. This is compounded by the intensifying and worrisome global climate crisis, accelerated by biodiversity losses and other humanitarian, peace, security, and trade-related issues that poses great challenges to the way we now manage our regional and global and socio-economic affairs. Despite all these challenges, we are heartened by your foresight, commitment, and leadership under your presidency of hope vision and time. We pledge our total support to you and offer our partnership during your tenancy as president of this August Forum. Mr. President, I also thank your predecessor, His Excellency, Mr. Wolkan Boski, and the delegation of Turkey for his excellent leadership and outstanding work this past year under, of course, very challenging circumstances. We wish him and his family all the very best. I want to place on record Papua New Guinea's deep appreciation and support to our friend, the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Guterres, for his continuing bold and decisive leadership of work for our United Nations in as far as the United Nations mandate and Charter is concerned. Mr. Secretary General, your unanimous reappointment for another term starting next year is indeed a clear demonstration of the confidence and trust the United Nations member states, including my own country, have in your work ethics, your strong leadership, which this organization needs at this very challenging period. I thank you for your frank and sobering assessment of the challenges before us and your proposals on how we confront these challenges practically and at multilateral levels. Mr. President, I bring to you all greetings from Papua New Guinea in the blue, peaceful Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean, or the blue Pacific continent, is home to marine and terrestrial biodiversity and is where the most vulnerable small island states are being exposed to the global threats of rise in sea level due to climate change and the health and the associated economic wars brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
I speak for Papua New Guinea, of course, but the issues will no doubt resonate with the small island states, including those of my Pacific brothers and sisters. I also believe, Mr. President, that you too will have some appreciation on what these issues are, because you come from a small island state yourself. Our ocean homes and our way of life is intertwined with the coastal ecosystem in its natural equilibrium. This equilibrium is now affected by human influence. And for us, small island states, not in our making. But we are the first victims and the most affected because of our inherent vulnerabilities. Mr. President, as we convene and continue to speak on climate change in the ambiences of our 21st century, post holes like this August United Nations Assembly, may I remind us all that little children and their families are living, who are living in the seas of earth are living in fear and uncertainty of what their future will be like. This is because in their lifetime they have seen the arable and saved lands lost due to sea level rise and are watching as the structures that their lives are built upon slips away. It is time the big carbon emitters of planet Earth own up and apologize to small island states and all other victims of climate change. And I make this statement with no apologies. And today I make a call for all of us, and especially to the big carbon emitting nations who are now enjoying their national economic transformations through industrialization to pause, think, and take responsibility to save our planet. I am comforted by the recent commitment by President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Boris Johnson on their respective nations' intention to respond better to tackling climate change issues. Mr. President, I also hear of China's positive response and note that it is good we are now uniting to save our planet. We have a collective responsibility to take actions to save Earth. Mr. President, when astronaut Neil Armstrong walked on the moon on July 20, 1969, he would have looked back to the direction where he came from. And I assume that he would not have seen his beloved home state, the United States of America. He would have shown, or he would have seen his home planet, planet Earth. It is the survival of Earth that we must now take action. I want to make this statement enough of talk. We have to take actions commensurate to the volume of emissions from our industries. Leaders of the big carbon emit emitting nations must now lead the global effort in, re in rebalancing the environmental equilibrium. It is a hard ask, but really a necessary call for leadership and champions. I point to all nations on Earth to embrace the unity of humanity to save our planet, because what happens in Africa will and does affect Europe. Whatever happens in Asia will affect America, and whatever happens in Middle East will affect those of us in the Pacific and vice versa. We live in one planet, one atmospheric envelope, one interlinked environmental ecosystem. Hence, as one humanity, we must rise and unite to preserve our one planet, our home. To not to do so is foolishness, and we are doing so at the peril of our children and their children if, of course, Jesus Christ doesn't come back soon. Mr. President, Papua New Guinea recognizes the need to save Earth and we too are contributing and will contribute to preserve our Earth. God has blessed Papua New Guinea with about 13% of world's, world's tropical rainforest and 6% of its biodiversity. These global assets we want to preserve. One lesson I have learned from the COVID-19 experience is that oxygen is number one human need. 
with less oxygen than COVID-19 as soon as that, an individual suffocates and dies. Well, you ask this question, who produces the oxygen for Mother Earth? The three is, of course. If the world's rainforest reservoir were a global lung, we in Papua New Guinea have a significant proportion of this organ that keeps the world breathing. We also function as a great carbon sink. We have this significant asset for our planet. And I, as chair of the Coalition of Rainforest Nations, Papua New Guinea stands at an important crossroad. We are a net remover of the carbon from the atmosphere. The removal capacity from our forests is over 100 million tons per year. Our energy emissions at present is really around 10 million a year. Therefore, if the read plus mechanisms delivers at, as it should be, Papua New Guinea can remain where every country needs to be by 2050 under the Paris Agreement, a net remover of carbon from the atmosphere. The preservation and conservation plus sustainable harvest and use of forest resources can be our commitment to you all for the upkeep of Earth, heading the red cord humanity that was called by our good Secretary General Guterres. The recent intergovernment panel on climate change sixth assessment report is crystal clear that human actions are the cause of the worsening climate crisis. We must take action to change this trajectory. We have long said that climate change is serious, it's a very serious existential threat to our national security and well being. Therefore, the climate security nexus reality must and cannot continue to be denied by the Security Council, as it would be dereliction of duty to all people worldwide on the part of the Council. We welcome the increasing support the Council on this important agenda. Mr. President, let me also welcome and commend the excellent leadership and efforts by the United Kingdom as COP26 President-designate, Italy also as the co-host of COP26, and the United Nations Secretary General in rallying the international community to take bold decisions and practical measures necessary to deliver on the Paris Agreement commitments. I cannot overstate the agency and the ambitious actions needed under the Paris Agreement to undo the serious damage humanity has caused to planet Earth. I will also continue to advocate strongly that responsibility must be assigned correctly, appropriately, and proportionately to the scale of damages done. Mr. President, during COP26, I will seek, or I will be seeking to progress a number of issues on behalf of Papua New Guinea and the wider Pacific blue economy. We must all commit to the energy targets, deal with the land use, and advocate for the preservation of biodiversity and be more bold in climate financing commitments. These issues, which are important to Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Island Forum countries, and we will be seeking support and advocacy from developed and industrialized countries to back our domestic and regional efforts towards adaptation and mitigation through global funding assistance. I will be seeking an understanding to build a special set of criteria that is simplified to enable us to qualify for financial support for our adaptation and mitigation strategies. Mr. President, I join the previous speakers in calling, for, calling on the international community to collectively meet our Paris Agreement obligations and submit individual nationally determined contributions without delay. Papua New Guinea was amongst the first countries to submit our NDC in 2020, outlining our goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. This plan includes drafting of our NDC plans, implementation plan rather, regulation and alignment of NDC, adaptation and the national adaptation plan, thanks to the support we received from the United Nations Development Program. We want to see a major carbon emitters in the industrialized nations to be very genuine and committed in their actions 
to fund climate change mitigation and adoption. Our failure in that regard is a denial of that responsibility. We wish to advocate also that the 100 billion annual commitment by developed countries to the developing nations on climate financing must be considered different from official development assistance. This will allow its guidelines to be sensitive to the climate change mitigation and adoption agenda and their specific requirement. For Papua New Guinea as a natural gas and oil exporting country, we are working towards ensuring our carbon footprints is minimized by implement, implementing our Sustainable Development Goal 13, Roadmap 2020 to 2030 on climate change launched last year. However, despite the multiple project submissions for climate financing, uh, Mr. President, Papua New Guinea has had little or limited success in accessing these funds except for technical assistance uh, in developing the fiduciary framework. This is quite disappointing, Mr. President. We need to see a more practical demonstration of genuine commitments, other forms of assistance towards climate change adaptation and mitigation must also be streamlined to lessen the increasing debt burdens in small island states to free up the required fiscal space to support the economic re recovery efforts from the COVID-19 pandemic and achieve sustainable development. I further call on member states to finalize a robust and fair carbon markets under the Paris rulebook to unlock a new financing stream that better accounts for the sustainable development interests of countries like my own. This will allow us to assign our development agenda under the different but appropriate financing opportunities, as long as the guidelines are appropriate but friendly to us. Mr. President, Papua New Guinea wants to achieve both conservation and development. In forestry, we have ceased issuance of new timber permits and renewal of existing ones and will achieve complete round log export ban by 2025. We want to move into value adding and downstream processing. We have adopted and designated a large conservation area in one of our provinces, uh, Northern Province to be exact, as a pilot program in part partnership with a regional environmental program which will give us the learning experience we need for further designations of conservation areas. We are also in the process of establishing NDC roadmap for agriculture, forestry, and other land use and energy sector. Mr. President, COVID-19 will continue to remain our biggest challenge. Our numbers are low in terms of both confirmed cases and, and fatalities at the moment. And one of the most concerning for us in Papua New Guinea is the rate of vaccinations, which is quite low. Our government took up necessary upfront ownership through the enactment of an appropriate legislation uh, in our national parliament, which we call the National Pandemic Act in 2020. This, together with very close working partnership with our valued development partners, including our Pacific family of nations through the Pacific Humanitarian Pathway on COVID-19 program, has given us much success. We cannot speak highly enough of such partnerships, including those through the COVAX facility and with the United Nations system, Australia, New Zealand, USA, Japan, China, European Union, UK, and the United Arab Emirates, which enable us to have immediate access to essential medical equipment and supplies, including the AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccines. We continue to welcome and encourage further strengthening of cooperative global efforts to allow access to the COVID-19 vaccines in countries where they are most needed. We advocate for global, global efforts in curbing misinformation that has resulted in low rates of vaccinations in our country, especially the Facebook misinformations that keep on going on in public space. It will truly support our efforts in building national advocacy and awareness in the efficacy and safety of COVID-19 vaccines a program ably supported by our development partners, including mostly notable the churches and the United Nations country office. We have to do all, do all of that while keep, keeping a very close eye on the general health sector 
of our country because we cannot afford to lose sight of the other aspects of health in our country. Our national health plan is ready to be launched except for the settlement of the financing plan that matches our health plan. It will encompass facility development, capacity building, pharmaceutical procurement, and development of primary, secondary, and tertiary health care, as well as building our provincial capacities and the requisite capacity building and education in as far as the health sector is concerned. Mr. President, economic management for us involves taking stock of where we were and building the right structures for re-engagement with our international partners and ensuring that right enablers are put in place to build a sustained, build and sustain a robust economy. It involves taking stock of our debt portfolios, reprioritizing our expenditures, and focusing on important reforms in the utility, utility sector, infrastructure, education, health, and of course, our natural resources. It also involves taking a closer look at specific projects in the extractive industry and working with the proponents to see them come on stream. And for the last two years, the bulk of our effort has or was to ensure that we achieved really a fine balance between the adherence to our COVID-19 protocols and requirements, but at the same time trying to find a balance between ensuring that our economy was opened and was functioning. Our work in the transparent stock take of our debt portfolios have resulted in attracting strong support from the World Bank, from the IMF, and has provided important platform for support from our bilateral partners like Australia and Japan, and for this we are truly very, very grateful. We acknowledge the support to us at this important time when COVID has hit us and our economy is struggling. We continue to advocate for the use of our natural resources, but the foundational tenet is that the development of these resources are to be done on the premises that all stakeholders have a shared interest in these developments. And these interests are to be fully satisfied within principles of equity and equality where we leave no one behind, especially a country like mine, which has many different et ethnicities that own a parcel of land in our country. A key area of focus is the substantive investment and development of quality economic infrastructures to link the provinces throughout my country and deliver important services to all our citizens countrywide and enhance their social economic opportunities. We have embarked on a very important Connect PNG program which is trying to connect our rural Papua New Guinea together and into one another which is building and expanding key infrastructure and assets such as national roads, wharves, jetties, airports, airstrips, and punching new road corridors and information and uh, telecommunication network and electricity access to the majority of our population. This is the stimulus for economic transformation of our people. This is done as required by our national constitution and uh, for uh, those who might need to know, Papua New Guinea was only independent as late as 1975. And this is totally in alignment with our national eight-point plan, our PNG Vision 2050, our development strategic plan 2010 to 2030, our medium-term plan 3, 2018 to 2022, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to better deliver social economic prosperity for the country. And we hope by this we would become a middle-income and in country by 2050. Mr. President, Growth for PNG continues to be off at the back of our petroleum and, and energy and the mining sector, which contributes around 60% of our gross domestic product. We continue to advocate for these developments to take place and do as much as we can and as hard as we can to advocate for important policies in those sectors. Our policies on developments in the extractive sector has begun to be cognizant of the diminishing financing envelope from external sources such as loans and grants. At the same time, we have had to move towards better management of our national public debt. We strongly recognize the importance of generating sufficient revenue from our own domestic sources to complement external budget support. 
for our national development priorities. As you would know, Mr. President, the General Assembly 2030 Agenda and the Addis Ababa Financing Development Framework calls for such. And it is in this spirit that my government has embarked on reviewing and reforming our legislation and policies in the resource sector to ensure appropriate levels of national content in projects and facilitate fair and equitable returns for all stakeholders with shared interests. At the same time, we continue to value and respect and uphold our partner partnership obligations with the private sector in our natural resource sector. And Mr. President, may I say we remain open for business and therefore welcome bona fide international invest investors to join us in exploring opportunities that are still available in my country. Mr. President, my country continues to enjoy partnership with important multilateral financial institutions. Let me take a moment to thank the World Bank. I thank IMF, I thank ADB, and of course our valued bilateral partners, including Australia, New Zealand, Japan, China, India, European Union, the United States, for supporting my government's development priorities. It would be remiss of me not to also acknowledge the excellent work undertaken under the leadership of the Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica and the United Nations Secretary General for financing for development need, needed particularly in developing countries to recover and build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. Our call Papua New Guinea strongly supports. Mr. President, my government has prioritized in investing in the agricultural sector as an engine of economic growth and prosperity for our country. The strategic interventions are a combination of credit scheme that we've engaged upon, freight and price subsidy for our rural farmers, which has helped broaden the scope and reach the agricultural production sites in our country. This will not only help broaden the tax base and generate additional revenue the country needs for development, but also, more importantly, improve our rural communities and their livelihood and enable them to be proactive in as far as our nation building is concerned. Our largely rural-based economy is dependent on subsistence agriculture. It is my government's desire to transform the agriculture sector into a reliable, commercial, and sustainable food system that will address food security and climate resilience, as well as conservation and management of our vast biodiversity. To support this, we have set targets to increase cash crop production by 30 percent and also increase livestock production by 30 percent by 2025 and develop taxation incentives for our local farmers. Additionally, this includes the formulation of an agriculture and livestock diversification plan by 2025 and our efforts to increase downstream processing by 30 percent in 2025 and ensure local landowners and provincial governments partic participate in the equity sharing and downstream business and the spin-offs that are associated with it. Mr. President, our efforts in the agricultural sector ties in well with the important global efforts under the United Nations Food System Summit convened virtually yesterday by the United Nations Secretary General. For Papua New Guinea, we have identified five key priority actions that forms our national pathway to transform our food systems in ways that will build a sustainable, equitable, resilient, and healthier food system in our country. These details were said in our national statement at the Food System Summit yesterday evening. However, I would underline that my country, with its arable and abundant land, has the potential to serve as a food basket for Asia, Pacific region, and beyond, particularly at a time when food security around the world is now being threatened by the ravages of climate change, sea level rise, and the other crises. We therefore welcome multi-stakeholder partnership and investment to transform our organic food systems to support address the global challenges relating to hunger, poverty, malnutrition, food security that fosters better health outcomes for our people and the communities and to deliver on the SDGs. Mr. President, in the energy sector, we recognize the importance of energy transition to renewable sources to move significantly away from fossil fuels and to options including hydro, solar, wind, 
and geothermal energy. We also have options to clean gas energy. Our government has since 2018, under the auspices of the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation, we have been working with our development partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and USA to be exact, on the Papua New Guinea electrification program. This is intended to provide reliable and affordable renewable energy to over 70% of the unreached households in our country by 2030. Enormous development outcomes right on this program for our people. We have stuck partnership with the International Solar Alliance and International Renewable Energy, energy Agency. And let me also say a private sector has come on board, the Fortescue Metal Group, uh, the subsidiary, the Fortescue Future Industries, to strengthen our renewable energy transformation options in geothermal and hydropower energy space. Our energy transformation will come about when the National Energy Authority is fully established. It is a very strategic act we took on early this year to separate the regulatory uh, from uh, the responsibilities from uh, the generation of power. And we hope that in the not too distant future, this authority of us will regulate the energy space to allow for more facilitate more investments and developments into the different energy, especially the clean energy sources that we advocate. Mr. President, we want to recapitalize on the energy space and to ensure that clean energy becomes uh, Papua New Guinea's main driving force. Mr. President, the virtual, virtual first ever high level dialogue on energy convened today by yourself or the Secretary General to accelerate efforts in implementing the SDG 7 on energy related goals and targets for sustainable development is the most timely and needed in as far as Papua New Guinea is concerned. It resonates very well with my government development priority and we look forward to harnessing the 10-year action plan under the global roadmap to attain SDG 7 by 2030 and further explore joining an energy compact to support SDG 7 achievement by 2030, emissions by the year 2050. Mr. President, as a maritime nation with a maritime zone spanning over 2.4 million square kilometers, the ocean agenda is of immense importance to my country, and not only for the living and non-living resources, but for, but for the value added they bring to our national assets but also, more importantly, for our own identity and our own way of life as a people and nation of the seas. My government is also prioritizing and strengthening the management, the governance, and security of our maritime zones under our National Oceans Policy 2020 to 2030, which was adopted in July 2020. To further complement this, my government also officially launched last year our 10-year National Fisheries Strategic Plan 2021 to 2020, which provides the roadmap and vision for a broad-based fishery sector and industry that is inclusive and environmentally sustainable and globally competitive and promotes food security. Furthermore, it addresses issues including prevention of illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing in our country and the neighboring Pacific waters. And it also talks about domestic downstream, downstream processing that are, enables our people as resource owners to be meaningfully involved in the economic opportunities our sea resources brings. We call on countries within our region to be responsible in that regard. Mr. President, I am pleased to say that my government adopted and launched the country's Marine Protected Areas Policy and the National Action Plan of Action for stingrays, skates, and sacks in June 2021. This policy will strengthen our efforts to better protect our marine resources because we are an epicenter for global marine resource and biodiversity. We are grateful for the support from the Global Environmental Facility and UNDP as valued development partners. In doing so, this will assist us to reach the biodiversity actually target level to have 17% of our terrestrial and inland water areas 
and 10% of our coastal and marine areas protected, which we remain committed to. It is in this context, and also with the devastating wildfires and catastrophic climate change events around the world impacting adversely on biodiversity, that we look forward to a successful outcome of the 15th Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity that will be staged in China next month. We therefore join the growing global call for an ambitious and transformational post-2020 global biodiversity framework that can help us implement fully our national commitments to protect biodiversity and sustainably use them for our sustainable development and also meeting the SDGs. Mr. President, regionally I am pleased to join my fellow leaders of the Pacific Island Forum in heralding our milestone regional declaration on preserving our maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise, which was adopted last month. As large states within our blue Pacific continent and the advent of the devastation consequences of the runaway climate change and the rising sea level rise that continues to threaten our countries and the people's security and lives and livelihoods and sovereignty, this declaration preserves our maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise. It also upholds the integrity of our long-standing commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas as the global legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas must be carried out. We therefore welcome the support of all United Nations member states and the international community to our landmark declaration. My earlier remark on climate change gives us the basis to call for those support and actions. Mr. President, in terms of peace building, my government recognizes the fundamental role the United Nations plays in supporting sustainable development and peace building. It is therefore incumbent on the United Nations to ensure that we continue to adapt the existing multilateral arrangements, including the United Nations Peace Building Architecture, the Security Council, the Peace Building Commissions, and the Secretary General's Action for Peace Initiative and the Peace Building Fund to make them relevant under evolving global circumstances to better foster and sustain global, regional, national peace and security. For us, our continuing engagements with the Peace Building Commission and the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund in recent years and from which we have been beneficiary further strengthens the hand of national peace and security through peace by peaceful means. This is especially true on our Bougainville Peace Agreement process for our Bougainville region and in the new initiative on peace building and sustaining peace in our two other provinces in my country. Mr. President, uh, I am pleased to announce the Bougainville Peace process continues to remain a top priority of my government. In this context, I would like to inform this August Hall that following the referendum in 2019, my government and the autonomous Bougainville government have held the second post-referendum consultation and the joint supervisory board just three months ago where several very important decisions to move the peace process forward were agreed upon. This included the reaffirmation of both parties to our, our commitment to the Bougainville Peace Agreement, the importance of a peaceful dialogue on the way forward guided by the country's constitutional and parliamentary processes, including the respect to the outcome of the 2019 referendum, which includes the ag agreement to transfer all agreed powers and a joint road roadmap to guide the post-referendum process. Mr. President, there is a clear recognition by both parties that much more work remains to be done in this critical phase and that constructive dialogue, our mutual understanding and partnership is crucial for a lasting political settlement to the autonomous region of Bougainville, and let me place on record my appreciation for United Nations in their help and leadership or assistance on the Bougainville uh, issue that faces Papua New Guinea. My government is also realistic about the capacity challenges and successful peace building and in our efforts to sustaining peace. The continued support and partnership of the Peace Building Commission 
the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund and the wider United Nations system and other development partners will be vital to ensure dividends of peace is said and becomes long-lasting. I do acknowledge the strong support by the United Nations in chairing the consultation process and the supporting initial engagement of a moderator for these talks to take place. I would also like to put on record our sincere appreciation to our valued bilateral and multilateral development partners, and again, including Australia, European Union, uh, Japan, China, Germany, Ireland, New Zealand, in the United States, the United Kingdom, and the entire United Nations systems for their continuing commitment and support towards the Bougainville peace process and the recent initiative in the two provinces uh, in the highlands part of our country to look forward to a better work with all development partners on this important priority that my government is undertaking. Whilst commenting on the United Nations on the peace effort in Papua New Guinea, I would also like to recall the Pacific Island Leaders Forum decision in 2019 and the outstanding visit by United Nations Human Rights Mechanism to address the alleged human rights concerns in our regional neighborhood. This visit is very important to ensure that the greater peoples of the region have peace within their respective sovereignties and their rights and cultural dignities are fully preserved and maintained. Mr. President, we also have a long recognized that our sustainable development efforts will be in vain if we do not safeguard our women and girls in their human rights and uh, preservation of the dignity and provide them opportunities to be equal development partners for nation building. This is, my, this is why my government has prioritized gender equality and empowerment opportunities with policies, laws and strategies and we have set in place among others the gender-based violence strategy from 2016 to 2025 and the Family Protection Act and provided that this demographic segment of our economy, specific economic opportunities to be engaged in entrepreneurial activities to empower our women and our girls. This initiative takes into account of all our international commitments and obligations under relevant international frameworks, notably the Beijing Platform for Action. We recognize that much work remains to be done but we are determined and committed to do what is right for our women and our girls as our country's future prosperity and security also depends on how we treat them today and into the future. This is clearly demonstrated recently by the groundswell of support to combat and end these codes of gender-based violence in the country. I am pleased to note that this year my government, with the support of the parliamentarians, to end gender-based violence, established uh, by Partition Special Parliamentary Committee on Gender-Based Violence to enquire into gender-based violence in the country and propose recommendations and measures to combat and end these scourge of gender-based violences. A report of this important work has been tabled in Parliament and we are working towards implement implementing it. This will complement the work done under a European Union-led and, U Europe and uh, United Nations uh, Supported Spotlight Initiative for Ending Violence Against Women and Children, which was jointly launched when the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, uh, Ms. Amina Mohammed, in March of 2020, visited Port Mosby. I really want to thank Her Excellency for this visit. It was not only a visit to the capital city, but she did step out into rural Papua New Guinea. We are also embarking on the administrative measures for quotas for women representation in our national parliament. The inadequate representation of women in parliamentary is a continuing concern for us in Papua New Guinea. We are optimistic to set in motion this initiative at our next general election schedule for July 2022. These are but some of the key issues my government is now working in our third cycle universal period period periodic review uh, re report to be presented to the Human Rights Council in November of 2021. Mr. President, before I conclude, I would like to reiterate our call on the General Assembly to do better in delivering on the reforms of the United Nations Security Council. 
This important organ entrusted with the international community's peace and security with its archaic representation and working methods is in dire need of an overhaul to ensure it meets with today's reality. We are concerned that it has been nearly 12 long years now since the first round of the intergovernmental negotiations for the reforms of the Security Council and the costs kept keep on escalating for countries like ours. Despite all the extensive efforts on the five agreed elements of the IGN package, it still does not have any formal status to this date. For my delegation, a single consolidated document now and not in the and in determinate feature is indeed needed for real negotiations to pave way for the reforms of the Security Council. The importance of this cannot be overstated. We reiterate our call on the fundamental point. I also recognize as I close the important reality checked by the Secretary General Guterres in his call for action on the common agenda. The Secretary General's proposals and recommendations for call for a robust United Nations system, uh, it has our full support. But we cannot progress the common agenda without dealing with the system that will carry it. And I thank you, Mr. President, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Under your presidency, we hope our planet can be a place and a better place for all. We have a hope that no one will be left behind. God bless you all. God bless our planet. Planet Earth. Thank you very much for the opportunity. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister for Bougainville Affairs of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Savia Betel, Prime Minister, Minister of State, Minister for Communications and Media, and Minister for Religious Affairs of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Xavier Battel, Prime Minister, Minister of State, Minister for Communications and Media, and Minister for Religious Affairs of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Mr. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I must say that I'm particularly moved to be speaking to you here today. I recall that last year we all had to speak to each other through computer screens, unable to interact and be unable to react. And in my message, I expressed the hope that we would soon be able to see each other in person. We are doing that now, even if it is in hybrid mode, but we are seeing each other. We're coming closer together. And if we are now able to speak from this rostrum, it is thanks to the devotion, the perseverance, and the ingenuity of all of those who have worked tirelessly over the past year and a half to stem slowly but surely the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm referring to the scientists, the researchers, the doctors, the healthcare personnel, and all of those who made it possible for us to survive. And who could have known 12 months ago that many effective vaccines against the coronavirus would have been developed so quickly so that we could get together. New York, which was hard hit by the pandemic this week, has yet again become the capital for multilateral diplomacy and action. However, we do note that many statements are being delivered 
by video and events are taking p place virtually. So that's proof that we will not be returning to the pre-COVID conditions anytime soon. We all know full well the pandemic is dragging on and its socioeconomic impact is still being felt by all of our peoples. 4.5 million people have succumbed to the virus. 124 million people have now been plunged into extreme poverty. School children have lost more than 1.8 billion hours of in-person learning due to the pandemic. Mr. President, I'll speak about hope a little later on, but education is part of the hope that many people have. So the pandemic has forced us to recognize the urgent need to change the way we do things. Business, as usual, is no longer an option. We must bolster, bolster our collective action within the multilateral system with, of course, the United Nations at the very heart. Mr. President, Luxembourg congratulates you on your election, and you can count on the support of our delegation in carrying out your very important mandate, and I thank you very much for taking the time this morning to have an exchange with me and to allow me to speak about hope, which I will address a little later on in my statement. You determined the theme for this assembly should be one of hope, and I think that's a wise choice. It's a wise choice because today we hear news that gives us countless reasons to lose hope. The pandemic is ever present. We hear the statistics as soon as we get up in the morning, how many people have gone to hospital, how many people are sick. We have ongoing crises and conflicts. I'll just mention two of them, the crisis in Afghanistan where the takeover of the country by the Taliban is jeopardizing progress achieved in the past 20 years in terms of democratic governance and development and human rights, in particular for Afghan women and girls. And what can be said of the climate crisis? Its devastating fallout has spared no country. This morning I spoke with you and I spoke with other colleagues about uh, the climate crisis. It's one of very survival. We've faced severe weather events, tornadoes and flooding, but other countries are facing, are dealing with their very existence and that will depend on the choices that we make here. So it would be irresponsible for us to resign ourselves to this fate because we must have hope. There is reason to hope. Hope should inspire us to act and to respond. The time for blah, blah is, is over. We must act and react. Hope springs eternal, as the saying goes, but in order to survive, we must breathe life into hope. If we don't have hope, people will stop believing in anything. We have to take concrete action which will allow for de facto solidarity, as Robert Schuman said in the Declaration on Rebuilding Europe. As political leaders, we must act together with determination to meet these global challenges together. The closure of borders, uh, the building of walls, for example, we have to stop thinking of all of that. That's not the answer. We know that we do not have all the answers as governments. We must in order to succeed, we must work together with private sector stakeholders, civil society, and our citizens, and in particular our youth, who are rightly worried about the decisions that we're taking today, or our non-action, if you will. They're worried about their future. Our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has appealed to us to do just that, and I thank him for his action, and I renew my congratulations to him and my sincere wishes for success during his second mandate at the helm of our organization. In our common agenda, he has outlined our responsibilities, and I agree with him when he says that we're at a turning point in history. My country is a founding member of the UN, and for many years we've been committed to multilateralism and to world order based on the rule of law. And today my country is prepared to respond to the Secretary General's appeal to create a more robust, more effective, more inclusive, and more 
networked multilateral system. This is the only way to safeguard peace and security, sustainable development in all its aspects, including health, respect for the rule of law and human rights. The pandemic has forced us to make difficult choices, to act quickly, not always certain that we had the right response to tackle such unprecedented circumstances. We have all learned on the job. We realize that certain decisions should have been taken yesterday or the day before yesterday, and we have decisions that we need to take today. We are pleased to see that the scientific community has moved forward. When I spoke earlier about this self-centeredness, this uh, the walls that we build, if every country were to keep that information just to, for their own country, how much we would miss in not having these changes. Of course, a change is not easy, uh, in particular if some countries around us are doing the opposite. Uh, working with Belgium, France, and Germany, we called each other. We said, well, well, let's try this, let's do this, let's do that. We need to exchange. And we've been able to uh, convince many more people to become vaccinated. We have some 75% of people over the age of 12 who are vaccinated in Luxembourg. More than 6 billion doses of the vaccine have been administered to date. That is an impressive figure. It's true, but it still falls far short. We need 11 billion doses to exceed the 70% threshold of vaccinated people worldwide in order to get beyond the most acute phase of the pandemic because we are not yet safe from more contagious variants and mutations of the virus. They are frightening. And access to vaccines is not equal. The Secretary General has reminded us uh, that uh, if we do not tackle this issue now, we will never get out of it. We understand the importance of vaccine solidarity. Last year and this year, as a country, we contributed some 2 million euros to the COVAX mechanism for global access to COVID-19 vaccines, vaccines. In July, my government decided we would share 350,000 doses of vaccine with partner developing countries in Africa and Asia. And on September 13th, the first batch was deliver delivered. Luxembourg provided 56,000 doses of vaccine to Cape Verde, along with medical material to administer the vaccine through a European civil protection mechanism. Uh, we can still see the images in our mind when people didn't have enough ventilators. We could see these ventilators, uh, the masks uh, on the tarmacs of, of airports. We knew uh, that we had to do something in order to get this material where it was needed. That's a very sad image to keep in our minds. We were able to buy ventilators enough so that we can share them with others. We've done so with India, Nepal, and Tunisia, and we're providing refrigerators for vaccine storage to Laos, Sudan, Burkina Faso, and Senegal. And we are continuing to provide international solidarity to combat the pandemic. Also, I had the opportunity to stress that point during the summit organized the day before yesterday by President Biden. I have every hope we'll overcome the pandemic if we work together, if we count on solidarity in science, and also if we're able to halt the spread of misinformation which still exists, and it's uh, fueled by social media uh, through uh, social networks and through Facebook. That fuels anti-vaccine skepticism. There are many people who still have questions, who still have doubts, and we need to reassure them. We mustn't stigmatize them. We will not be able to vaccinate 100% of the people. There are, will always be people who do not want to be vaccinated. But for those who still have doubts, we should answer their questions and not put them in the corner. They must learn along with us. And today, in order to stem the spread of misinformation, we need to react. There's a role for the press to play fake news should not uh, be leading the news media. We must have increased cooperation with other member states 
and the independent panel established by the Director General of the WHO has made some useful recommendations in this area. Mr. President, six years ago, we concluded a historic agreement in Paris. As I said earlier, climate change since then has shown that we must make even greater contributions and go even further in implementing our commitments. We can't uh, continue to make commitments and not follow through. If we remain on the current path, the temperature will rise 2.7 uh, degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So we must limit global warming to 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels. This morning we had an exchange, Mr. President, about the fallout of global warming for some. Some countries tomorrow may not even exist. If the ice continues to melt, I have Belgium, France, I have other countries around me, but imagine if you come from a small country, if we don't all act together, your country could actually disappear. How would, how could that, would that be? I am. I believe the European Union has made a strong commitment, and I'm very grateful for that. And we thank people who've come, who came to the Paris Agreement, and who will continue to work. Some countries who no longer wish to be part of the Paris Agreement will ha ha be count that will be counteractive. All of those countries who have stayed with the Paris Agreement, thank you very much. It is important to reduce the net greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55 percent. And in Luxembourg, we now have a policy. We have more than doubled our renewable energy production over the past five years. We also must keep our word to developing countries and help them bolster their capacity to manage the effects of climate change. My country has decided to double its international climate financing, bringing it up to 200 million euros from 2021 to 2025. And I can tell you that for Luxembourg, this climate financing is above and beyond our official development aid for which we continue to earmark at least 1% of our GDP. I've been a prime minister since 2013. Over the past eight years, people have often said to me, do you think it, it's still worthwhile to maintain that 1% of our GDP? And I say yes. It's true that some people say, well, you have problems at home as well. But to cut aid to countries most in need, that would be selfish. Defending cooperation in your own countries and uh, not sharing with others, wanting to help others, would be wrong. Mr. President, COP26 will take place uh, soon in Glasgow. This will be a moment of truth, and I hope that we will all be there and will take decisions to safeguard the right of future generations to live in a healthy environment. When I speak about youth, UNICEF estimates that more than one billion children are exposed to climate shocks, President. The climate crisis is therefore also a crisis to the rights of the child. And in this context, my country is particularly proud to be a member of the School Meals Coalition, as I mentioned the day before yesterday at the UN Food Systems Summit. Effective school meal programs are an intelligent investment in future generations because they create opportunities, particularly for young girls and women. Human rights are put to the test every day due to the climate crisis and the pandemic and also due to wars and conflicts which give rise to unconscionable crimes in Afghanistan, in the Sahel, in the Near East, Syria, Yemen, in Ethiopia. Promoting human rights nationally and internationally is a priority for us and we want to continue to shoulder our responsibilities in this area and that is why my country has submitted its candidacy to serve on the Human Rights Council from 2022 to 2024. This will be our first term as a member of the Council. And if we are honored to be elected by this Assembly to the Human Rights Council during voting next month, I can assure you that my country will protect and promote the rights of all human beings in a spirit of dialogue and cooperation. We intend to work closely with the UN human rights mechanisms, and we are committed to hearing the voices of civil society, which is essential to the very functioning of the Council and the UN. We have four priorities which are reflected in our voluntary pledges and commitments. Firstly, supporting the rule of law, civic space, human rights, defenders, and combating impun impunity. I reaffirm our support for the International Criminal Court and the follow-up and investigations mechanisms with 
within the United Nations. Secondly, a human rights-based approach to sustainable development and climate action. We recognize the importance of the right to development in our ambitious cooperation policies and climate action. Take account of the very strong link between the implementation of the Sustainable Development Program by 2030, combating climate change and respecting human rights worldwide. Thirdly, gender equality and combating all forms of discrimination. My country has a very strong uh, 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 policy on women. And uh, as we discussed uh, this morning, Mr. President, I'm sorry to keep recalling that, but we discussed a number of issues this morning. We are committed to ensuring their rights to the self-determination of women and girls. It's unfathomable today uh, that men in some countries of the world think they know better than women do. If that's the reality of our world today, that's terrible. If a man thinks that he knows better uh, and can make the decision for a woman, I'm speaking about health, education, sexual and reproductive rights. I think in 2021, it's really high time for us to, to make sure that every individual has the right to decide for him or herself. We are also working to protect the rights of LGBTI persons. Fourthly, we will continue to invest systematically in the rights of the child. Human rights are also human rights of migrants and refugees. Let us think for a moment of the pe about the people who were forced to flee Afghanistan, the jur journalists, the human rights defenders, judges, prosecutors, teachers, all of those who, because of their activities, whom we asked to be our partners, who are now directly threatened. We cannot leave them. Uh, let's not let them down. They were our partners. They've been our partners. And I'm very pleased that the European uh, Union will be holding a conference on resettling vulnerable Afghans at the request of Luxembourg primarily. Uh, that will be done in the coming months by the European Commission. We recognize that there are tensions uh, between states and there's a serious crisis of confidence. I'm not too reassured by hearing colleagues uh, over the past uh, few days, it's really up to us to create dialogue. We have to restore trust. We have to give hope to dialogue among countries uh, and with the countries with whom we have contacts so that we can avoid conflicts for not just uh, future generations, but today's generation. Turning to the Secretary General's proposal to have a new uh, contract, we are prepared to lend a helping hand to restore trust and respect for international law. And of course, we need to ensure lasting peace. We're also prepared to help reshape the United Nations to make it better able to play its pivotal role in multilateral cooperation. Change is never easy. But we must not resign ourselves to say, well, sim since it's too hard to do, let's do nothing. We must, uh, we support calls to improve the General Assembly and reform the Security Council to make it more representative, more effective, and more accountable to all member states. Mr. President, as I said, there is reason to hope. There's reason to persevere. Let's not give up. Let's act. Let's cooperate to overcome the challenges facing humanity. You know, I've never known war. I've never seen conflict. I'm part of that generation. On my continent, other individuals have not been so lucky. And we owe it to those who have given their lives defending values. There's an American cemetery uh, full of American soldiers who didn't even know uh, where Luxembourg is, but they died so that I could live in democracy today. We need to find solutions together today. We should not relive the past. We owe it to everyone. When I speak about hope today in 2021, hope is not the same for everyone. In some countries, 
Some young people just hope to survive. For some, they hope to have an education. For some, they hope to have access to health care. Here, we are asking whether or not we should have a booster shot, and some people in other countries are asking whether or not they can get the first shot. Whether one is black or white, mixed race or Asian, that should not be an obstacle to social success. Is it, is it too much to say, well, I, this is the way I'm born, shouldn't I have the same hopes as other people do? Is it normal? I should be able to practice my religion without fearing reprisals. I should have the right to be a transgender, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and not be forced to live a secret life because others have determined what is sexually appropriate. Is that too much to ask? If I'm Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, Hindu, Protestant, should I, should I wonder whether or not I can practice my religion freely? Should I fear going into a mosque, into a church, into a synagogue? Hope today is something that depends on where a person is born, what a person's ethnic or origin, skin color, sexuality. Mr. President, if I have one hope, it is that the hopes uh, of mankind yesterday become the reality for future generations. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank Prime Minister, Minister of State, Minister for Communications and Media, and Minister for Religious Affairs of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Pakistan to introduce an address by the head of government. Mr. President, I have the great honor to introduce a recorded statement by His Excellency Mr. Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iyaka na'abadu wa iyaka na'astani. Mr. President, I congratulate you on assuming the presidency of the 76th session of the General Assembly. I also wish to express appreciation for the significant achievements of your predecessor, Volkan Boska, who guided the Assembly skillfully under the difficult circumstances imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, the world is facing triple challenge of the COVID-19, the accompanying economic crisis, and the threats posed by climate change. The virus does not discriminate between nations and people, nor do the catastrophes imposed by uncertain weather patterns. The common threats faced by us today not only expose the fragility of the international system, they also underscore the oneness of humanity. By the grace of Almighty Allah, Pakistan has been successful so far in containing the COVID pandemic. Our collaborated strategy of smart lockdowns helped save lives and livelihoods and kept the economy afloat. Over 15 million families survived through a social protection program of SAS. Mr. President, climate change is one of the primary existential threats that our planet faces today. Pakistan's contribution to global emissions is negligible, yet we are among the 10 most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change in the world. Being fully aware of our global responsibilities, we have embarked upon game-changing environmental programs, reforesting Pakistan through our 10 billion tree tsunami, preserving natural habitats, switching to re renewable energy, removing pollution from our cities, and adapting 
to the impacts of climate change. To address the triple crisis of COVID pandemic, economic downturn, and climate emergency, we need a, a comprehensive strategy that should include, number one, vaccine equity. Everyone, everywhere, must be vaccinated against COVID and as soon as possible. Two, adequate financing must be made available to developing countries. This can be ensured through comprehensive debt restructuring, expanded ODA, redistribution of unutilized SDRs, and allotment of a greater proportion of SDRs to developing countries. And finally, provision of climate finance. Three, we must adopt clear investment strategies which help alleviate poverty, promote job creation, build sustainable infrastructure, and of course, bridge the digital divide. I propose that the Secretary General convene an SDG summit in 2025 to review and accelerate implementation of sustainable development goals. Mr. President, because of the plunder of the developing world by their corrupt ruling elites, the gap between the rich and the poor countries is increasing at an alarming speed. Through this platform, I've been drawing the world's attention towards the scourge of illicit financial flows from developing countries. The Secretary General's high-level panel of financial accountability, transparency and integrity, called the FACTI panel, has calculated that a staggering $7 trillion in stolen assets are parked in financial haven destinations. This organized theft and illegal transfer of assets has profound consequences for the developing nations. It depletes the already meager resources, accentuates the levels of poverty, especially when laundered money puts pressure on the currency and leads to its devaluation. At the current rate, when the FACTI panel estimates that a trillion dollars every year is taken out of, of the developing world, there will be a mass exodus of economic migrants towards the richer nations. What the East India Company did to India, the crooked ruling elites are doing to the developing world, plundering the wealth and transferring it to Western capitals and offshore tax havens. And Mr. President, retrieving the stolen assets from the developed countries is impossible for poor nations. The rich countries have no incentives or compulsion to return this ill-gotten Ill wealth. And this ill-gotten wealth belongs, remember, to the masses of the developing world. I foresee in the not too distant future, a time will come when the rich countries will be forced to build walls to keep out economic migrants from these poor countries. I fear a few wealthy islands in the sea of poverty will also turn into a global calamity like climate change. The General Assembly must take steps meaningfully to address this deeply disturbing and morally repugnant situation, naming and shaming the haven destinations and developing a comprehensive legal framework to halt and reverse the illicit financial flows are most critical actions to stop this great economic injustice. And at a minimum, the recommendations of the Secretary General's FACTI panel should be fully implemented. Mr. President, Islamophobia is another pernicious phenomenon that we all need to collectively combat. 
in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, terrorism has been associated with Islam by some quarters. This has increased the tendency of right-wing xenophobic and violent nationalist extremists and terrorist groups to target Muslims. The UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy has recognized these emerging threats. We hope the Secretary General's report will focus on these new threats of terrorism posed by Islamophobes and right-wing extremists. I call on the Secretary General to convene a global dialogue on countering the rise of Islamophobia. Our parallel efforts at the same time should be to promote interfaith harmony and they should continue. Mr. President, the worst and most pervasive form of Islamophobia now rules India. The hate-filled Hinduvta ideology propagated by the fascist RSS BJP regime has unleashed a reign of fear and violence against India's 200 million Muslim strong community. Mob lynching by cow vigilantes, frequent pogroms such as the one in New Delhi last year, discriminatory citizenship laws to purge India of Muslims, and a campaign to destroy mosques across India and obliterate its Muslim heritage and history are all part of this criminal enterprise. New Delhi has also embarked on what it ominously calls the final solution for Jammu and Kashmir dispute. It has undertaken a series of illegal and unilateral measures in occupied Jammu and Kashmir since 5th August 2019. It has unleashed a reign of terror by an occupation force of 900,000. It has jailed senior Kashmiri leadership, imposed a, a clampdown on media and internet, violently suppressed peaceful protest, abducted 13,000 young Kashmiris and tortured hundreds of them. It has extrajudicially killed hundreds of innocent Kashmiris in fake encounters and imposed collective punishments by destroying entire neighborhoods and villages. We had unveiled a detailed dossier on gross and systematic violations of human rights by the Indian security forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. This repression is accompanied by illegal efforts to change the demographic structure of the occupied territory and transform it from a Muslim majority into a Muslim minority. Indian actions violate the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council on Jammu and Kashmir. They clearly prescribe, the resolutions clearly prescribe that the final disposition of the disputed territory should be decided by its people through a free and impartial plebiscite held under the UN auspices. India's action in occupied Jammu and Kashmir also violate international human rights and humanitarian laws, including the Fourth Geneva Convention, and amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is unfortunate, very unfortunate, that the world's approach to violations of human rights lack even-handedness and even are selective geopolitical considerations or corporate interests, commercial interests, often compel major powers to overlook the transgressions of their affiliated countries. Such double standards and the most glaring in case of India, where this RSS BJP regime is being allowed to get away with human rights abuses with complete immunity. The most recent example of Indian barbarity was the forcible snatching of the mortal remains of the great Kashmiri leader, Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, from his family, denying him a proper Islamic funeral and burial in accordance with his wishes and the Muslim tradition. Devoid of any legal or moral sanction, this action has been against the basic norms of human decency. 
I call on this General Assembly to demand that Sayyid Gilani's mortal remains be allowed to be buried in the Cemetery of Martyrs with the appropriate Islamic rights. Mr. President, Pakistan desires peace with India as with all its neighbors. But sustainable peace in South Asia is contingent upon resolution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute in accordance with the relevant United Nations Security Council re resolutions and the wishes of the Kashmiri people. Last February, we reaffirmed the two 2003 ceasefire understanding along the line of control. The hope was that it would lead to a rethink of the strategy in Delhi. Sadly, the BJP government has intensified repression in Kashmir and conti continues to vitiate the environment by these barbaric acts. The onus remains on India to create a conducive environment for meaningful and result-oriented engagement with Pakistan. And for that, it must do, number one, reverse its unilateral and illegal measures instituted since 5th August 2019. Secondly, stop its oppression and human rights violations against the people of Kashmir. And three, halt and reverse the demographic changes in the occupied territory. It is also essential to prevent another conflict between Pakistan and India. India's military buildup, development of advanced nuclear weapons, and acquisition of destabilizing conventional capabilities can erode mutual deterrence between the two countries. And now, Mr. President, I want to talk about Afghanistan. The current situation in Afghanistan, for some reason, Pakistan has been blamed for the turn of events by politicians in the United States and some politicians in Europe. From this platform, I want them all to know the country that suffered the most, apart from Afghanistan, was Pakistan when we joined the U.S. war on terror after 9-11. 80,000 Pakistanis died. $150 billion was lost to our economy. There were three and a half million internally displaced Pakistanis. And why did this happen? In the 80s, Pakistan was a frontline state in fighting against the occupation of Afghanistan. Pakistan and the United States trained Mujahideen groups to fight for the liberation of Afghanistan. Amongst those Mujahideen groups, Al-Qaeda, various groups from all over the world, they were Mujahideen, Afghan Mujahideen. These were considered heroes. President Ronald Reagan invited them to White House in 1983. And according to news items, he compared them to the founding fathers of the United States. They were heroes. Come 1989, the Soviets leave. So do the Americans, abandon Afghanistan. Pakistan is, was left with five million Afghan refugees. We were left with sectarian militant groups which never existed before. But the worst cut of it was that a year later, Pakistan was sanctioned by the US. We felt used. Fast forward 9-11, Pakistan is needed again by the US because now the US-led coalition is now invading Afghanistan and it could not happen without Pakistan providing all the logistical support. What happened after that? The same Mujahideen that we had trained that fighting foreign occupation was a sacred duty, a holy war or jihad, they turned against us. We were called collaborators. They declared jihad on us. Then all along the tribal belt bordering Afghanistan, the Pakistan semi-autonomous tribal belt, 
where no Pakistan army had been since our independence. They had strong sympathies with, with the Taliban, Afghan Taliban, not because of their religious ideology, but because of Pashtun nationalism, which is very strong. Then there were three million Afghan refugee, refugees still in Pakistan, all Pashtuns, living in camps, 500,000, the biggest camp, 100,000 camps. They all had affinity and sympathies with the, with the Afghan Taliban. So what happened? They too turned against Pakistan. For the first time, we had militant Taliban in Pakistan. And they called, and they too attacked Pakistan government. When our army went in to, in the tribal areas for the first time in our history, whenever an army goes into civilian areas, they are, there's collateral damage. So there was collateral damage, which multiplied the militants to seek revenge. But not just that. The world must know that Pakistan, in Pakistan, there were 480 drone attacks conducted by the U.S. 480 drone attacks. And we all know that drone attacks are not that precise. They cause more collateral damage than the, than the militants they are targeting. So, who did the people who were, who were whose relatives were being killed, who did they seek revenge against Pakistan? Between 2004 and 2014, there were 50 different militant groups attacking the state of Pakistan. At one point, people, people like us were worried that will we survive this? There were bombs going all over Pakistan. Our capital was like a fortress. Had it not been for one of the most disciplined army in the world and one of the best intelligence agencies in the world, I, I think Pakistan would have gone down. So when we hear this at the end, the, there's a lot of worry about use in the US about taking care of the people who helped them, the interpreters and everyone who helped the US. What about us? The only reason we suffered so much was because we became an ally of the U.S., of the coalition in the war against Afghanistan, where there were attacks being conducted from Afghan soil into Pakistan. At least there should have been a, a word of appreciation. But rather than appreciation, imagine how we feel when we are blamed for, for this, the turn of events in Afghanistan after 2006 it became apparent to everyone who understood Afghanistan and Af Afghanistan's history that the, there would be no military solution in Afghanistan. I went to the US, I spoke to think tanks, I met President, uh, at the time Senator Biden, Senator John Kerry, Senator Harry Reid. I tried to explain to them that there would not be any military solution and political settlement was the way to go forward. No one understood then. And unfortunately, in trying to force a military solution is where U.S. went wrong. And if today, if and if today, the world needs to know why the Taliban are back in power, all the world has to do is do a deep analysis of why 300,000 well-equipped Afghan army, and remember Afghans are one of the bravest nations on earth. Why did this 300,000 Afghan army give up without a fight? The, the moment a deep analysis of this is done, the world would know why the Taliban are back in power and it's not because of Pakistan. So Mr. President, right now, the whole world community should think, what is the way ahead? There are two paths we can take. If we neglect Afghanistan right now, according to the UN, half, half the people of Afghanistan are already vulnerable. And by next year, 
almost 90% of people in Afghanistan will go below the poverty line. There's a huge humanitarian crisis looming ahead. And this will have serious repercussions, not just for the neighbors of Afghanistan, but it will have repercussions everywhere if a destabilized, a chaotic Afghanistan again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. The reason why the US came to, to Afghanistan in the first place. So therefore, there is only one way to go. We must strengthen this current government, stabilize it for the sake of the people of Afghanistan. What have the Taliban promised? They will respect human rights. They will have an inclusive government. They will not allow the soil to be used by terrorists. And they have given amnesty. Now, if the world community incentivizes them, encourages them to walk this talk, it will be a win-win situation for everyone. Because these are the four things that in Doha, when the US was talking to the Taliban, these were the conditions they were, the dialogue was all about. So if the world can uh, incentivize them to go this direction, then after all, this 20 year of, uh, of presence, of coalition presence in Afghanistan would not be wasted because Afghan soil would not be used for international terrorism. So I end my talk, uh, Mr. President, by urging everyone that this is a critical time for Afghanistan. You cannot waste time. Help is needed there. Humanitarian assistance has to be given there immediately. And uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has taken bold steps. I urge you to mobilize the international community and move in this direction. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan for the statement uh, just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Irakli Garibashvili, Prime Minister of Georgia. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Irakli Garibashvili, Prime Minister of Georgia. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, dear friends, on behalf of the Georgian people, it is an honor to speak here at the United Nations General Assembly. The UN provides each member state a platform to voice concerns and share its views about the most pressing challenges and opportunities of our time. Today, I bring the same Georgian spirit of cooperation and global engagement that motivated our country to join the UN after restoring independence 30 years ago. While our democratic nation may be young, our values and traditions are deeply rooted. We have survived and thrived through many cycles of history over thousands of years. Our history has helped forge a tough, proud, and resilient people, open to the world and finding our own way forward. Georgia is a diamond in the rough, still seeking to sharpen our edges to reveal the full potential of the nation. Situated at the crossroads of civilizations, where East meets West and North meets South, Georgia has always adjusted to meet new challenges at every turn in our past. I applaud the UN for going ahead with this General Assembly during a global pandemic. Rather than not meeting, we have acknowledged that a safe and responsible gathering is more important now than ever. The importance of this meeting cannot be understated. The world is still in a vicious fight against COVID-19. 
which has ravaged the globe and affected economies and livelihoods. As we continue our effort to build back better from the pandemic with a sense of unity, we have to come together to meet the needs of the world. Georgia is grateful to the United States, European Union, and China, as well as the vaccine producers who provided vaccines to safeguard the health of the Georgian people. Working in a common purpose, we will put an end to the pandemic and get back to the forging, to forging a better, brighter future for the entire world. I stand in front of you representing a country that is full of determination and faith. A country which is optimistic but always looks at its future through a pragmatic lens. I am proud of our membership in the UN and the work the UN does for humankind. I'm also very proud of my country and the work of the governing Georgian Dream Party to deliver a stronger democracy, a stronger economy, and a brighter future for our people. In bringing about the changes needed to keep pushing ahead, my government has a development plan, a clear vision for 2030 that aligns perfectly with the UN's 2030 agenda. We stand for a more sustainable environment, protecting the rights of all people, greater economic fairness and resilience, and a revitalized UN, among many other aspirations shared between Georgia and the United Nations. This sentiment of cooperation echoes the report of the Secretary General on our common agenda that outlines an ambitious plan for reinvigorated international cooperation and multilateralism. I believe this General Assembly should work on these recommendations in a determined and substantive way. Closer to home, Georgian dreams are becoming a reality. We have more than aspirations for the future. We aim to get the results our people demand today. Even with the deep setbacks from COVID-19, our economy is on the mend. Growth is surging. Jobs are being created. And we are once again one of the leading tourist destinations in the world. The world continues to recognize our democratic, economic, financial, and legal reforms. Some notable rankings demonstrate the spectacular strides Georgia has made to become one of the leading countries in the region and in promoting robust economic development. According to the World Bank, Georgia takes seventh position amongst 190 countries for ease of doing business. The Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom ranks us 12th amongst 184 countries. And according to the Fraser Institute's World Economic Freedom Ranking, Georgia ranks fifth out of 165 countries, an improvement of three steps in the last year. It is also important to note that great strides have also been made to advance anti-corruption measures, freedom of the press, and human rights. Earlier this week, we heard U.S. President Joseph Biden call for increased global cooperation to meet our largest challenges. In Georgia, we not only share this sentiment, but we have and always will step up to answer the call. We may be a small country, but we have made outsized contributions to international security, fighting alongside our allies against terrorism and organized crime around, around the globe. We did so in Afghanistan, where 32 brave soldiers gave their lives and numerous others were injured for the cause of freedom and peace. Recently, we provided a transportation and logistics hub for thousands of evacuees from Afghanistan and facilitated over 60 flights while also accepting workers from many global NGOs and IFIs to temporarily work out of Georgia. These actions underscore our response to the call for cooperation 
with our partners and the results that can be achieved when we work together. This summer, Georgia, alongside our United States partners, laid the groundwork for the release of 15 Armenian detainees by Azerbaijan. At the same time, Armenia provided maps for mine territories to Azerbaijan. Our goal has always been to do what we can to support common action, to advance the common good. All our advances have one simple goal in mind, European and Euro-Atlantic integration. We will not rest until we achieve EU and NATO membership. This means we will continue to reform and modernize every aspect of our democracy and economy to align with the highest global standards. Our path to European and Euro-Atlantic structures is a homecoming, a civilizational choice. An absolute majority of our population strongly supports this destiny for our country. Our historic decision to join the European and Euro-Atlantic family is the core principle that guides our foreign policy. Especially since 2012, Georgia has made great strides in advancing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. All our fundamental values we share with the European institutions. We have prepared a comprehensive action plan, packed with initiatives and reforms that will lead to our application for EU membership in 2024. For that, I would like to thank our European and international partners that have shown strong and steadfast support to Georgia for all these years. Since 2012, we have held six democratic elections, and each one has been declared free and fair by international election observers. In fact, in a few days' time, we will once again be holding a free, fair, and democratic nationwide municipal election. Since the last time we met in person here at the UN, democracies around the world have been under pressure, if not assault. Irrational and, uh, I would say, dark forces have been at work, often aided and abetted by outside supporters. Regardless of the source, we must hold to the democratic path. Elections are often passionate and hard fought, and feelings run high. Yet when elections are free and fair, the winners must be gracious. And those who lose, lose must abide by the will of the people. If we cannot believe in elections, then democracy itself is in peril. So I call on everyone here today who cares for democracy for progress, for free and fair elections, to participate with passion in your political system. And when the dust has settled, as we say, and a winner is declared, respect the will of the people, close ranks and work to move your country forward. The challenge to democracy is not the only challenge facing us. In Georgia, we have achieved much but, of course, more remains to be done. First and foremost, we must create more jobs. At the same time, we must remain dedicated to investing in education and infrastructure, eradicating poverty, strengthening our health system, and diversifying our industrial, service, and agricultural sectors. As I have outlined, Georgia is on the move. We are on the right track. We are overcoming COVID, and we have a long-term plan in place to strengthen our democracy, economy, and society. Yet, I'm reaching out to, do, to you all today to put an end to the illegal occupation of Georgian sovereign lands by Russia. Not only is Russia occupying 20% of Georgian territory, but is also actively seeking to undermine our aspirations to join the European and Euro-Atlantic family. While our commitment 
to be a true global citizen is unstoppable and cannot be hindered by outside forces. The very freedom we have fought so hard for is being challenged every single day. On our very own soil, in the Abkhazia and Skinvali regions, we are observing a humanitarian crisis. And the responsibility, of course, resides only with the occupying power. This year, the European Court for Human Rights ruled its verdict and found the Russian Federation guilty of occupying and exercising effective control over two Georgian regions and responsible for human rights violations in Abkhazia and Skinvali. Today, I call on the international community to act in concert to address the violations of fundamental principles of international law in the occupied territories and with joint efforts facilitate the implementation of the EU-mediated August 2008 ceasefire agreement. Every day, Georgian land continues to be subject to, as we call it, creeping annexation and so-called borderization. This includes kidnappings, illegal detentions, unlawful restrictions on freedom of movement, and deprivation of the right to education in the native tongue, particularly in the Gali region. During COVID-19, this made the medical evacuations virtually impossible. All these actions carry an unbearable burden for those living on both sides of the razor-wired fences. This must be seen for what it is, a pre-planned ethnic cleansing to drive ethnic Georgians out. This must be stopped. In the occupied territories, we have a real humanitarian crisis, while on the other side, we have land that is being cultivated where the younger generation have access to world-class education, top-level infrastructure, and thriving businesses. We want to see the same opportunities and prospects for development and prosperity for the young generation in the Abkhazia and Skinvali region. For, the very, for this very reason, we developed a step to a better future, a peace initiative to improve the livelihoods of people living in the Abkhazia and Skinvali regions. We believe that only through sustainable peace and security will our fellow citizens have a better future. It is through peace and stability that economies can start to thrive and our people prosper together. That is why I want to address our Abkhaz and Ossetian brothers and sisters and say that our true strength is in cooperation and unity, which is exactly why our foes want us divided and apart. We have a common history and are part of a common homeland, Sakartuelo. We should jointly define our common future as well. We should build our country together and peacefully turn it into a truly democratic, prosperous, and future-oriented European society. From a geopolitical perspective, the Black Sea region is growing ever more than important. The Black Sea is on the front lines of a dynamic regional chess match. It is a microcosm of conflict management. And I would say that if we can maintain peace and stability here, we can do so elsewhere. Therefore, our goal is to ensure peace and stability in the entire region. In the South Caucasus, I propose what I'm calling the Peaceful Neighborhood Initiative to promote stability in our region. This format will facilitate dialogue and confidence building and lead to the implementation of practical solutions to regional issues of common interest with, the, with our US and EU partners. Georgia stands ready to host an international gathering in Tbilisi to discuss the prospects of our Peaceful Neighborhood Initiative involving our South Caucasian neighbors, our brothers, and international partners. Let's begin with some small steps to build trust, and then we can move 
toward resolving other regional and global issues together. A sustainable peace and a common strategic outlook for the South Caucasus will benefit the wider Black Sea region and enhance broader European and global security. Dear friends, let me conclude where I began. We are here today as a testament to the power of collective action. Whether it is the fight against the pandemic, financing development to advance quality of life, or the need of collective action to maintain peace, we must act together to live together. And there is no other alternative. I remain confident that working together, we will succeed. Thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of Georgia for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Australia to introduce an address by the head of government. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the high honour and distinct privilege to introduce the statement of the Honourable Scott Morrison, MP, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia. Mr. President, it is a pleasure to give Australia's national statement to the General Assembly. Here in Canberra, I'm on the ancient land of the Ngunnawal people, one of Australia's many Indigenous peoples who have cared for this continent for 60,000 years. Our First Peoples remind us that caring for country and for each other is the essence of our shared humanity. The past year has been one of extraordinary adversity, as the world has struggled and dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic, and it continues to rage. Yet it has also borne witness to humanity's remarkable resilience and creative ability to overcome problems, to deliver solutions. Each generation navigates its own destiny amidst anxiety and hope. Ours is no different. Today, I would like to speak about three of the most pressing global challenges that together we face. Challenges that shape our times. Mr. President, COVID-19 has tested the world like nothing in our lifetime. We mourn the millions lost and millions more who have suffered such terrible illness. After so much heartache and so much sorrow, there is hope now and a way forward. The development of a safe and effective vaccine, vaccines, so many of them, has been one of the greatest achievements of modern times. Our collective task, though, now is to roll that out, a global vaccine rollout, the largest in world history. Here in Australia, more than 70 per cent of our adult population has had the first dose of the vaccine and more than half uh, will have had two doses. We know vaccinations work. They lower the risk of transmission. They significantly lower the risk of hospitalisation, severe illness and death. And high vaccination rates are the pathway to taking back so much of what we have lost and to living with this virus confidently, safely, securely and prosperously. Vaccinations are the key to keeping our neighbours safe also. Australia has been helping countries across our region battle this pandemic with personal protective equipment, testing equipment, medical personnel. And now we're doing everything we can to help them with access to safe and effective vaccines. None of us are safe unless all of us are safe. So this is the most urgent priority for Indo-Pacific nations. Already we've delivered more than three million doses to countries across our region, and millions more doses are on their way. We've also contributed $130 million to the COVAX advanced market commitment, which has delivered over 51 million doses to Southeast Asia and 1.7 million doses to our Pacific family in Timor-Leste. And we're investing more than 620 million to procure millions of vaccine doses and providing technical advice, training of health workers and cold chain support to our friends and our neighbours. Now, this includes a $100 million contribution to the Quad Vaccine Partnership with our good friends, the United States, India and Japan. 
This will support a boost in production by at least one billion doses by the end of 2022 and provide access to vaccines and delivery support to countries across the Indo-Pacific. This is the right thing to do. It will help slow the spread of the virus and we hope prevent variants emerging. As well, we must prevent future pandemics and Australia supports the calls for a stronger, more independent World Health Organisation with enhanced surveillance and pandemic response powers. This should be the, the duty of every single member of the World Health Organisation to share that ambition for a World Health Organisation that can seek to protect us all in these circumstances. And we also need to accelerate efforts to identify how COVID-19 first emerged. Australia called for an independent review and sees understanding the cause of this pandemic not as a political issue, but as being essential simply to prevent the next one. We need to know so we can prevent this death and this calamity being visited upon the world again. That can be our only motivation. Mr President, COVID-19 has underscored the vital importance of international cooperation and coordination. The patterns of cooperation that have sustained our prosperity and security for decades, they're under increasing strain. And so are the institutions that have been helped maintain that rules-based international order for over seven decades now. The global strategic environment has rapidly changed, indeed deteriorated in many respects, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region where we live here in Australia. The changes we face are many, whether it's tensions over territorial claims, there is rapid military modernisation, foreign interference, cyber threats, disinformation and indeed economic coercion. Meeting these challenges requires cooperation and a common purpose amongst like-minded nations and all who share that purpose of peace, stability and security. To enhance these as the outcomes that benefit all peoples from wherever they come and whatever their perspectives. Australia's interests are inextricably linked to an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific. A region where the rights of all states, no matter how large or how small, are protected. This is what we believe. Australia continues to work constructively on this goal with agency and purpose and commitment, passionately building a network of partnerships and relationships that support these goals, contributing to. With our Pacific family through the Pacific Islands Forum, with our ASEAN friends very much at the heart of our own Indo-Pacific vision, through the Quad with a practical agenda for peace, contribution and security in our region. With our many bilateral strategic partners, comprehensive strategic partners, and with our long-standing friends and allies, the United States and the United Kingdom. Strengthened, of course, further last week with the announcement of our new enhanced trilateral security partnership, AUKUS, designed to further the cause of peace, stability and security in the Indo-Pacific region for the benefit of all who live within that region. It is essential that countries pursue these interests in ways that are mutually respectful and support stability and security, because we want to maintain an open rules-based international system that supports peace, prosperity, human dignity and the aspirations of all sovereign nations. A global order where sovereign nations can flourish free from commercial because of collaborative and purposeful action that enables them to correspond and engage in a fellowship that is supported by a rules-based order. Rules that have underpinned regional peace and prosperity, such as through the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea and the Treaty for the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which we affirm as Australians and which we will always honour. We must reinforce a sustainable rules-based order while ensuring it is also adaptable to the great power realities of our time. The United Nations must continue to reinforce the international rules-based order 
and preserve the institutions that uphold that order and ensure they're effective as the mechanisms for dialogue and adjudication that buttress and hold together this all-important order. Australia also values the rules and institutions that foster international trade, which creates wealth and brings nations together and is vital to our recovery from the economic costs of this pandemic. Finally, Mr President, Australia is determined to play our part in meeting the global challenge of climate change as the world makes the transition to a net zero global energy economy, a new energy economy. Australia has a proven track record when it comes to setting, achieving and exceeding our commitments to responsibly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We exceeded our Kyoto commitments. Our emissions in the year to March 2021 were 21% below 2005 levels. That is a strong record of achievement. And it's been achieved by Australians right across our community, our businesses, individual households, small businesses, our institutions, our governments. In Australia, we have already have the world's highest uptake of rooftop solar and we're deploying renewable energy at nearly eight times the global per capita average. We are well on the way to exceed our 2030 Paris commitment of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels. We will meet it and we will beat it and we'll beat it strongly. And we are committing to achieving net zero emissions. My government, the Australian government, will release our long-term emissions reduction strategy ahead of the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow at COP26. We know the world is transitioning to a new energy economy. It's no longer about if, or even when for that matter, it's about how, how we achieve the reduction in global emissions, in our own emissions, in individual nations' emissions, while still lifting living standards across all nations. And the answer, as history has shown us time and time again, it's technology, practical, scalable and commercially viable technologies. That's why we're investing around $20 billion to commercialise promising new technologies like clean hydrogen, green steel, long duration energy storage and carbon capture, vital to meeting the global task to achieve net zero emissions. And we want to work with everyone, other countries, to commercialise these technologies and ensure they're scalable and accessible as soon as possible. This is critical for the good of developing countries, who we all know face the steepest challenge in reducing their emissions. Developing countries need job-creating investment in the same productive commercial technologies, energy technologies, available to advanced economies like Australia. Australia is a reliable partner during this time of transition. We know that if we can support developing economies to embrace and use the technologies that achieve net zero emissions and see their economies grow and increase their jobs, that is not only wonderful for those economies and their peoples, but it also is good for Australia. We know that their success will also be our success. And so we are blessed here in this country with natural resources, including transition fuels and the resources needed for the new energy economy, and we will apply them. We will apply them in our region as we continue to work with our Southeast Asian partners and to assist them make their energy transitions successfully through finance, through trade and capability building. We have one global atmosphere and it's in our shared interests to work with each other in this way. That's why we're helping other countries reduce their emissions and build resilience to climate change too. It's why we've set aside one half billion in practical climate finance globally. And it will have a particular focus on our Pacific family, dealing directly. We're up for this global challenge. We're up for achieving net zero emissions, a challenge that we know will be met in partnership. And that unless we all get there, well, we will not achieve our goal. Mr. President, Australia has always sought to make a positive contribution to meeting global challenges. Our voice is clear, it's direct, it's respectful, it's constructive. It reflects our confidence in who we are and what we stand for. We are a proud liberal democracy. We believe in a world order that favours freedom. 
an order that was established through the fine institution of the United Nations that we gather around through these contributions. And that supports the dignity and free expression of all people. We believe in human rights, in gender equality and the rule of law, and we back that up with how we pursue these things in our own country, in our own society, and how we raise our own children. Australia was one of eight countries only involved in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we continue to strengthen the international human rights system. And we will continue to raise our voice on important issues like the rights of women and girls, the rights of indigenous peoples, the global abolition of the death penalty, because respecting the rights and freedoms of the individual is intrinsically important. It is fundamental to our values as a people and as a nation. It lifts all societies and nations too, delivering better outcomes through economic inclusion, women's empowerment, environmental sustainability, rising living standards and so much more. Australia's actions are guided by our belief in the inherent dignity of all people, everywhere, no matter the circumstances. Mr President, we learned through the pandemic that every moment of challenge requires us to think anew, to engage with each other, to learn as you go. It is an experience understood by many others. And so we will continue to meet this moment with dialogue, with partnership. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia for the statement just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Highness Sheikh Sabah Khalid Al Hamad Al Sabah, Prime Minister of the State of Kuwait. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Highness Sheikh Sabah Khalid Al Hamad Al Sabah, Prime Minister of the State of Kuwait, and I invite him to address the General Assembly. Shukran, Sayyid Rais. Thank you, Mr. President. In the name of Allah, the Merciful, the Compassionate, Your Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Your Excellency. Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Majesties, Highnesses, Excellencies, Heads of Delegations, Ladies and Gentlemen, may the peace, mercy and blessing of Allah be upon you. It gives me great pleasure at the outset to congratulate you and the Republic of the Maldives on your election as President of the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly. I assure you of our full support in all tasks that would facilitate your work. I would also like to seize the opportunity to express our sincere gratitude for the tremendous effort of your predecessor, His Excellency, Mr. Volkan Boskir, during his presidency of the 75th session. I should also like to congratulate His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, on his re-election as Secretary General of the United Nations which is a recognition of his remarkable effort in leading this august organization during his first term. The last year of which has witnessed a multifaceted grave challenge that has claimed countless lives and caused much material and moral damage. Mr. President, our world is still in deep mourning due to COVID-19, a pandemic of global reach and excessive destructive ability. It claims human lives without distinction. It sends successive shock waves that upend the core of modern lifestyles in their various humanitarian, political, economic, and environmental aspects. A quick glance at the figures and statistics recorded worldwide shows the magnitude of the scars that will remain present for a long time on our collective conscience. It shows casualties that have surpassed 4.5 million people 
and confirmed recorded cases exceeding 200, 231 million cases, as well as the crippling burden placed on health sectors and professionals who deserve our greatest appreciation for their dedication and work in the front lines. Despite the horrors that threatened the collapse of many health systems across the world. This is in addition to the exacerbation of the food insecurity crisis due to the disruption in supply lines, which came as an expected outcome of the severe economic downturn and stagnation unheard of in over 90 years. Further, we saw a decline in the services of the education sector, in particular in developing and least developed countries in such a way that threatens more than ever to reverse the gains made and waste achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals. Mr. President, any study of history will show that epidemics, despite the gravity of their effects, have played pivotal roles as major catalysts for change and for building back better at the political, economic, and social levels. From this standpoint, the COVID-19 pandemic was like a mirror that reflected the world's weaknesses and revealed its chronic flaws, among which are the increase in hunger and poverty rates, prolonged conflicts, unchecked advances in modern technology with ramifications on cyber security and the spread of the scourge of terrorism, as well as the mounting structural disparities and gaps among countries. All, all these challenges have put multilateralism to an existential test of survival or decline and stagnation. Perhaps one of the most positive changes brought about by the pandemic was the emergence of modern patterns of creativity, innovation, adaptation that have contributed to creating rapid responses and advanced forms of cooperation within societies and between countries. This is in addition to the breakthrough in scientific research that was manifested in the race to defeat the virus through the production of multiple vaccines that have proved their effect effectiveness in providing the required immunization empirically with encouraging figures. Yet, much hinges upon the ability of the international community to make optimal use of this crisis towards a better transformation for our world in a serious endeavor for a sustainable and equitable recovery where no one is left behind. Mr. President, recovery requires starting with several steps, most important among which is giving utmost priority to investing in data and information infrastructure, as the availability of digital evidence will contribute to enhancing decision-making processes in the programs and policies aimed at mobilizing resources and post-crisis rebuilding in order to shield societies from similar future crises. However, the most important and urgent step is finding fair and secure distribution patterns of vaccines to all countries towards achieving universal immunization. In this regard, the state of Kuwait has achieved one of the highest global vaccination rates of 72% for our nationals and expatriates alike. We are also able to protect our health system from collapsing. My country continues to support international efforts to fight the COVID-19 pandemic with total contributions of 300 $27.4 million, the latest of which was providing $40 million to the Gavi Alliance and the COVAC Facility Initiative towards enhancing global health security. Mr. President, the question of Palestine remains central to our Arab and Muslim worlds. 
tension and instability will continue in our region if the Palestinian people do not obtain all their legitimate political rights and if Israel, the occupying power, continues its practices and violations of international humanitarian law. These violations include the building of settlements, confiscation of land, closure of, terri uh, closure of territories, the continued blockade on Gaza, and the desecration of the sanctity of holy places. We stress the importance of continuing to exert efforts to restart the negotiations within a set time frame towards a just and comprehensive peace. According to the terms of reference of the peace process, the resolutions of international legitimacy and the Arab Peace Initiative, with a view to ending the Israeli occupation and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital along the borders prior to the 4th of June 1967, and the return of the refugees. At the same time, we commend uh, the indispensable role of UNRWA in providing basic assistance to millions of Palestine refugees and stress the importance of continuing to support its work. Mr. President, the ongoing Syrian crisis, which has entered its 11th year with all the humanitarian suffering for Syrians inside and outside the country, has proved that the absence of international consensus and will as well as external intervention, have all prolonged this brutal conflict. Here we reiterate our principal conviction that there is no military solution to the crisis. We emphasize the importance of reaching a political settlement in accordance with relevant Security Council resolutions, especially Resolution 2254, in a way that meets the aspirations and hopes of the brotherly Syrian people. Mr. President, the continuing crisis in brotherly Yemen and the growing and dangerous threats it poses to regional peace and stability are testament to how relevant Security Council resolutions and outcomes are addressed in practice. Hence, we stress our firm position that the only solution to this crisis is a political one based on the three agreed upon terms of reference, namely the GCC initiative and its implementation mechanism, the outputs of the National Dialogue Conference and the resolutions of the Security Council, especially resolution 2216. We also renew our support to the Special Envoy of the Secretary General to Yemen. At the same time, we welcome the constructive role of the sisterly Kingdom of Saudi Arabia towards the implementation of the Riyadh Agreement, as well as its initiative for peace in Yemen. We express our condemnation of all aggressions and attacks against Saudi territory and reaffirm our support to all measures taken by the kingdom to maintain its security and stability. Mr. President, the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum election earlier this year of a head and deputies for its presidency council, as well as of a prime minister, is an encouraging sign that the international community through the UN is able to make headway towards a difficult peace that was elusive due to seven years of severe institutional divisions with serious repercussions on the security and stability of Libya and countries in the region. We call upon our Libyan brothers to give priority to the best interest of the country, as well as peaceful solutions that reject violence. They must commit to the outcomes of international conferences and relevant Security Council resolutions to ensure concluding all necessary arrangements for holding the general elections on time on the 24th of December 2021. We expect that these efforts and arrangements would ensure the security, stability, and unity of Libya and meet the aspirations of the brotherly, brotherly people of Libya. Mr. President, the pandemic has had political, social, and economic repercussions that 
diverted the attention of the world, which was exploited by extremists and terrorist groups in conflict-affected or fragile and insecure areas. The Middle East, in particular, has suffered from the destruction and sabotage of terrorist organizations, mainly the ISIL terrorist organization. This led to an intensification of the war on this clear and present danger in all its forms and manifestations, as we work to dry up its funding and implement international and regional counterterrorism conventions. Many countries in our region are suffering from this growing threat in Yemen, Libya, Syria, Somalia, and Iraq. The international community has followed with much interest the critical recent developments in Afghanistan. We call upon the Taliban and all parties to exercise utmost restraint to protect lives and also to provide full protection for civilians we also call upon them to strictly adhere to obligations and international law to maintain stability and security in the country and to uphold the rights and gains of the friendly people of Afghanistan at the regional level based on our principal position rooted in the rules of good neighborliness set forth in the Charter of the United Nations. We reiterate our call to the Islamic Republic of Iran to take serious steps towards confidence building in a dialogue based on respect for the sovereignty of states and non-interference in their domestic affairs towards diffusing tension in the Gulf and maintaining the safety, security, and freedom of maritime navigation from any threats. This would contribute towards establishing relations based on mutual respect and cooperation, which paves the way for the realization of the aspirations of the peoples of the region towards security, stability, prosperity, and development. I turn to a thorny regional question. The erosion of the nuclear disarmament regime is, is an existential threat to the security and stability of the region. We look forward to the concerted international and regional efforts towards the successful holding of the second session of the conference on establishing a nuclear weapons and WMD's free zone in the Middle East, which the state of Kuwait will preside over to be held in New York in November 2021. Mr. President, the current COVID-19 pandemic continues to deprive countries of the gains made towards the SDGs. It has shown that difficult, uh, that different aspects of sustainability are interlinked. Hence, the issue of climate change and ecosystems was also subject to its waves. In this regard, we expect the UN Climate Change Conference to be held in Glasgow next month to reach a constructive review to track progress made and identify shortcomings based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibility towards ending environmental degradation exacerbated by marked increases in temperatures, severe storms and floods, as well as deforestation due to fires in a number of countries which would have severe environmental repercussions. In conclusion, I reiterate our adherence to the international multilateral system and to the principles and purposes of the United Nations Charter to ensure the development and strengthening of international governance to guarantee the realization of the noble mission of the UN towards the maintenance of international peace and security and to serve all of mankind. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the State of Kuwait for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.
The Assembly will hear an address by Her Excellency Anna Brnabic, Prime Minister of the Republic of Serbia. May I request protocol to escort Her Excellency? I have great pleasure in welcoming Her Excellency Anna Brnabic, Prime Minister of the Republic of Serbia. I invite her to address the General Assembly. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I have the great honor to address you today on behalf of the citizens of the Republic of Serbia. Esteemed Excellencies, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, Mr. Volkan Bosker, and Mr. Antonio Guterres, I would like to thank you for the active engagement, dedication, and leadership you have shown for the United Nations and all of humanity during these difficult times. Serbia shares your conviction, and we remain fully committed to supporting your efforts. This year, we come together at a decisive moment in our history. COVID-19 has shaken our foundations to the core. At the same time, we are increasingly witnessing and experiencing the effects of climate change. And finally, we are seeing significant shifts in global partnerships and alliances, trade wars between traditional partners and allies, protectionism instead of openness and free market policies, and overall uncertainty at an unprecedented scale. Some of the pressing and extremely emotional issues that we have locally in the Balkans are still unresolved. And while we are trying, and Serbia is especially dedicated to this, to change the future by working together and creating alliances through initiatives such as the Berlin Process and Open Balkans Initiative, others are trying to disrupt these processes. And instead of focusing on the future, they want to recreate the past, whatever the cost of that may be. But let me start with COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed critical weaknesses in the architecture of global governance. It has threatened to erase the progress many nations have achieved in recent years. It has placed nations at the junction between isolation and collaboration between panic and hope, between chaos and order. The pandemic questioned some of the basic tenets of the open and cooperative international order. Global exchanges, international communication, and cross-border trade have all seen a vast decrease. Curfews, restrictions on freedom, and lockdowns of entire societies have created uncertainty in many segments of the individual lives of our citizens, and for that matter, our own individual perception of what freedom in today's world even means. For Serbia, this pandemic threatened to undermine everything we have been doing for the past seven years, to crush all of the results and accomplishments of difficult reforms we initiated in 2014, and to propel us back to the times of high unemployment, rising public debt, uncontrollable deficit, and overall desperation. Much as in any other country, COVID-19 has tested our nation's resiliency. And this time, unlike during the global financial crisis, which was still much more limited in scope and incomparable in consequences to the COVID-19 pandemic, this time Serbia stood strong. The reforms we undertook in the pre-COVID times made us more resilient than ever. The fiscal consolidation, the budget surplus we had, efficient and predictable investment environment, became a lifeline that saved us from a recession during the pandemic and one that ensured we could support our citizens and our economy 
during these most difficult of times. Despite the effects of the crisis, Serbia has managed to preserve financial and economic stability. In 2020, we recorded a decline in GDP of only 0.9%, one of the best results in Europe. Our public debt remained below 60% of our GDP, average salary continued to grow by almost 10%, while despite the pandemic, the number of people employed increased by over 3%. The recovery this year has been stronger than we expected. Our GDP will grow approximately 7% and perhaps by even more. Prior to the pandemic, we have opened our borders to investment, technology, and ideas, and we managed to create a peaceful and stable environment that allowed us to pursue rapid domestic transformation with innovation and knowledge-based economy as the foundation. The innovative advances we have made allowed us to diversify our capabilities when the virus hit through e-government, online education, digital textbooks, and a central software system which drove a successful vaccination rollout. We invested heavily in healthcare infrastructure and strengthened the health system in order to respond to the current crisis and are eternally grateful to our healthcare workers for their dedicated struggle. Our decision to put geopolitics aside and people at the center of our policies is the reason we were able to acquire vaccines quicker than most other nations. We did not discriminate between manufacturers, did not care whether vaccines are from the East or West, but chose to negotiate with all vaccine manufacturers deemed safe by regulators. This openness gave us the ability to purchase vaccines from around the world, giving our citizens the unique freedom to choose which vaccine they prefer. Excellences, Serbia believes in solidarity between nations, multilateralism, and helping others when in need. Since the beginning of this year, we have made it our mission to support our neighbors and all those in need with COVID-19 vaccines. We have also allowed foreign nationals to come to Serbia to receive the vaccine which will protect their lives. In total, Serbia has donated or allocated over a million doses of vaccines. 230,000 doses for the region, 300,000 doses for foreign nationals who came to Serbia to get vaccinated, and an additional 570,000 doses for countries of Africa and Asia. And we will keep doing so to the greatest extent possible until COVID-19 is behind all of us. This is why we have also taken steps to acquire the technology to produce at least two types of vaccines to help improve global access so we can all be safe and triumph over this virus. However, as stated by dignitaries of some of the largest nations during this General Assembly, there are other pressing issues that all of us need to keep addressing without any delay and in a bold manner. And the most urgent is climate change. Serbia has redoubled its efforts to make our country safer and cleaner for its citizens, and by doing so, contribute to the fight against climate change and for environmental protection. We are strongly committed to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on climate change. We are committed to global efforts and will continue to work actively to meet our obligation under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We are about to submit our revised nationally determined contributions to the, contribute to this critical 
global effort. We have already announced our intention to reduce greenhouse gases by at least 33.3% compared to 1990 and 13.2% compared to 2010, which we are currently incorporating into our energy and climate strategic documents. We work strategically on planning and investments in this sector. These investments are extremely expensive, requiring years and decades of commitment and a systematic approach. But we are firmly set on the path of this transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, of all the challenges we face, the most worrisome for Serbia is the maintenance of peace and stability in the southern Serbia province of Kosovo and Metohija. For more than two decades, we have been constantly drawing international attention to the problems that the non-Albanian population is facing in Kosovo and Metohija. Physical safety and respect for and protection of human rights, and especially of minority communities, are far from satisfactory. We are now witnessing a constant increase in the number of attacks targeting Serbs, their property, and religious heritage in Kosovo and Metohija. To illustrate, there were 55 such incidents in 2014, 62 in 2016, 71 in 2020, and 100 since the beginning of this year. The total number of attacks in 2020 was already surpassed by June of this year. According to the United Nations, Kosovo and Metohija is still the territory with the least number of returnees, internally displaced Serbs, of all post-conflict areas in the entire world. I will give you just a few examples to depict what the lives of Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija look like today. On the 11th of May, the house of Raduje Pumpalovic, 81-year-old returnee to Kosovo in the village of Dubrava in the Istok municipality, was attacked. This was the fifth attack on him in the same year. And again, I emphasize, he's 81 years old. Since June 2021, multiple attacks were carried out against Dragica Gašić, a 59-year-old woman. The first Serb returnee to Jakovica, 22 years after the end of the conflict. Attacks include stoning of her apartment, banning her from shopping for food in the local store, and petitions by civil society organizations demanding her eviction from the city. On the 2nd of July, in the village of Gojbulja, near Vučitrn, a group of Albanians attacked 13-year-old Nikola Peric. The attack occurred when he was returning home from the school playground with three friends. Attacks on Serbian medieval churches, mon monasteries, and monuments in Kosovo and Metohija make them some of the most endangered cultural heritage sites in Europe. The monastery Visuki Dečani was recently listed by Europa Nostra as one of the seven, mo seven most endangered heritage sites in Europe in 2021. The advisory panel of Europa Nostra noted that Dečani is the only monument in Europe under robust military protection for a continuous pe period of 20 years, although it constitutes a monument of ultimate historical and cultural importance for Europe and the world. This spiral of violence occurring in Kosovo and Metohija culminated at the beginning of this week. On the pretext of enforcing new license plate rules, Pristina dispatched heavily armed special units to the north of province. 
This is yet another brutal violation of the Brussels Agreement, and this irrational show of force has ignited a major crisis. It disrupted the supply of food and medication to Serb communities in the north of the province. Local Serbs, who peacefully gathered to protest this measure, were met with tear gas and police brutality, thus seriously threatening local and regional stability. But despite all of the challenges and daily provocations, Serbia remains strongly committed to finding a compromise-based solution that will ensure lasting peace and stability. Dialogue and the implementation of the agreements reached are the only proper way to resolve all open issues. However, almost nine years after reaching the Brussels Agreement, as the first agreement on normalization between Belgrade and Pristina, the establishment of the community of Serb municipalities, the very backbone of this agreement, has not yet even begun. And I would like to appeal once again to the international community and especially to the European Union as the guarantor of the Brussels Agreement to firmly insist that the provisional institutions of self-government in Pristina start implementing all of the agreements reached. The Republic of Serbia, by defending its sovereignty and territorial integrity, at the same time defends international law, the UN Charter, the legally binding UN Security Council Resolution 1244, and the supreme authority of the Security Council when it comes to the preservation of international peace and stability. We attach special importance to the activity of the UN mission in Kosovo and Metohija and expect it to continue to implement its mandate in the province in accordance with this resolution. Dear friends, our generation shares the common destiny of the modern world, which is becoming increasingly complex in terms of geopolitics, technology, health and climate. In the face of these challenges, Serbia will continue nurturing international partnerships on a predictable and transparent basis. We will continue pursu pursuing rule of law reforms on our EU path, which is our strategic foreign policy goal. We see this as inseparable from achieving sustainable peace, stability and prosperity. We will host, together with the Republic of Azerbaijan, as the current chair of the Non-Aligned Movement, a commemorative high-level event marking the 60th anniversary of the Non-Aligned Movement Conference, which was held in Belgrade in 1961. And we are very much looking forward to hosting our friends from all parts of the world in Belgrade in October this year. We will further enhance cooperation across the Balkans through the Open Balkans Initiative and Berlin process by opening borders, harmonizing differences, and further integrating our region. And in conclusion, over the past seven years, Serbia has been transformed. We sparked an economic revival, created opportunities for young people, cultivated a tech boom, and improved Serbia's position abroad. The progress we have made has allowed Serbia to better face and survive the pandemic. The world now faces a turning point, the recovery from COVID-19 and sustainable re reconstruction will not proceed if issues, new and old, are not handled by joint forces and collaborative international actions. This pandemic taught us one important lesson. Unless all of us are safe, no one is safe. So we can either win together, or all of us, regardless of how rich or poor, large or, or small, from Europe, Asia, Africa, America, or Australia, or fail together. If anything, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the issue of climate change, should have taught us to stand together. Thank you very much.
Au nom de l'Assemblée générale, on behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Republic of Serbia for the statement just made. I ask protocol to accompany Her Excellency. I now give the floor to the representative of Denmark to introduce the statement by the head of government. The honour and privilege of introducing a pre-recorded statement by Her Excellency Mrs. Mette Frederiksen, Prime Minister of Denmark. Mr. President, dear delegates, no one can be in doubt. We live in a connected world. We face global challenges. They can only be solved if we work together. COVID-19, human rights violations, climate change, poverty on the rise, conflicts. As a founding member of the UN, Denmark is a strong voice for common solutions. And today we need global cooperation more than ever. Throughout history, international solidarity has moved us forward. It has the power to do so again. Out of the pandemic, we must ensure global access to vaccines. None of us can leave COVID behind until all of us can. Denmark is committed to vaccine solidarity and COVAX. In the spring, we announced the donation of 3 million vaccine doses. This week, we announced a redoubling of our efforts. We now aim to donate more than 6 million doses. That is more than one donated vaccine for each Dane. It comes in addition to our commitment to COVAX with more than $15 million. If we are to battle this pandemic, we have to strengthen our ability to prevent and respond to future pandemics. International solidarity also has the power to prevent a climate disaster. The latest IPCC report makes it clear that we are standing at a global crossroad. We must continue our path towards a green future and we have to do it faster. We need to keep the Paris Agreement goal alive, limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Climate change hits the world's poorest and weakest communities hardest. Denmark will respond to the call of the Secretary General and massively scale up Danish grant-based climate finance to at least 500 million US dollars a year by 2023. And we are dedicating 60% to adaption in poor and vulnerable countries. In addition, we are strengthening our efforts to mobilize public and private finance from other sources. In total, Denmark aims to contribute at least 1% of the collective target of $100 billion. At the same time, we are fully focused on reducing our own emissions. Denmark will be climate neutral no, no later than 2050. And by 2030, we have committed to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 70%. We have decided to end production of oil and gas and build the world's first energy island. In time, they will create clean energy for millions of European households. We call on you all to follow and to do so urgently. Every one of us need to act and adapt, but we also have to act for the common good. That is the case in Afghanistan as well. The current situation is disturbing for the long-suffering people of, of Afghanistan, for the women and children, and also for the international society. We need a strong and coordinated response. The contribution at the International Donor Conference last week was an, was an important step. I would like to express my appreciation for the commitment of our international humanitarian partners they are providing life-saving assistance in Afghanistan and in the many other places. Thank you. Peace missions are keeping peace, preventing conflicts, and paving the way for progress every day around the world. No people in conflict zones should be forgotten. 
we must include those that have been excluded and empower those that have been powerless. Women and young people have a vital role to play in peace building and in conflict prevention. Denmark remains committed to the agenda for women, peace and security. International solidarity has the power to give us hope. Hope for a better future in the places we call home and hope for protection whenever we need it. But for many around the world, this hope comes at a high price. We are today leaving the destiny of too many people to human smugglers. The current asylum and migration system does not address the challenges we face today. We need to do it better to save lives and to prevent rape and abuse. It calls for new common solutions. My government is devoted to addressing the root causes. We have dedicated a large amount of funding to regions of conflict to help create conditions for a better future where people actually live and to help more people. We need to work together to ensure safe and orderly migration and to protect those in need. Denmark is committed to a strong and efficient UN that protects the rule-based international order, promotes a more progressive world, and fight injustice. Last year, we asked the Secretary General to report back to us, the member states, with recommendations to advance our common agenda. He has done so. Now we have to act on these recommendations, all of us. The social contract between governments and people should be renewed in our own societies and at the global level. As host of the Social Summit in 1995, Denmark feels a special responsibility so that we may gather again in 2025 and continue the work towards the SDGs, 30 years on from Copenhagen and on the road to 2030. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I would like to thank the Prime Minister of Denmark for the statement just made. I now give the floor, Excellencies, my dear colleagues, to the representative of Jamaica to introduce an address by the Head of Government. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, it is my great pleasure and distinct honour to introduce to you Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, who will deliver a pre-recorded statement. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shaheed, I extend warm congratulations on your election to the presidency of this 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly. I also commend your predecessor, His Excellency, Mr. Volkan Buzkir, for his work during the historic 75th anniversary, a particularly difficult year for the United Nations and its membership as we grappled with the insidious COVID-19 pandemic. Your Excellency, you can be confident of Jamaica's continued commitment to collaborate and seek viable solutions for persistent global challenges, most notably the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We must take a fresh look at how we rebuild sustainably, attain the Sustainable Development Goals, and renew our focus on social justice and climate action. Mr. President, the theme for this year's debate, with its emphasis on building resilience, is welcomed as the world searches for ways to manage the COVID-19 pandemic with its dreadful impacts on all aspects of human existence. We must inspire hope to drive our emergence from the scourge of this pandemic better and stronger than we were before. Mr. President, at the core of building resilience is restoring the health and well-being of our people. The pandemic has exacerbated challenges in this area, especially for small island developing states like Jamaica which already face limited resources in our health sector. Most regrettably, many lives have been lost and we extend our condolences. 
There are increasing uncertainties as the pandemic continues and new variants emerge. While mitigation efforts to help to reduce transmission and mortality remain crucial, the long-term solution must be vaccines that are accessible to all. We know that vaccines only work if a critical threshold is attained. Sharing vaccines in a strategic manner serves the global common good, as no country will be safe until all are safe. Jamaica supports a globally coordinated approach to the scaling up of production and equitable distribution of vaccines with the United Nations at the core. We welcome the support received from bilateral and international partners and through the COVAX facility. COVAX was conceived as an expression of multilateralism, bringing widespread aspiration of hope in the collective approach. While COVAX has not met all expectations, nevertheless, we believe in the essential merits of the facility and call for urgent increased international collaboration to avoid the widening gap in recovery across countries and regions. Mr. President, today we see some countries receiving a digital dividend, while others suffer the consequences of a digital divide. There is need to urgently address this digital divide in COVID-19 adaptation measures, responses, and recovery efforts. Accelerated digitalization, remote work and education, e-commerce, and the virtual delivery of essential services have allowed the digitally connected to thrive while exacerbating the inequalities faced by the digitally disconnected. This is particularly evident in our rural areas, along gender lines, and generally among the poorest and most vulnerable. Addressing these negative consequences of the digital divide will require greater engagement of the public and private sectors in building foundations for long-term development. Leaving no one behind today means leaving no one offline. That is why Jamaica has been working to ensure that the tools needed to adapt and thrive are provided to our citizens. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic has also spurred innovation and new forms of collaboration across sectors. We are committed to the development of a sustainable framework to ensure the availability of human capital to meet the growing, changing needs of the economy. Jamaica is taking an inclusive approach to improve digital literacy through increased access to and use of ICT by 50% in public institutions, schools, and key public areas in the country over the next four years. We are engaging our private sector to improve the application of science, technology, and innovation in educational institutions towards national development. We believe that countries should be supported in their efforts to build robust and resilient digital infrastructure. Public investments of this sort can serve as a force multiplier in narrowing the gaps that result in inequitable development outcomes. Universal, secure, and affordable digital connectivity is needed to ensure inclusive and sustainable development. We, therefore, advocate for an increased digital alliance within the global community and support the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on the Digital Cooperation Roadmap. Mr. President, the multiple challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic have placed severe pressure on our fiscal accounts threatening our hard-won macroeconomic stability. The pandemic has demonstrated how quickly our development gains can be eroded and that much more needs to be done by the international community to secure a resilient future for the most vulnerable. We must retain hope in our ability to meet the targets for the SDGs, even with adjusted timelines. Mr. President, last year, along with the Prime Minister of Canada and the UN Secretary General and other heads of state and government and key international partners, I convened the Financing for Development in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond initiative. The outcome was ambitious, 
yet practical with policy options to support COVID-19 response and recovery for consideration by the international community. It now remains for us to take action. Mr. President, for Jamaica, we anticipate real GDP recovery within four years, given the relative strength of our economy and the stimulus packages implemented both locally and internationally. However, we will require adequate fiscal space and funding to achieve the SDGs and to be able to respond and recover from the health, social, and economic implications of the pandemic in light of high debt servicing requirements. The continued use of measures of development which do not take into account the full spectrum of vulnerabilities of small island developing states is a major impediment to our efforts to attain the SDGs. We who live in one of the most disaster prone regions of the world are more vulnerable than our income data suggests. We reiterate today that consideration of our development level must be linked to our socio-economic and environmental vulnerability. This rationale underpins the basis for a multidimensional vulnerability index for small island developing states and for the ongoing work by the UN on this matter, as endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly last year. Mr. President, the Caribbean Development Bank has reported that small island developing states' debts have risen to unsustainable levels since the pandemic. The number of Caribbean countries with a debt to GDP ratio above 60% has increased from nine to 13, with the average debt to GDP ratio increasing to 85%. Jamaica maintains its call for a revision of the graduation criteria as the classification system utilized by international financial institutions is simply not appropriate. We concur with the UN Secretary General in his assessment that graduation must be a reward, not a punishment. As we strive to build forward stronger in this decade of action, we call for the commitment of the international community to a post-COVID reality that guarantees greater investment and financing to support development and economic growth in small island developing states. We also seek the reorientation of the international financial system to align financing with sustainable development to accelerate our push to achieve our SDG goals. Mr. President, climate change remains one of the defining global challenges of our era and of even greater concern for future generations. Our ability to achieve sustainable development will be compromised if we do not find real solutions to the ongoing climate emergency. The demand for climate adaptation is increasing, but so is the fear that it will be unmet. A more worrisome truth is the IPCC's finding that human influence on the Earth's climate has already led to unprecedented and irreversible changes. In their efforts to combat these changes, small island developing states have been unable to access climate finance at the pace and scale necessary. We have instead been forced to spend significant funds on loss and damage with limited financial support from large emitters. Jamaica joins with all small island developing states in calling for the delivery of the $100 billion per annum committed in 2015 by the international donor community. COP26 must deliver significant progress on the priority issues of climate financing, loss and damage, adaptation and mitigation, as well as the development of effective climate change plans. Mr. President, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea recognizes the ocean as a common heritage of mankind. As the science and the research have shown, we must also see the oceans as playing a vital role as a climate mitigator. We support the development of a legally binding international instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond the national jurisdiction. We look forward to the successful conclusion of negotiations 
for an international treaty under the Convention in 2022. Mr. President, we reaffirm the importance of multilateral approaches to the issues of peace and development and the central role of the United Nations in their treatment. We support the resolution of disputes, whether in the Middle East, in the Caribbean, or elsewhere, through dialogue and negotiated settlements. We call for an end to the economic, commercial, and financial embargo imposed by the United States of America against Cuba. Mr. President, the illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons remains a daily challenge to citizen security and a grave concern to Jamaica. The widespread availability of these arms and their ammunition is a key enabler of conflict and endemic crime and represent a significant danger to our internal security, fostering criminal activities which destabilize the social order. We will work with all our partners to enhance the capacity of member states to address issues related to arms control and disarmament by preventing the diversion of conventional arms to the illicit market. This matter remains a priority for Jamaica as we seek the assistance of our bilateral, regional, and international partners in addressing this issue. President, the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations recognize the pivotal role of the organization, to which we continue to assign new mandates and challenges. Let us, with equal fervor, resolve to equip the organization with the necessary tools and financial resources to enable it to effectively undertake its leadership role in safeguarding international peace and security and in ensuring the economic and social well-being of mankind. Our common vision must be one in which the UN can act and will act as a catalyst for hope, for change, for peace, and as an instrument of progress on behalf of all peoples of the world. I thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister, Minister of Defence, Economic Growth and Job Creation of Jamaica for the statement just made. The Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, will now hear an address by His Excellency John Briseño, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Investment of Belize. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. J'ai le grand plaisir. I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency John Briseño, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Investment of Belize. I invite him to address the General Assembly. Mr. President, congratulations on being elected President of the General Assembly. It is with great pleasure to see a representative of our fellow small island development, developing state presiding over the 76th section of the United Nations General Assembly. For a small island state, a low-lying coastal state like Belize, which three days ago celebrated 40 years of political independence, the world today is hostile and precarious. No one can deny that the planet is getting hotter. The facts are that July 2021 was the hottest month ever. Each of the last four decades have been successively warmer than any decade that preceded it since 1850. Global temperature is now 1.2 degrees warmer. Sea levels are rising. The fact is that global average sea level has risen faster since 1900 than over any preceding century in the last 3,000 years. Since 1900, droughts are unprecedented 
and have become more frequent and last longer. Severe weather events are more frequent and devastating. The last 20 years have seen the number of major floods more than double, while the incident of storms grew from 1,457 to 2,034. Mother Nature is rebelling. She is reacting to our destructive tendencies and our refusal to take urgent corrective action. We can do better. And now, Mr. President, our capacity to survive is being tested by the unrelenting COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 brought the Belizean economy to its knees. Unemployment reached 30 percent as thousands of Belizeans lost their jobs. GDP declined by 14 percent. Our debt ballooned to 130 percent of GDP. Many small businesses were shuttered. The poverty rate increased to 60 percent. The impact of the pandemic has been swift, dramatic, and devastating. The human toll has been deadly. Already 399 Belizeans lost their lives to COVID-19. We have a fatality rate of 2.05%. Thousands have been hospitalized so far. Our health facilities are overwhelmed as they were unprepared for the surge in admission of critical patients. This is not unique to Belize. To confront the urgency of the pandemic, governments across the globe reallocated funds to meet desperate needs. Loans originally committed for development and climate change were diverted to cover emergency health needs and to mitigate the impact of the unemployed. Massive additional borrowings became the new normal as lockdowns were extended. The Common Framework and Debt Service Suspension Initiative failed to offer forbearance to most middle income, SIDS, including Belize, who are ineligible despite our debt on sustainability. At the same time, most of our countries had no recourse to concessionary financing to fund the immediate health response. Senor President. Mr. President. Belize's commitment to conservation is ambitious. We recognize that our debt is unsustainable and we are going to tie it directly to conservation. We are going to exchange millions of dollars in debt for significant commitments to see conservation. We hope that 30% of our exclusive economic zone will be designated a protected area before 2026, and that is far before the year 2030. Moreover, we will establish a Maritime Conservation Fund to be held in perpetuity. We will proudly stand at the forefront of work in this area, owing to our love for nature and our respect for the environment. With the advent of the vaccine, government self finance its acquisition from COVAX and concurrently reached out to bilateral partners to solicit vaccine donations. It was vaccines from our South-South partners which allowed government to roll out our national vaccination program. Mr. President, the immediate global response was slow and inadequate to the scale and depth of the health crisis. Disruption of supply chains made access to the much needed COVID-19 therapeutics, diagnosis and PPEs beyond the reach of many developing countries. Vaccine hoarding has reduced access to COVID-19 vaccines for developing countries, undermining COVAX and leading to deep and threatening inequalities. 
80% of vaccines administered worldwide have been in high and upper middle income countries. Only 0.4% of doses have been administered in low income countries. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the region worst hit by the pandemic, only about a fifth of the population has received vaccines. A pesar Despite the immoral inequities, countries that have higher vaccination rates are about to administer booster shots to their people, those people that are already vaccinated. That's not only unfair, it's quite simply ludicrous. There is no doubt that the world urgently needs to once again commit to multilateralism. It exists today because of the multilateral system. The support of UN member states for Belize's territorial integrity and respect for our right to self-determination was critical to the achievement of Belize's independence. For us, the multilateral system is indispensable. For this reason, Belize supports the Secretary General's thoughtful and forward-looking Our Common Agenda, which sets out a concise plan of action to accelerate the implementation of our agreed goals, including Agenda 2030. Despite the inclination to retreat towards nationalist tendencies, the truth is that whether it is the health or climate crisis, the scale of the challenge, the magnitude of the impact, and the urgency of the action required cannot be met by any one country alone. Inequality and vulnerabilities are also a threat to the rich and strong. Therefore, our common future depends squarely on our solidarity, international cooperation, and a strong and effective multilateral system. We must commit to finding solutions together to the common problems that we confront. Unbridled unilateralism must yield to the settled determination to respond to the major problems of our times with social justice. My country is pursuing, along with Guatemala, the final and peaceful resolution of Guatemala's claim to Belizean territory at the International Court of Justice. In the meantime, the 2005 Agreement on Confidence Building Measures remain in effect, and our bilateral relations continue to be based on mutual goodwill. We count on Guatemala to remain a constructive partner and rely on the international community to support us in addressing the daily challenges along the border that are inevitable between neighbors. If the multilateral system is to be our collective lifeline, it must be repurposed. I wish to propose four areas for the reform and strengthening of the multilateral system. We call for a genuine commitment to address the systemic issues which undermine the achievement of our agreed development goals. The continued ineligibility of SIDS from accessing concessional finance leaves us in a vicious cycle of disaster or crisis recovery, boring, leading to unsustainable levels of debt. This must be disrupted. A multi-dimensional vulnerability index is the indispensable tool for restoring rationality to access affordable financing. We therefore welcome the work of the UN and other development partners, such as the Commonwealth and the Caribbean Development Bank, in developing an MVI that does not only consider economic development, but also the inherent vulnerabilities of SIDS, scale, geography, and limited natural resources. 
we need to adopt an MVI now. We call upon all the international financial institutions and our development partners to use it. There is no alternative if our countries are to embark on a sustainable and resilient economic development plan. If our multilateral system is to remain credible, it must have the capacity to induce action. For far too long, too many global problems have been allowed to fester and become crises. The entire world is now experiencing the consequences of our inaction, catastrophic droughts, fires, floods, and more frequent and intense hurricanes that continue to affect and set back our small, open, and dependent economies. The latest scientific assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change lays the blame firmly on human activity. Belize, like other SIDS, is on the front line of a climate crisis for which we are not responsible. Belize incurs annual losses of close to 4% of GDP due to natural disasters. Therefore, we felt an obligation to put forward an ambitious, revised, nationally determined contribution. Belize's NDC covers new targets in both adaptation and mitigation. It is naturally aligned to both our national development plans and the SDGs. We have set some ambitious targets, including forest restoration and expansion of mangroves, as well as achieving 75% of electricity from renewable sources by 2030. The NDC also pledges to transition to a hybrid and electric public transportation system, increase resilience of coastal communities, and strengthen the adaptive capacity of agriculture, health, and tourism. Belize is committed to developing a long-term strategy aligned with achieving net zero global emissions by 2050. We are doing our part. We expect the developed countries and major emitters to do their part. Indeed, ambitious commitments from the G20 alone can keep us on the path to limiting global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. COP26 is our latest best hope to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. We call for a revamping of our collective ambition so that by 2030, global emissions are reduced by 50%. Developed countries and those in a position to do so must provide the financial, technical, and capacity building support to enable us to fulfill those pledges. This includes meeting and exceeding the $100 billion pledge made in Copenhagen 12 years ago. Additional support must be provided for the loss and damage being incurred through the extreme and slow onset climate, climatic events we are already experiencing. Flexibility and responsiveness are critical if our multilateral system is to have relevance at moments of crisis as well as to ensure equity and fairness in global responses. COVAX, the multilateral mechanism for vaccine distribution, has been unable to truly respond to the needs of its subscribers. The undermining of COVAX through export bans, vaccine hoarding, and predatory purchasing has resulted in extreme inequality of access to vaccines. Of the more than 5.7 billion vaccine doses that have been administered globally, 73% have been given in just 10 countries. COVAX has had to cut its forecast for distribution of vaccines by 25% for 2021. 
Belize has no delivery date for its next COVAX shipment. As the Director General of the WHO said, the longer vaccine inequality persists, the more the virus will keep circulating and changing, the longer the social and economic disruption will continue and, they hinder, they, and hinder the chances that more variants will emerge that render vaccines less effective. The health and recovery of all of us depend on the ability of our system to rapidly respond to the needs of all countries. The multilateral system must be more effective in protecting the rights of all people. Too many people remain marginalized and excluded, weakening the social contract, eroding trust in our multilateral system to deliver. Mr. President, the persistent call of the General Assembly over three decades to end the illegal embargo against the Cuban people has been ignored. The Cuban people are forced to carve out their sustainable development under the burden of the illegal, unilateral unilateral economic, commercial, and financial embargo. The new measures imposed by the past U.S. administration are now continued and widened by the present one during a pandemic are unbelievably cruel and inhumane. These measures bring suffering to millions of innocent people and do not reflect the goodwill of the people of the United States of America. Nevertheless, Cuba has made significant sacrifices to help other people in the world, including Belizeans. Our Palestinian brothers and sisters continue to suffer under an oppressive apartheid and illegal Israeli occupation. Belize fully supports the aspirations of the Palestinians for an independent state with its 1967 borders with all attendant rights, including the recognition of East Jerusalem as its capital and the right of return. And the Sahawari people are similarly being prevented from exercising their right to self-determination. We urge the relevant parties and the international community to support them in their efforts. Belize is also deeply concerned about the situation in Haiti and about the regional and global inaction to offer genuine and substantive program of support. We are alarmed at the inhumane treatment of Haitian refugees who are risking their lives traversing two continents for a better future. We therefore call on the UN to galvanize action of the member states and its development system to support the development of a Haitian-led resolution restoring its sustainability and security. Our multilateral system must also be inclusive, harnessing the capacity of our states to scale up international cooperation where it is most needed. Belize has benefited greatly from our diplomatic partnership with Taiwan that is based on the shared values of democracy, freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. Taiwan has provided tremendous assistance to Belize in terms of medical supplies and financial support, so Belize is better equipped in combating COVID-19 and conducting post-pandemic recovery. Belize calls for Taiwan's inclusion in the United Nations and its specialized agencies, which will not only further enhance global cooperation and partnership, but also manifest the United Nations enshrined principle of universality. Mr. President, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, it is crystal clear 
at the confluence of crises facing the world can only be addressed through solidarity, international cooperation, and multilateral approaches. Let us not return to this great hall in September 2022 to lament further inaction. Let us not return next year to again decry unilateralism, nationalism, and failed collective action. No, Mr. President, we must move forward together. We can defeat COVID-19, but we can only do so together. We must save the planet from the irreversible effects of climate change, but only if we act collectively and urgently. Together we can reform the world's financial architecture to guarantee debt relief, make available affordable financing, and adopt a multidimensional vulnerability index. Together we must lift billions out of poverty and provide affordable housing, education, and health care. Failure is not an option. We believe in the power of humanity, in the noble spirit of mankind. We have confidence that we can and we will make the world a better place. The people of Belize, the citizens of the world, expect nothing less. Thank you. Uno. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Economic Development and Investment of Belize for the statement just made. And I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Alexander de Croix, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Belgium. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Le grand... I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Alexander de Croix, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Belgium. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, how encouraging to see the General Assembly meet in person again. When I stepped into the solemn hall, I felt a sense of relief. Don't we all yearn to get back to normal? But is this sense of relief justified? And what is the normal we can actually hope for? Can we feel relieved when COVID-19 is still all around us and too many people are not vaccinated? Can we be relieved when, for a growing number of people, climate change is becoming a matter of life and death? Is there room for relief when human rights are being challenged in so many places? All over the world, people who are perceived as different are confronted with hate speech and hate crimes with discrimination and with abuse. Can we really feel relief when the new normal for women and girls in Afghanistan is to go home, keep silent and stay inside? No, we cannot. Let me quote Secretary General Dark Hammergold, who was murdered exactly 60 years ago last week. The weakness of one is the weakness of all. And the strength of one is the strength of all. That is why Belgium remains strongly committed to multilateralism, to an international order based on the rule of law, the founding principle of our United Nations. Only through common action we will build common strength. Only through multilateralism we will provide long-term answers to today's complex crises. Which vulnerabilities then require our common action? I see three. The first vulnerability is COVID-19. We need to bring this pandemic to an end. It is now almost two years since our lives were turned upside down by an unprecedented health crisis. And I would like to express my deepest appreciation 
to healthcare workers in Belgium and elsewhere who continue to battle this deadly virus. Belgium is among the top vaccinated countries in the world. 85% of our adult population is fully vaccinated. But Belgium is also a leading exporter of vaccines, accounting for two-thirds of all European exports. We are one of the world's vaccine powerhouses, and we acted like one by keeping trade lanes open and exporting over 530 million vaccines to the rest of the world without ever imposing an export ban. If we are to overcome this pandemic, vaccine solidarity is a crucial condition, since no one will be safe until everyone is safe. It is therefore unacceptable that today less than 4% of Africa's population is fully vaccinated. As Hammergold said, the weakness of one is the weakness of all. As long as the virus continues to circulate, the risk of new variants is there, and no one will be safe. COVAX is the best mechanism to strengthen vaccination solidarity and to close the global vaccination gap. Belgium has already donated 1.5 million doses, and by the end of the year, we will donate a total of 4 million vaccines. With close to 3 billion euro pledged to COVAX, the European Union is one of its major donors. But we must do more. We must also boost local vaccine production through technology transfer and sharing of knowledge. That is one of Team Europe's objectives. At least 1 billion euro will be invested to this end. And as we speak, a Belgian private company is working with partners in Senegal to start local vaccine production. We also must prepare for the next pandemic, even if the present one is far from over. A new pandemic treaty will allow us to be better prepared, build resilient healthcare systems, and increase access to decent healthcare and quality medicine. And we need a transformed World Health Organization that is fit for purpose to lead these efforts. The coronavirus took the lives of nearly 5 million people. And it also had a devastating impact on our Agenda 2030. It halted and even reversed many of the recent positive developments. Extreme poverty is on the rise again for the first time this century. Economies were pushed into recession. Fragile countries were struck harder than others. Yet, giving up is not an option. As the Secretary General said in his report, Our Common Agenda, we must usher in a new era of universal social protection. Not one country can cope with these unprecedented challenges on its own. That is why Team Europe is pooling efforts and resources to assist the most vulnerable countries. Belgium is proud to be part of this collective European effort. So let's not lose courage. Yes, we must build back, but we are faced with an important choice, an opportunity even. Do we continue with business as usual, or do we do things differently? Salam amen. This brings me to a second vulnerability that requires our attention. The climate crisis and the urgent need to put sustainability at the heart of all of our efforts. The report published last month by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is unequivocal. The increase in CO2 concentrations and the global temperature is unprecedented. All regions of the world are now seeing the harmful impacts of climate change, and more quickly than forecast. This summer, Europe and my country were severely affected by extreme weather conditions. 41 of our compatriots lost their lives during these floods, the worst that our country has ever seen. Our nation was stunned. Faced with the brutality of the forces of nature, many of us felt small. We will rebuild, but this will not be enough. 
We cannot simply fold our arms and wait for the next floods, the next heat wave, or the next extreme drought which will kill once again. We must act, and we must do so now. This makes the UN Climate Conference COP26 in Glasgow the most important meeting of the recent years. With the Green Deal, the European Union intends to be climate neutral by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse house emissions by at least 55% by 2030. We hope that more countries will follow, follow Europe's ambitions. This transition to sustainability is not only a cost. It is also a major economic opportunity. It triggers innovation and it drives new growth. It is the future our youth demands. That's why Belgium will double its wind energy capacity in the North Sea to remain one of the global leaders in offshore wind energy production. We will increase investments in renewables. And we have the clear ambition to become one of the most important hubs in clean hydrogen supply. Our common mission in Glasgow is crystal clear. We need to, to do whatever it takes to limit global warming to the Paris target of one and a half degrees. Building the resilience of the most fragile countries will be an important part of this effort. That is why we must deliver our financing commitment of $100 billion and why Belgium plans to increase its contribution to international climate finance. It is quite literally a matter of life and death. If we fail to act on the climate crisis, we will not only lose more lives, but global tensions, instability, and insecurity will increase. This brings me to the third vulnerability, our international security. 20 years ago, the attacks of 9-11 did not only change the city, they changed the world. Five years ago, my country was also attacked by terrorists. Like France, we are bringing terrorists to justice, but we have not defeated terrorism yet. Terrorists continue to claim innocent lives, as they did recently at Kabul airport. Belgium is one of the founding members of the coalition against ISIS. We actively participate in the fight against terrorism, with military deployment and with stabilization and reconstruction efforts through UNDP. Throughout the Sahel, our bilateral cooperation encompasses both defense and development. Indeed, security is not sufficient to ensure stability. And we cannot close our eyes to the aggravating humanitarian situation. The failure to prevent conflict often results in the failure to protect human dignity, with people losing everything. My country is a major humanitarian donor. Belgium's budget for humanitarian aid was 200 million euro last year. During our Security Council tenure, we attached great importance to humanitarian issues, such as humanitarian access to Syria. In the same vein, we will continue to help Afghan people with humanitarian aid. Belgium will do its part in line with our commitment announced last week in Geneva. The world cannot turn its back on the Afghan people. Yes, humanitarian assistance is necessary and needed to save lives. But only tents and food will not be enough. I see an important role for the United Nations in remaining close to the people of Afghanistan, to provide humanitarian assistance, but even more to prevent the country from imploding. Turning our back on the Afghan people would come at a high cost. A population plunged into extreme poverty will fall victim to extreme ideologies or will do anything to leave the country. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, these three vulnerabilities, health, climate and security, are a threat to human rights and their universality. For Belgium, peace, security and development are not possible without a profound respect for human rights. In every crisis, in every war, women and girls suffer first and suffer most. We are concerned by the appointment of a Taliban government that does not reflect the political, religious, and ethnic diversity of Afghanistan. 
Afghan women and girls are already bearing the brunt. They are tear gassed, beaten, dismissed, locked up at home. We will continue to monitor their rights. They must be able to go to school, to work, to live their lives in freedom. Societies where women are respected and equally represented, where they thrive and become teachers, society leaders and CEOs, are stronger and more stable societies. 20 years ago, Belgium played a crucial part in the adoption of the Durban Declaration and Programme of Action. The fight against racism is of paramount importance to my government. Racism, anti-Semitism and all other forms of discrimination and intolerance are unacceptable. We need to challenge and end racial injustice. In doing so, we will shape a society that lives up to the promise of the fundamental equality of all human beings. The universality of human rights is the cornerstone of the modern international order. It is an essential obligation for all states. That universality is all too often questioned. More than ever, we need to reaffirm that human rights are not a favor. They are an obligation everywhere for everybody. Too many women and girls still fall victim to human rights violations. Same-sex relationships are still considered a criminal offense in too many countries. Belgium will continue to be a voice for LGBTI people. We will not let our guard down. For all these reasons, Belgium aspires to become a member of the Human Rights Council for 23-25. Mr. President, these global vulnerabilities threaten the very fabric of our societies, our ways of life. They can only be addressed by a collective answer based on a dynamic multilateralism. No one is safe until everyone is safe. It has become our guiding principle in fighting the pandemic. It is the present day translation of Hammer Gold pointing out that the weakness of one is the weakness of all. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Let this be our common objective when it comes to climate, security, and human rights as well. Let that guideline inspire our actions every day. I thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Belgium for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I now, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, give the floor to the distinguished representative of St. Kitts and Nevis to introduce an address by the Head of Government. Mr. President, Excellencies, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce a pre-recorded statement by the Honorable Dr. Timothy Harris, Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished delegates, it's my privilege and honor as the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis to address the United Nations General Assembly today. On behalf of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, I extend my congratulations to His Excellency, Abdullah Shahid of Maldives, the Foreign Minister of a similar small island developing state, on his election to the presidency of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. I thank his predecessor for his valuable work during the 75th session and also take this opportunity to congratulate UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres for securing a second term. I pay tribute to the diligence, commitment, and perseverance he has shown in steering the UN family as best as possible through 
the pandemic. The theme of this General Assembly debate is fitting. It reminds us that we must keep faith in multilateralism and international cooperation to achieve our goals and rebuild sustainably. The past 18 months have challenged everyone everywhere, yet here we are, convening once more as a General Assembly to find global solutions to global problems. The battle against COVID-19 is not yet won, and its devastating impact on our societies and economies continues. We believe strongly that no one is safe until everyone is safe. That requires equitable access to vaccines and other medical products and technologies. I commend the international community for its response to calls for vaccine equity. And I'm pleased to say that St. Kitts and Nevis is just one of the many countries to have benefited from the COVAX facility established by the World Health Organization at the start of the pandemic. I also wish to thank our bilateral partners for their generosity in providing us with vaccines. St. Kitts and Nevis has 66% of its adult population fully vaccinated and over 75% of the target population has received their first dose. We are endeavoring to improve these statistics in the near future. Our citizens responded selflessly to our calls for social distancing and adhered to the other COVID-19 protocols, playing an active role in curbing the COVID-19 pandemic and helping us to overcome community spread. Healthy lifestyles remain a central element in our fight against COVID-19, particularly as we continue to prioritize the delivery of health care to people living with non-communicable diseases who, given their higher risks, are most vulnerable to the disease. The need to continue investing in a resilient health system and comprehensive public health services is paramount. Mental health and well-being are also vital, which is why we delivered a comprehensive mental health plan to provide psychosocial support through the National Counseling Center. Sadly, the economic impact of the pandemic will be felt for years to come. When it began, tourism, our biggest economic driver, ground to a halt, causing significant unemployment and underemployment. Businesses suffered as a result of lockdowns. We took action, providing social protection programs for those in need. Indeed, we implemented an easy $120 million COVID-19 stimulus package. We reduced corporate income tax for employers who retained 75% of their workforce and introduced VAT and import duty waivers for pandemic-related products. The impact of COVID-19 and development more widely, in particular, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, has also been significant. But instead of walking away from them, we need to work collectively even harder to achieve them. Climate change and climate-related events continue to threaten the existence of small island developing states such as ours. As the climate crisis intensifies, we witness the erosion of coasts owing to rising sea levels Fisher folk struggling to maintain their livelihoods from waning oceanic diversity. Families forced to relocate away from coastal areas due to the strength 
intensity and relentlessness of each passing hurricane season. Sustainable Development Goals number 13, 14, and 15 are of particular significance as they require us, among other things, to improve education and awareness of, as well as human and institutional capacity on climate change mitigation, adaptation, impact reduction, and early warning. A less negative outcome of the pandemic has been its effect on turbocharging the digitization of our workplaces and societies. But not all countries, particularly small island developing states, have the infrastructure, the capacity and workforce skills to fully benefit from this revolution. Rebuilding sustainably requires us to re-evaluate digital accessibility, affordability, and technical assistance so that every country, regardless of income level or geographic location, can exploit the digital economy in one properly networked world. Another barrier to development that we face is the criteria employed to determine aid and financial support. This singular benchmark for measuring development, GDP per capita, is critical, but sadly, due to bias and the omission of factors, it is, in my view, simplistic and flawed. Osenkits and Nevis, it ignores vulnerabilities, and it prevents us from accessing critical development assistance. A set of more adequate and relevant measures encompassing social, environmental, climate-related, and economic factors should be used to regulate entitlements. The use of a multidimensional vulnerability index, for example, would be a far better judge of development than simply GDP per capita. The protection of life from violent crime is also